Chapter 51 Anonymous Thibault kept a firm, steady grip on Riley's arm. She sat on the pavement, swaying head and hands. Anon, she murmured again. Still here. Riley's connections were always hard to read. Other people's were mostly single-strand visual threads, but all of Riley's senses played a part in hers. Right now, her attention was all around him, a shimmer in the dark alley, like oil rainbows in the air. She lifted her face, pale behind dark glasses. Ugh, wow, too many people, too much everything. There's a bench over there. He pointed, then realized the gesture was useless. Back near Ivy. The ground is fine for now, Riley said, pulling her arm free and taking his hand. Whenever you're ready. At the mouth of the alley, the crowd milled past, as if they hadn't been rioting a minute ago, or brawling or dancing, whatever the hell that had been. Who would have thought a handful of money would drive people so crazy? Kelsey had, apparently. And now she and Ethan had disappeared into one of the clubs, probably. It would take him all night to search every place on the strip. But he couldn't even start with Riley sick like this. She leaned against him. This is so weird. It's like I've stepped into one of Lily's stories. Lily, her twin sister. But what stories? Um, maybe you hit your head. You sound a little concussed. But her connection didn't feel concussed. It coiled and gleamed around him very intently. No, I just got spread out too far. It took Thibault a moment to process this. Your sight, you mean? It was such a big crowd and so frenzied, diving after that money. All those eyeballs got jumbled up and... Her head dropped forward into one hand, and she took a few deep breaths. Maybe think about something else, Riley. Call me Flicker. Sure, okay, I guess this is kind of a mission. No, I just like Flicker. She turned her head and managed to smile. It fits me better. He never really talked to Riley alone, and he hadn't spied on her as much as he had the other zeros. Using his anonymity to spy on any girl felt like stalking, but spying on a blind girl seemed way over the line. And of all of them, she seemed least likely to do something dangerous with her power. She was too level-headed. Liquor it is. You can call me Tebow if you want. Tebow, right. But I kind of like Anon. I always thought it was funny how no one can see you, but they can say, See you, Anon. Yeah, needs a little joke on me. He's not that subtle, she said. But he does like Shakespeare. Macbeth, mostly. Thibault laughed, surprised. Usually Riley, Flicker, had nothing but praise for Nate, glorious leader's little sister, Ethan used to call her, which made what the voice had said to them last summer that much squickier. Okay, anon. Riley stood, letting go of his hand to brace herself against the alley wall. Thibault rose beside her. She wavered and took his arm. Where did you say that bench was? This way. Even with the riot finished, a lot of people were going by on Ivy, forming a glittering web of attention. Thibault waited for their signals to fray the bond between Flicker and him. But Flicker's awareness of him stayed bright, shifting on the air. It was so different from someone using their eyes. She was taking in messages with her whole body. Her hand shimmered in the crook of his arm, picking up the pressure of his elbow. When he nudged an empty beer can out of her path with his bare foot, filaments of her attention reached down toward the sound. He could feel it on his skin, the way she was listening to him breathe. When her knee brushed the bench, she let go of T-Bone and sat down with a swirl of her long red skirt. She patted the seat beside her. Sit close, Anon, so I don't lose you. I'm used to people losing me, he said, obeying. Not me. She smiled past him toward Ivy Street. 
I found you in that stampede, after all. That was crazy, wasn't it? This girl who was with us started it on purpose. She threw a bunch of cash into the air. I saw her, Flicker said. In the shiny dress. Who the hell was she? Kelsey, the daughter of one of the bank robbers. Scam's voice mentioned her. You know about the bank video, right? So now she wants answers from Ethan. He shrugged. That's why she saved us, I guess. Just showed up and warned us about these goons who were coming for Ethan. The guys he stole money from. I saw them too, Flicker said. Of course, she wasn't really blind. Thankfully, she wasn't using her sight now. He hated to think what he looked like, sweaty and disheveled with dirty bare feet. She threw money in the air to get Ethan away from them, he said. She knows how to make an exit all right. I've never seen a crowd go nuts like that, even over free cash. It wasn't just the money, Flicker said quietly. I saw something else at work. Nate saw it too. Nate was here? Something went off in Tebow's head and he pulled away from her. Oh, wait a minute. What were you doing here? She turned to face him. I was kind of spying on you. Tebow swallowed. Spying? I was in the lobby of the Hotel Magnifique when all this started. I saw those guys come in, the ones all in black. I tried to warn you they were headed up to the penthouse. She knew about the penthouse? A hollowness opened up in his stomach. But then you got away, said Flicker. With that girl out the back, and when I saw where you were headed, I told Nate. Tebow stood up and took a few steps back from her. Flicker's senses reached after him, soft, bright tendrils. Her interest churned like liquid opal in the air. Broken glass glinted around his bare feet, but right now he hardly cared. So Nate knows about the Magnifique? Flicker shook her head. It's not in his file. You read his file on me and he sent you to keep watch on us? That's not the way it was, Anon. Her attention wisped in his mouth every time he spoke. He wanted to chop it away and vanish. He's known since that camping trip, hasn't he? Gets me a little drunk, makes me drop hints. Bastard. No. Flicker slipped her glasses back on. I figured it out myself. Thibault hesitated, hanging on to his anger. She reached out a hand. Before I lose you, Anon, let me explain. Their connection was dimming. It had only taken a few steps distance, a jolt of anger, and the filaments connecting them had faded. He could just stand here and disappear. But what did she mean she'd figured it out? He sat down again, not as close this time. How? He demanded. In Nate's file, the photos you took, cracks in the wall, faded paint, they were beautiful. Despite his anger, Thibault felt a blush creeping up his face. His wabi-sabi photography face had ended a year ago. The thought of anyone else seeing his artsy photos, those earnest images of transient imperfections, was like someone leafing through his middle school poetry. But how did you find me with those? I matched them to where they were taken. She was smiling now, proud of herself. All it took was a little help from Lily and borrowing a few thousand eyeballs. After a while, I noticed that all the locations were clustered around the Magnifique. Whoa, was all he could say. I know it was sneaky, but with everyone looking for scam, I was worried. Plus, I was curious about you. She sat very still, her senses looped around him to assess how he was taking this. How was he taking it? His gut was a tangle of feelings. But something didn't quite add up. Wait, how did you keep me in your mind long enough to hunt me down? With help from my sister Lily, she told me stories about you. Thibault shook his head. But how does she know anything? There's not even a zero. It made his skin crawl that someone outside the group was involved. 
Bad enough having Glorious Leader prying into your life, but a stranger. She starts with something real from the file, then adds to it. She weaves it into the kind of story she knows I like. So she's just making stuff up? Pretty much. But her stories have enough reality in them that fictional you connects up with the real you. At least that's what I think's happening. Thibault couldn't speak for astonishment. So are you mad at me? said Flicker. He didn't answer. Part of him felt furious, violated, betrayed. But another part was still that kid who craved someone seeing him. And the way she'd tracked him down was amazing. Beautiful, even. And in a way, none of it mattered anymore. Well, I guess it's no big deal, you knowing where I live. As of half an hour ago, I don't live there anymore. She nodded. Right, because those guys who were chasing Scam know about it now. Worse, the hotel might. He told her about the laptop, the manager's login. She listened and winced in sympathy a few times, and not once did her attention drift off him. Yes, this is what it's like when normal people talk to each other. What next? She said when he finished. Do you have a place to stay? I have a backup hotel. Of course, those passwords had been in his laptop, too. He could download them from the cloud, but with what? Thanks to Chizara, he didn't even have a working phone. I'll manage something, but let me drive you home. Nate's car is still in the Magnifique garage. Thanks, Anon. I'm not really up to the bus. And hey, my mom keeps spare toothbrushes in our bathroom drawer. She smiled. I mean, assuming you don't have one on you. Um, no. It was starting to dawn on Tebow that he had nothing. It didn't get much more zen than this. I don't even have shoes. Yeah, I saw. Flicker shook her head. She was getting her color back, breathing easier. I doubt my mom has any spare shoes that fit you. Still, a toothbrush, he said. Every little bit helps. She lifted her face as if she were staring at him through the dark glasses. It was weird feeling such a strong connection to someone who couldn't even meet his eyes. Weird, but he liked it. Good then, she said. A ride home would be lovely, Anon. Chapter 52 Scam Ethan stood on the roof of the boom room, gaping dumbly at Kelsey. He couldn't believe what had just happened. In all his years living with it, the voice had never outed itself. Your other what? Kelsey said. Ethan opened his mouth, waiting for the voice to jump into action again. Nothing. Great. Kelsey was expecting him to say something revealing, something honest, something that made sense. And the voice had left the building. What the hell was it up to? Was the voice pulling some crazy mind judo because it thought this was the way for Ethan to get close to Kelsey? By talking for himself? <laughs> no way. The voice was just dicking with him. Again. Ethan wanted so bad to connect with Kelsey. Sputtering in his usual half-assed way was not going to get that done. He thought once more. Whatever makes us closer. He opened his mouth again, not even a tickle in his throat. Screw it then. If the voice wanted to be outed, that's what it was going to get. It just talks. He finally managed. Whatever I want, the voice gets it. But it's kind of out of control, too. Kelsey shook her head. Maybe we should go back to technically. Ethan had been leaning against the edge of the roof, but now he straightened. Look, I can tell you exactly what happened in the bank, but you'll probably think I'm crazy. I already think that, she said quietly. Check. In a weird way, her admission made his next words easier. He didn't have anything to lose. I have this power, like a superpower. Kelsey raised her eyebrows. A superpower? More or less, it's not always super. 
But it lets you know stuff you couldn't possibly know? Ethan was impressed. She was halfway to figuring it out. Almost, except I don't really know anything. I just talk like I do. This was the part where he expected her to laugh or hit him again with a depleted bag of money or whip out her phone and call the Craig to schedule a beatdown. But for some reason, she actually seemed to be considering his words. How long have you had this power? Ever since I can remember? When I was little, it would just pop up and say things. I didn't even know that was weird at first. I just figured that was how talking worked for everyone. You opened your mouth and words happened. Since you were little, Kelsey murmured as if that part had scored a point in his favor. So are you rich? I mean, if you can take money off a psycho like Craig that easy, you could get it off anyone. It wasn't easy, Ethan cried. He drove me out to this creepy house in the forest. I thought I was going to get shot. Getting out of there was mostly luck. She was staring at him, still suspicious, but at least she wasn't hitting him with the messenger bag. And she was still paying attention to him. Ethan wasn't used to this. Usually when he told the truth, no one believed him. I just wanted a ride home, he went on. I didn't plan to steal anything. I only drove off to get away from the Craig and his boss. And that money was in the car. So you don't use your powers for evil? She was mocking him again. I try not to make it hard on other people, like in that hotel room. I made sure not to mess it up too much. Ethan wasn't sure where those words had come from. They weren't quite his, but they weren't the voice either. Stray memories of something someone else had told him. Chop the wood or whatever, it's a zen thing. You're weird, Kelsey said, a look of deep concentration on her face. You're like seriously strange and weird. Ethan nodded once, slowly. I can see how you might think that. So let's get this straight. Kelsey shook her head like she was wiping away a dream. In the bank, you use this so-called power on my dad, right? I wanted him to leave my bag of money alone, Ethan said. So the voice started talking to him, saying whatever would make him focus on something else. The voice. That's what I call it. I have no idea where the voice gets its intel from. I don't understand half the stuff it says. It doesn't even work all the time, because sometimes there's just nothing you can say. Like right now, when you were trying to explain a superpower to someone who thought you were crazy. There was no way he was going to bring up all the other zeros and make his story even more confusing. One thing at a time. The weirdest thing of all was that Ethan's own words still seemed to be working. Kelsey's glare had softened. She looked suddenly small and sad. So it was just an accident, she said. You saying my name. Kind of. And you don't know anything that can help me with the mobsters who are after my dad? Ethan shook his head. I don't know anything about that. She seemed to take that in, but it didn't make her happy. I was just intel to you, something to use to get your way, nothing more than a... Scam, Ethan said quietly. Kelsey stared, her eyes had gone cold. Just a noise you made so you could score a free ticket out of the bank. Yeah, well, Ethan swallowed. It did have this huge gun pointed at me. Hank got killed because of what you said. He was a good guy. I'm really sorry. He meant it, too. Out of all the apologies he'd had to give in the last two days, this one felt the most real. Kelsey shivered, and Ethan realized it was getting cool. He reached for the pillowcase at his feet and dumped the mini bar contents on the rooftop. He offered the pillowcase like a jacket, but she ignored it. She picked up one of the tiny bottles of vodka on the ground. Prove it. Say something right now with your superpower voice, something about me that no one else could possibly know. She twisted off the bottle cap and took a swig. Um, it's tricky. The last couple of days, every time I use the voice, bad things happen. Kelsey snorted. Like spending the night in the penthouse of the fanciest hotel in town? Sounds traumatic. Prove you're not 
lying, Ethan. Ethan closed his eyes. All he could think was that he really wanted this girl with the green eyes and windswept hair to believe him. And with that, the voice tap-tapped on his throat. All he had to do was open his mouth and let it out. So he did. Your dad taught you to pick pockets when you were nine and how to cheat at poker. One time he won 4,000 bucks on one hand, aces over jacks, and all you got was braces. When you were six, you walked out of your house alone and made it all the way to a football game. The home team won, and it was the best feeling you'd ever had. When a tooth falls into a metal sink, it goes, tink. Whoa, Kelsey said. Then she finished the rest of the tiny bottle in one gulp. Ethan found himself smiling, feeling back in control, until the voice added, What, did you think you were the only superpower in town? Kelsey's eyes went wide, but she didn't argue. Ethan closed his mouth carefully. He had to replay the words in his mind a few times before they made any sense. Then he looked into Kelsey's unblinking gaze. She believed him now, really believed him, and Ethan suddenly knew why. In his own voice, he said, Holy shit, you have a power too. Chapter 53, Flicker. It was one of those dreams that kept going after she woke up. Too many eyeballs, too much motion, her bed in a vortex, that vortex jammed inside another vortex, both of them spinning way too fast. Flicker searched for her sister's vision in the next room. Sometimes a dose of sight steadied bed spins, but Lily was still asleep. Same with the parents downstairs. And out here in empty suburbia, there were no other eyeballs in range. Flicker felt for her water glass. Her throat was dry, like she talked all night. But with who? Lily had been out when she'd gotten home from Ivy Street, and Nate hadn't come in after dropping her off. Wait. She hadn't seen Nate last night. Someone else had given her a ride. But she'd been in Glorious Leader's BMW. Flicker remembered that expensive smell. She hadn't drunk any alcohol. There was no explanation for this slice of missing time. Maybe coffee would help. Pulling on her pajamas, Flicker rewound her memories of the day before. She and Lily had spent the afternoon downtown, looking for the beautiful boy called Nothing. And they'd found his castle, hadn't they? She remembered staking out the lobby of the Magnifique, the thugs and black tees who'd been outwitted by the quick-fingered girl in the shiny dress. Then the chase across to Ivy Street and that maelstrom of money, bodies, eyeballs, and a new power at work, the sparkly girl. But then it all got fuzzy. She must have found him, the beautiful boy. That was why she couldn't remember. Only anonymous was the right shape to fill her missing time. Flicker smiled because now that she knew what she was looking for, she glimpsed him among the whirling leftovers of her dream. Dark-haired and handsome, she'd spotted him in the crowd, gone after him, and after that, she couldn't remember. Buttoning her pajama top, Flicker padded to her bedroom door and out into the hallway. But at the top of the stairs, her hand on the rail, she hesitated. If nothing had brought her home, where was he now? Back in his castle, probably. No, wait, headed off to some new hiding place because the thugs and black t-shirts had found his old one. But another answer tugged at her brain, and Flicker didn't go down to the kitchen. As if drawn by a scent, she crept past Lily's room to the end of the hall. There she reached out into the air before her and found the dangling cord. She pulled it softly, slowly, the creaks of rusty springs and unpainted wood clamored in the Sunday morning calm. When the attic ladder was down, Flicker checked the eyeballs in the house again. Nothing but the pink of closed lids limbed with slanted sunlight. She found the first step with a bare foot, ascended the ladder carefully. She was still dizzy from her dream, and there was no point rushing. There was probably nothing up here anyway. The smells of the attic drifted down to meet her. The mustiness of old books, of boxes and papers, and the old leather chair Dad refused to throw away. 
sense salted with memories of playing up here with Lily or listening to her stories. That's why Flicker had come here, something to do with stories. But at the top of the ladder, she found herself a little confused. Why exactly hadn't she gone downstairs for coffee first? It had slipped her mind again. So Flicker did what she always did when things weren't making sense. She listened. It took a while, even in the silence. But eventually her ears found the sound. Someone breathing, soft and even. Someone she couldn't throw her vision into, not even to find the sparkling rods and cones of darkness. And there was only one person like that in the world. Anon, she said quietly. The breathing stuttered, resumed. He was fast asleep. Flicker climbed out and knelt on the attic floor, focusing on the sound of his breath. She kept all her attention on it, careful not to let herself slip back into forgetfulness. Anonymous was here, in her home, the beautiful boy, the mysterious nothing whose eyes she couldn't see through. Finally, Flicker pulled the ladder up behind her. It closed with a bump, and the rhythm of his breathing broke again, and then came a soft sigh. Anon, she whispered again, a sudden rustle of movement. Oh, Flicker, hey. His voice was hoarse like hers, because of course it was the two of them who talked half the night up here in the attic. It's me, Anonymous, he said. Like on a mission. Um, wait, did you just say my name? I did. She felt a proud smile steal onto her face. Huh. A pause. Sorry, was going to leave early so I wouldn't scare you, but I didn't have a phone to wake me up. You didn't scare me. I'm glad you didn't leave. The sound of him sitting up. But you must have stumbled on me, right? Flicker shook her head. I came up on purpose. I had a notion you might be here. His breathing changed at those words, then a soft, whoa. Yeah, it's weird, but it makes sense, too. This attic is where Lily told me about you first. Her stories are why I can remember you. You told me last night. We talked for a long time. Something about those last words made her lips tingle. She made me a fictional character so you'd remember me. Flicker nodded. That's why I knew you were up here. It's like you were born up here in the attic. I mean, the image of you in my head. Actual you was clearly born somewhere else. Clearly. A smile in his voice and the little bone creaks of stretching. Then the rustle of putting on a shirt. Right, he couldn't have slept in his clothes up here in the hot, musty attic. And yes, there was the sound of him slipping on pants. She didn't want him to think she was peeking. Last night, when we were talking, did I mention that my power doesn't work on you? You've told me before, you can't find my eyes like I'm not here. The rustle of his shrug. Which figures? What do you mean? I'm not part of all that attention, seeing, remembering. It's all a web of connections, and I don't belong. The resignation in his voice made Flicker want to reach out to him. Your power is part of all that, but I'm not. I'm nothing. Nothing. That's what my sister called you in her stories, Flicker said, then added. I guess that sounds mean, doesn't it? It sounds accurate. She tried to smile. Well, at least I can't spy on you, so you get some privacy. Flicker ran fingers through her hair, feeling how snarled it was. It was odd not being able to see herself while talking to someone. I get plenty of privacy. Privacy's overrated. The floor creaked as Anon stood. But I should probably go. Your parents would freak to find some guy up here, right? Flicker was fairly sure they would. Not for long, though, just a little flutter of consternation, and they'd forget all about the boy upstairs. But the mood of this morning had been so mysterious and sweet. She didn't want it descending into farce. Where are you going? 
she asked. I mean, if you don't mind telling me. I haven't figured that out yet, but I should go back to my hotel first, just in case my laptop's still around. The Magnifique, Flicker said. That's where you live, right? Lived. The anguish in his voice made a memory fall into her head like a piece of sky. You were mad at me last night because I tracked you down. A pause long enough to make her nervous. You remember that? She nodded. Right, I was. Anon said. But only at first, then I was flattered, and, and I was impressed. Even Glorious Leader never managed to find me, and he's been trying for years. Flicker felt a blush starting and half turned toward the attic door. I'll go with you in case you need some extra eyes at the hotel. I'd like that. He sounded like he meant it. Um, do you have any shoes I can borrow? Another flash of memory, bare feet and broken glass. My dad keeps a pair of flip-flops by the pool. I'll get dressed and meet you downstairs. She went to the attic door and started down the steps, paused, and turned back to him. See you, Anon. The words felt familiar. She must have used that joke last night once or twice. Was Anon rolling his eyes, embarrassed for her? But his voice sounded steady and relaxed. See you, Flicker. He might even be smiling. Chapter 54 Mob Kelsey awoke with her phone buzzing on the bed beside her. It took a moment to recognize the slatted blinds and tasteful writing desk. She was in the spare room at Ling's place. A sputtering came from the floor. It was Ethan, snoring away in a borrowed pink sleeping bag that was too small for him. Confirmation that last night hadn't been a crazy dream or nightmare. They'd sat on the roof of the boom room half the night talking about their powers. She'd always believed her power was real, but meeting Ethan had turned it into a different thing entirely. Not just a weird fluke, maybe part of a bigger plan. Like the two of them were meant to find each other. She couldn't ignore that it had happened now, when she really needed help. Kelsey checked her phone, a message from Dad, finally, an address. She leaned over the end of the bed and gave Ethan a shove. We have to go. He squinted up at her, his eyes thick with sleep. His clothes were crumpled, but his army haircut gave him a look of combat readiness. Go where? I'll tell you on the way, she said. Come on, before Ling's folks find you up here. They think all boys are after her. The night before, Kelsey had dreaded introducing Ethan to Ling. But instead of the usual preening guys did when they met her way more beautiful friend, Ethan had only given Ling a weary salute. He was sliding out of the sleeping bag. Um, you saw what happened last time I went outside, right? I'm like a celebrity now. We'll get you a disguise then, and if we get into trouble, you can always use your voice, right? Ethan grunted. One-on-one, -on -one, yeah, but it's not much good in a crowd. Weird, she said. My thing only works in a crowd. He was on his feet and searching for his shoes. Maybe we're two halves of a whole, like we were meant to find each other. Kelsey stared at him. It was like an echo of what she'd been thinking a minute ago. But the words had sounded a little too smooth. Was that your voice talking? Kind of. Ethan looked away. I mean, yeah. She grinned at him. Finding someone with another power was a relief, even if it was the power of bullshitting. Two superheroes helping her dad was better than one. We could be a superpowered duo, she said shyly. Totally. That. Kelsey was still wearing the t-shirt and shorts Ling had given her to sleep in. Clean enough. She slipped into last night's high tops and grabbed the messenger bag, which maybe had a thousand bucks left in it. She led him out of the house without a word, careful not to wake Ling or her folks. They didn't talk much as they walked the dozen blocks to the bus stop. Kelsey kept looking over her shoulder in case the bag robs had sent someone to follow her and find her dad. 
Having an internet celebrity in tow didn't help the feeling of being watched. At a convenience store, Ethan pulled out a fat roll of 20s and bought a bottle of water, a baseball cap, and the biggest pair of sunglasses on the rack. Kelsey held the cold, sweating water bottle while he tried on the glasses. He grabbed a couple of chocolate bars and tried to offer one to her, but she waved it away. Not sure about that disguise, she said. You look like you're trying to be incognito. Anything so my mom doesn't find me. I should call her again, but not from your phone. She can track phones. He looked kind of proud as he finished the chocolate bar and started on the second. Where are we headed? To see my dad. Ethan balked. Great, another person who wants to kill me. He doesn't, Kelsey said. Ethan stared at her. I mean, your voice freaked him out, she said but he's never been a killer. He wasn't a bank robber till Friday. Kelsey let the comments slide. There were lines her dad wouldn't cross. She had to keep believing that. And anyway, she tossed away most of her money saving Ethan. He owed her. On the bus, Ethan hunkered down with his head against the window, but Kelsey still had too many questions to let him sleep. Here's what I don't understand. Why us two? Out of all the people in the world, why do we get powers? Ethan slid his sunglasses down and gave her a careful look, like someone studying a poker hand. Were you born in the year 2000? Yeah, September. Me too. June. Could mean something. Kelsey shook her head. 2000's just a number. Yeah, but everybody made a big deal out of the new millennium. They thought all the computers would crash at midnight. But they didn't, and weren't millions of people born that year? Then it hit her. Wait, there could be others. I mean, if there's two of us in a little city like Cambria, there'd be tons of people in the whole world. Maybe, Ethan shrugged. But maybe it's just us, Kells, and we were put here to help each other no matter what. The words made something click inside Kelsey. The thought of an ally born to help her, who would never fail her like her father always did, sent something rushing into her, like a crowd spilling onto a dance floor when the perfect song played. That was what she'd always been missing, someone special among the crowd. Then she realized that Ethan had called her Kells, which only her father did. Wait, was that your voice again? Ethan just shrugged like he wanted to skip the whole subject, like he didn't want to talk about superpowers, even though he just met the only person who shared this with him, which made no sense. Ethan pulled his cap down low, and Kelsey let the subject drop, for now. They changed buses twice before they reached the tenements on the outskirts of town. The neighborhood had been mostly abandoned years ago when Cambria had exploded in some other direction, ignoring the city planners. Kelsey didn't like empty places. The broken windows and wide, still streets felt lifeless around her. Once the bus pulled away, it was like stepping into a painting. No car horns, no ringing phones or overheard conversations, no crowds, no energy, no pulse. This place sucks, she said. Ethan pulled off his hat. At least nobody's going to recognize me. Kelsey had the address in her phone but the reception was shaky and the map trailed off at the edge of the tenements, like no one had bothered to tell the internet about this place. She felt a moment of panic. Dad's message had said he was keeping his phone off to save battery, so she couldn't even call him. But then she felt it. One point of energy in that whole empty space, pulling her forward, like an oasis in a desert. There was a crowd here someplace, Ragged and dispersed, but definitely a crowd. Or maybe several little crowds, chasing each other around a chemical high that arced steep, sweet, and spiky. She felt herself, her power, reach out for it. Reach it and scale it until she was balanced on top of a bright pinnacle, too sudden and too steep. Like when cheap ecstasy swept through the clubs on summer weekend nights. She let her power pull her forward letting the synthetic elation fill her, becoming something genuine. This was something she could do that nobody else could. She could find people lost in this empty place. This was her power. Stay close, she told Ethan. 
but too soon the energy began to empty out from beneath her. Kelsey felt herself spinning down, dragged under. The quick, cheap high was wearing off. Soon the crowd wouldn't be a crowd anymore. They'd go back to their individual needs, and Kelsey would be lost again in the eerie quiet. She started to run, not caring whether Ethan kept up with her. She had to find her dad before the crowd's high gave out. Five blocks later, with the feeling almost faded, Kelsey had found the place. A building like all the others, a gray, two-story apartment block with boarded-up windows and doors. Broken beer bottles littered the long grass in front of it. How do we get in? Ethan said. Kelsey shook her head. Dad's text hadn't included instructions. Around the side of the building, they found a window where the boards flapped loose against the frame. It was too high for Kelsey to reach, so Ethan knelt and laced his fingers. She hesitated. The climax of a few moments ago was building again. It burst upward in a narrow geyser, like an icy cold bottle held against the space between Kelsey's eyebrows. It was strange, crisp, distorting. She steadied herself, placed a foot on Ethan's hands, and pushed. Scrambling under the loose plywood, she tumbled into blackness. Kelsey liked dark clubs just fine, but this place was different. Cave dark. The darkest dance floor was lit by a thousand stars compared to this. The air smelled sickly sour like fruit gone bad. She waited for her eyes to adjust, and dimly the room took shape. There was trash piled against every wall. A thick layer of dust rose from the floor with every step she took. Ethan came scrambling through, landing awkwardly beneath the window. Dust billowed out from him like he'd set off a softly thudding bomb. He coughed and peered into the dimness. Where to now? Kelsey pointed at the floor. A path through the dust led from the window to an empty doorway, the floorboards gleaming dully in one narrow line. Beyond was a hallway, even blacker than the room. Sheesh. Ethan stood up, dusted his knees. Your dad sure knows how to hide. Always has. Kelsey was almost proud. She pulled out her phone and shone it at the doorway. The darkness of the hallway seemed to drain away the feeble illumination. She took a careful step through, shining light down at the path in the dust. The floorboards creaked, a soft and hollow sound beneath her feet. Ethan came shuffling behind her, his breathing audible in the silence. Kelsey took slow steps, her skin tingling at every groan of the wood. In the building around her swirled sharp, discordant highs and crashes all out of rhythm. She'd been right, it wasn't one group, but many, each huddled in its own room chasing spiky rainbows. She let herself drift among the spires of ecstasy, looking for any familiar note, until a cold hand took her shoulder, clutching hard. Chapter 55 Mob Kelsey jerked back, spun her phone around. It was a man, maybe. In the pale light, his face looked like jelly. His eyes were lost in puffiness, and his jaw was covered by angry red welts. Kelsey bit back a scream. What are you doing here? The man said. The words slurred out through the few teeth left in his slack mouth. Cratered sores traveled along his outstretched arm like burns. And on the inside of his elbow, Kelsey could see through to tendons and the dull glint of bone. Oh my God! Her fear echoed out, sending a tremor through the building through all those junkies already wary of discovery. She tried to control it, to grasp some of the icy certainty of their addiction, but she could smell the man too clearly, the rot and the putrid stink of flesh gone bad. She gagged. When the man took a step forward, reaching for her again, Kelsey froze. Leave her be, Tony, Ethan said with sudden authority. The man grunted a rolling liquid sound. He dropped his arms to his sides like a wind-up doll running out of juice. You know me, kid. Your mother sent me, Ethan said. It was the voice talking. Kelsey was certain, with none of Ethan's usual hemming and hawing. He sounded so smooth and confident that her paralysis broke. She took a step back. My mom's dead, Tony slurred, his squinty eyes fixed on Ethan, not looking at Kelsey, thank God. 
I'm in touch with her, Ethan said. There was a strangled gasp from Tony. Oh, way, screw you. She's with your Aunt Bertha, Ethan's voice said. They both say they're sorry. None of it was your fault. Ethan glanced at Kelsey, and somewhere way past his smooth expression, she saw terror in his eyes. It was so weird to watch his power on display. But it was working. In the glow of Kelsey's phone, Tony's melting face somehow showed amazement. They said that? Ethan nodded. You were too little to know better. They shouldn't have left you alone with your little sister. You didn't know what a seizure was. A single tear oozed across pale flesh, sparkling. That's what I always, I didn't understand. They know that now and you're forgiven, Ethan said. And then his voice shifted. So, like, do you know a guy called Jerry? Tony hesitated and his pale face turned to Kelsey. You're Kelsey, huh? Why didn't you say so? Your dad said you might show up. Oh, she said. Nice to meet you, Tony. Sorry to spook you. The man turned and shuffled into the darkness. As they followed, Kelsey looked at Ethan. Thanks. Don't thank me until we're out of here, he muttered. Astonishment pulsed in Kelsey as they followed the man through darkness. The voice inside Ethan had reached into that man's mind and found something old and broken buried there and fixed it just a little. His superpower was some serious shit. Her father had changed. His face was ashen. The skin on his neck hung loose like turkey jowls. He still wore the shirt he'd had on two days ago, and he smelled worse than ever. Tony had led them up a flight of stairs to a room lit by a slant of light from a loose board over a window. A small group of people slouched on the floor, their eyes glassy. The chemical high still simmered around them, dissipating slowly, tugging Kelsey down with it. She had to focus on her father's face to keep from being swept under. I'm sorry to make you come here, sweetheart. Dad glanced over her head at Ethan, and his expression froze. This is my friend Ethan, Kelsey said carefully. The kid from the bank? Dad stood, his hands in fists. Uh, hi, Mr. Laszlo, Ethan said. You brought him here? We can trust him, Kelsey said, standing between them. He's not with the Bagrots. He's just a guy who was in the wrong place. A guy who knows an awful lot about us, Kells, Dad said. He was just, Kelsey sighed. She'd only tried to talk to her dad about her power once, when she was ten. He'd laughed it off, saying little kids always thought they were the most important person in the room. But she hadn't meant that. Working a crowd never made her feel important. It just made her feel part of something bigger and stronger than herself. Right now was definitely not a good time to try reopening this superpower conversation. But she had to get him to back off from Ethan somehow. All that stuff he said, he was just messing with you. Her father turned to Ethan. Messing with us? When we had guns in our hands? I'm real sorry, Mr. Laszlo, Ethan said. It sounded exactly like the kind of thing her dad would say. Real sorry. You should be. Her father took a step toward him. You got Hank killed! Kelsey placed a hand on her father. Somewhere upstairs, a small group had found another source of euphoric high. She felt it skyrocket through her like an elevator rising too fast. She latched onto it and drew it down into this room. It's all going to be okay, Dad. Then Ethan's smooth voice came from behind her. I'm here to make amends, Mr. Laszlo. I'm going to get you off the hook with the Bagrovs. Kelsey felt her power working, and a murmur went through the other junkies in the room. Her father's expression finally eased. He wanted to believe. He wanted what Ethan said to be the truth. And with Kelsey's power pulling him up and into the borrowed euphoria, he almost did believe it. You can help us? Really? He said, eager as a little kid. I can fix this for you and Kelsey. Ethan said simply and firmly, definitely the voice. Kelsey let out a breath. She ratcheted up the ecstasy another inch until her father was almost grinning. 
He turned to her. And you trust him? I do, she said softly. Dad, how do you know about this place? Who are these people? They're my customers. The people sitting in the dark were all like Tony, with puffy faces and melting skin, bones that showed through. You did this to them? Dad, these people are sick. Her father's expression changed again, but the image was loose and crumbling, like a retina burn from staring at the sun too long, the edges all falling away. Kelsey realized her phone had dimmed to save battery. She let it go dark. There are people with no place to go, Dad said. Like me, Kelsey said, trying not to feel bitter. Dad squeezed her shoulder, and for a moment she thought he would make this better somehow, but instead he said, Fig gave you the cash? He did, but she hesitated, a hand on the messenger bag. I had to use some of it. There's a thousand left, maybe less. A thousand. His voice had gone dry. I need more than that, sweetie. Maybe you can get it for me. Kelsey stared. Didn't he see what she'd been through already? What are you planning to do with it? You're not going to buy more crocodile, are you? Dad's eyes narrowed. What do you know about croc? Fig told me you were selling it for the Bagrovs, and that it kills people. I take care of my customers, Dad said stubbornly. I'm not Alexei Bagrov. Oh my God, Dad. Her eyes went to Tony. There was no way she was going to help her dad sell anything that melted people like plastic dolls. She felt the crash of a nearby crowd as another high wore off. It reached out, swiped her, and rebounded, soured by her own anguish. They would be scrabbling for more drugs right away, trying to fill the void she was reflecting at them. She tried to pull herself back inside her own skin. Kels, I'm in a lot of trouble here. I need enough money to make my own product. Then I can get right with the Bagrovs. Dad adjusted the collar of his shirt. That was his tell. It meant he was about to grift her, to bluff and she'd seen the dark smear beneath his collar. That's a scab on your neck. Tell me you're not taking this shit yourself. Once or twice, to show the customers it's harmless. Harmless? Look at them! Her father took a step back, surprised at how her cry of pain had rippled through the building. He looked so hurt, but for the first time in her life, Kelsey was too angry to feel sorry for him. She'd been raised in the family of Dad's mismatched con artist friends, where drugs and jail time were no big deal. The longest her father had ever disappeared was eight months for possession. He'd laughed about it, making jokes about eating three meals a day for the first time in his life. Back then, it hadn't seemed scary at all. But now, standing in this stinking, terrible place, she knew the truth. This was death. He was going to kill himself and all these other people and he was going to drag her down, too. Kells. Forget it, Dad. You can't throw away your life just because you don't want to face up to what you've done. You can't have the money. He was silent. The whole world seemed silent right then. She handed in the water bottle she was still carrying, the one Ethan had bought at the convenience store. Then she pulled out a fistful of bills from her bag and thrust it at him. Probably only $50. Not enough for him to do any real damage. I'm sorry, Dad. I'll come back with food, okay? For everyone. And we'll work out what to do next. He looked at her, not angry anymore, just sad. You're a good girl, Kells. I'm sorry to put you in this. She reached out and gave him a quick hug, smelling the sweat and dirt and that sickly, sour scent that came from hopelessness and hiding in a building without running water. Be careful, Dad, okay? I mean it. Dad hugged her in his wiry arms. Okay, Kels. He sounded defeated. She'd never heard that in his voice before. She pulled free and moved back along the hallway, Ethan falling into step beside her. As they moved away, Kelsey's pulse skidded with the scattered unease of the mob. Chapter 56 Scam. Outside, the daylight seemed more intense than Ethan remembered. All the colors were brighter, like the muted world inside the house had sent his eyes into overdrive. 
The dying grass in front of the abandoned houses was a more vivid yellow, the graffiti more discordantly vibrant. He put his sunglasses back on. But it wasn't the light that was weirding him out. It was the whole uncanny vibe of that drug den with its scabby, decaying inhabitants. Every minute he'd been inside, inexplicable emotions had passed through him. Kelsey, did you feel sort of happy in there? Like a contact high? That was me, trying to keep my dad from punching you. Oh, um, thanks. Ethan hadn't quite gotten his head around Kelsey's power yet. The night before, on the roof of the boom room, she had explained she could control the energy of a crowd. But it could also control her. It was pretty complicated. But Ethan was old friends with complicated. Complicated lived in his mouth. A lot of blissed out junkies in there, she said. I borrowed what they were feeling to keep things calm. People are like herd animals. They share emotions. I just lend a hand. It reminded me of... He remembered feeling fuzzy and calm on the bank's marble floor, like liquid Valium was pumping into him, along with three helpings of Thanksgiving turkey. During the robbery, all of us customers zoned out. Was that you? Kelsey gave him a sad look. For all the good it did. All my fault, he said, half hoping Kelsey would argue. But she didn't. She slouched with her head down, scuffing her high tops on the pavement as they walked. She looked tiny and defeated. He couldn't imagine what it was like to see someone you loved in a place like that, taking an awful drug like Crocodile. Kelsey wanted to get her father some food, but Ethan thought the guy would be better off with a hospital. He looked half dead. They all did. Ethan missed his home in the nice part of Cambria. He missed his mom and he missed Jess. Being born into a family of straight shooters might be a pain, but nothing compared to a con artist's druggy father. He vowed to call mom the minute he found an untraceable phone. I'm sorry, he said. For what? For... For being anywhere near that bank on Friday. For needing a ride home. For stealing a bag full of money that put him right in the way of a desperate Jerry Laszlo. But without that crazy roller coaster of events, he never would have met Kelsey. He liked Kelsey a lot, probably more than she liked him, and that still didn't stop him liking her in a big way. She'd saved him from the Craig. She'd thrown thousands of bucks into the air, and she'd hidden him from various interested parties overnight. Which made not telling her about the other zeros totally selfish. But she'd been so fascinated when he'd told her about the voice, like his power was something amazing and cool instead of this awful hijacker in his body. In all that glory, Ethan had missed the opportunity to mention he wasn't the only other person with the power. And leaving out the truth was like any scam. If you wrote it long enough, you couldn't get off. I'm just sorry I can't help you more. Hey, she said. It was pretty handy what you said to that guy Tony, about his mom and his aunt. I think you really helped him. Ethan smiled. The voice had done him proud in there, first with scary Tony and then with Kelsey's dad. Maybe a stupid voice was getting better. Maybe it was developing beyond its usual short-term thinking. The weird thing was that it felt good to use the voice again, like shaking hands with an old friend. You think I was right, not giving my dad the money? Kelsey asked. I feel like I let him down. Your dad let you down, not the other way around. Kelsey gave him a lopsided smile. Is that your voice talking? I don't need the voice for this. Trust me, I'm a world-class expert in letting people down. She smiled at him gratefully. Ethan beamed in return. Every time Kelsey looked at him, it was like a light turned on. A black sedan went by out of place in this part of town. It reminded Ethan of the Craig's advice about never driving anything fancy, though maybe this guy wasn't trying to lie low. The driver was a man in a suit with pale skin and thick black hair. Beside him was another guy in a suit. Dad has nothing, Kelsey was saying to herself. No food, no clothes. I had all his money, and I threw it away last night. That was my fault, Ethan said. Then he realized something. When it came to money, he could help Kelsey out. Money was something he could manage. But it would mean telling her about the other zeros. 
I should just tell the police where he is, Kelsey said. I mean, what's worse, being in prison or winding up dead? Ethan reached out clumsily to rest a hand on her shoulder. I think I can help. There's something I haven't. Kelsey froze. You see that car? Ethan glanced up. Yeah, it went past before. Last time I saw a car circling the block, it was really bad news. It's probably just... Ethan's words faded as the car drifted to a halt beside them. The two men got out. The driver came right over toward them, a tall hook of a man with a bend in his spine. The other guy stayed by the car like he was ready to take off. Like this was a robbery. Ethan was all set to offer them the roll of 20s in his pocket, but he didn't get the chance. Kelsey Laszlo, the driver said with some crazy kind of accent. Nope, Ethan said right away. The guy's eyes flicked once toward Ethan and then back to Kelsey. We're looking for your father. Is a price on his head. Any idea where I can find him? Ethan looked at Kelsey, who gave him a beseeching look. Ethan realized, with something like pride, that she wanted him to use the voice. Ethan willed it to take over his throat, anything to make these guys believe he and Kelsey had nothing to do with Jerry Laszlo, anything to help Kelsey. But the voice had nothing to say, which probably meant they already knew exactly who Kelsey was and that her father was hiding nearby. Like, we don't know what you mean, Ethan tried in his own voice. It cracked on the last word. The guy finally gave him a solid look. Huh. The boy from the bank video. Um, what video? The guy laughed. And here with Jerry Laszlo's little girl. I believe this is called a two for one. How lucky can a guy be? Okay, these guys knew everything. The voice couldn't unwind that, so Ethan had to want something simpler. This guy needs to leave us alone. Ethan sent the thought spiraling out. And there it was at last, the wonderful feeling of the voice pulling upward toward his throat and jaw, full of certainty. Come on, voice, just like in the tenements, win this thing. The voice said, My friend, what did you say your name was? I didn't. The man's smile was coldly polite. I'm going to call you... The voice seemed to hesitate, but of course the voice knew exactly what to say next. I'm going to call you Misha. Misha started, which filled Ethan with happiness. Yeah, I know who you are, Misha, the voice went on. You'd be surprised what I know, like how Alexi doesn't think much of you. Misha shook his head. You don't know Mr. Bagarov. You don't know shit. What I know is he told everyone important not to mess with Kelsey. The voice continued breezily. Because Ms. Laszlo here is doing business with him, so how come Mr. Bagrov didn't bother to tell you that? Misha gave a dry laugh. He's doing business with kids like you? Kelsey nodded once, her jaw set in defiance. That's right, picking up where my dad left off. Misha stared at Kelsey's sparkly high tops and Ethan's crumpled shirt. Don't make me laugh. You kids don't even have a car. Only a dipshit brings their ride into a neighborhood like this, Ethan heard himself say. Misha's eyes flicked to a shiny black sedan and then up at the broken windows of the building behind them. The voice had played him perfectly. But then the other guy spoke up. Let's check this with Mr. Bagrov. He pulled open his jacket to reach for his phone, and Ethan saw a gun strapped to his side. The voice died in his throat, and Ethan felt a sudden resentment for all the other zeros. Why was his power so crap at lying to more than one person at a time? Wait, Ethan said in his own useless, shaky voice. Both the mobsters stared at him, expecting more. Ethan really wanted these guys to leave them alone. He wanted to get out of this creepy, dead-end part of town. He wanted to live another day, maybe go back to the Moonstruck Diner and drink bad coffee for hours. He wanted to call his mom for Pete's sake. He put that all into one articulate thought and prayed the voice had a plan. Okay, he heard himself say. 
Go right ahead, Boris. Call him, and when you do, tell him you got a present for him. Misha smiled. You mean you two kids? Nope. Ethan grinned, but inside he was chanting, please, 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 focusing every bit of his will into his power. Jerry's three blocks that way in the tenement with the broken bottles on the lawn, second floor. But move fast, he won't be there long. Beside him, Kelsey gasped. You! Ethan felt his stomach leap into his throat, pushing the voice out of the way. Oh, crap. Misha's expression changed to one of pure greed. Both of the men slipped back into the car. Thank you, my friend. And just like that, the voice had done it again. Chapter 57, Mob. Kelsey ran, heading after the fancy car, but half a block later, Ethan was grabbing her, dragging her to a halt. Kelsey, wait. She pushed him off, swung a fist at him. Oh my God, Ethan, why did you do that? Ethan looked stunned, like he couldn't believe what was happening either. It's too late, he said. I screwed up, but we can't beat them there. She spun away from him. The car was three blocks away, already in front of the building full of junkies. The Bagrov men were out front, banging on the boarded up door. She started running again, outpacing Ethan, shouting as she got closer. In the empty suburb, her voice rolled and rolled. At last, she felt an answering spark of anxiety from inside the tenement. People had heard her. But Ethan grabbed her again, bringing her to a skidding stop. We can't, Kelsey. Those guys have guns. The crack of wood came from down the street, and both of them spun to face it. A board came tumbling down the tenement's front steps, and the two men disappeared through the doorway. Dad! Kelsey couldn't escape Ethan's grasp, so she dragged his weight behind her, his sneakers skidding on asphalt. She could feel the people inside the tenement bonded in fear. But the mob only lasted seconds. They thought it was the cops coming in and scattered in all directions. Run! She cried. Ethan was in front of her now. He looked scared his freckles standing out on his pale skin. Why did you do that? She screamed at him. I'm sorry, Ethan said. The world was spinning, smears of color dancing across her eyes. First, she didn't give her dad the money, and now this. Kelsey tried to pull away, but she was weak with exhaustion. She couldn't remember the last meal she'd eaten, the last decent night's sleep she'd had. You could have told him another building, any building. You sent him right to my dad. I wanted us to be safe, Ethan said numbly. I forgot about keeping your father safe, too. My voice didn't understand. You kept saying you wanted to help. I do, Ethan cried. But I don't know what the voice is going to say. It's out of my control. Then you shouldn't use it at all, she yelled, turning to the building again. Help me fight them. What are you going to do against mobsters with guns? They'll just take us too. We have to get out of here. She flinched as the fear inside the building shifted to hard panic. Misha and his pal must have stumbled into a room full of junkies, guns waving. My dad's going to think I led them right here. Listen, Jerry owes them money, you said. That's what this is all about. I can get money. She stared at him. He had scammed a free room at the Magnifique and stolen a bag of cash from Craig. But what if the Bagrobs wanted blood? Can't you talk them out of taking him at all? Ethan shook his head. Once they get on the phone with Bagrov, we're dead meat. Please. He reached out toward her, but Kelsey knocked his hand away. Her head was throbbing like an overamped speaker from the panic down the street. She tried to latch onto the energy coming from inside the building to organize it into some kind of resistance, but it scattered like birds, like panicked junkies, pretty much. Listen, Ethan said. Can we please have this conversation someplace far away? What if Misha calls for backup? Not till I hear your plan for saving my dad, Kelsey braced herself. And don't even think about using your voice on me. Okay. Ethan was panting and took a moment to speak again. There's something I haven't told you yet. I have this bag of money. Craig's money, I know. 
Right, but there's another thing. Ethan nodded. The part where I don't have it. Kelsey groaned. His other voice might be a bullshitter, but at least it usually made sense. Do you have it or not, Ethan? My friends are holding it for me, he hesitated. Friends who are like us with powers? Powers. Kelsey stared at him. Superpowers? He nodded. Of course. Where there were two, there had to be more. Maybe lots more, just like she'd said on the bus. And Ethan had pretended to be too sleepy to talk about it. Why didn't you tell me? I was getting to it. Ethan looked terrified. It's just that we're like a secret group, and I had to make sure you were... You let me think we were the only ones! Ethan opened his mouth, but Kelsey waved his response away. Save it. She took one last look at the tenement. Okay, let's go meet your super friends. Anyone who's not you. Chapter 58 Crash Chizara walked down the basement stairs of the Central Cambria Police Department, a little wobbly in her heels. Up ahead, beyond the jail cells, the IT guys were showing a group of managerial types into the server room. She hurried to join the back of the crowd, frowning down at the fake paperwork on her clipboard. Stuffy air flowed out of the room, and the hallway smelled strongly of cleanser and bleach. Chizara tried not to think why, pushing the beaten cop out of her head. This was her chance to make up a little for what she'd done, for the bad things she'd let happen. The room was full of metal shelves with rows of black and beige boxes, none of them showing a wink of life. But she could still sense the patterns around her, like walking into the burned-out shell of a house, maybe a whole burned-out town, one that she herself had torched. Slowly, Chizara began to match these empty shells to the pulsing system she'd seen in her head before she crashed them on Friday. That giant gray box there next to the boss guy with a lightning bolt logo on his shirt? She recognized the innards of that. She'd frazzled them during the big crash, right before she'd started to lose it. So when that power spike hit, the boss guy was saying, this UPS should have caught in and kept the power steady. We'll put in a new one for you, no problem. But the weird thing is why the mains relay is stuck, so first we're gonna run some tests. A woman in a gray suit spoke up. You've been keeping up the quarterly maintenance? Right on schedule, said the guy. Every check we've ever run, she failed over just like she should. Of course it did, murmured a young guy just in front of Chizara to his buddy. Guy knows how to cover his ass, doesn't he? His buddy nodded, then glanced over his shoulder, registered Chizara as a stranger, looked her up and down. She was every inch the serious young assistant with her clipboard in the navy blue skirt suit she'd begged Mom to buy her so she could look like an American girl at church on Sundays. It had been easy sneaking into the CCPD. There were so many groups here, tech people, insurance adjusters, police brass, a big enough crowd to lose track of whose assistant was whose. Chizara smiled back at the guy, her mind reaching through into the server room, trying to see exactly what she'd done. The UPS was the least of it, just a giant switch that she'd stopped from doing its automated rescue. Littered around it were caramelized circuit boards, burned-out fibers, and blasted switches. It should have been a beehive in there, hundreds of buzzing insects stinging her brain. She should be curled up in a corner from the pain but everything that could hurt her had been annihilated. A nano-tornado had ripped through these intricate, delicate machines, leaving every connection broken. She was ashamed of herself. She'd lost control in a big way. But whoa, it had been sweet. Chizara's mental fingers extended to cover the multiple failures she'd caused, every single bee she'd killed. It shouldn't be too hard to fix, right? It was just a matter of opening her mind to all those tiny, thwarted connections, feeling around the shadowy map of the dead network for its arteries, its nerves, the filaments that poured the power through. If she could just reset that pulse and push it smoothly back into the tangled micro-threads of metal. There. 
with a lurch inside her, the UPS came to life. The people at the door jerked back all at once, like a field of grain socked by a gust of wind. What the hell? Did you do that, Roger? The boss woman had to speak up to be heard over the winding up buzz of the UPS. They didn't touch a thing. A stumpy pain tree lit up inside Shizara, pulsing as it sucked up power from the unharmed backup batteries to push it through the sleeping servers. She could see everything better now, could feel how the tornado had thundered through the room, tearing out so many tiny pieces as it went. As she followed the spreading network of paths, each busted connection she passed unmelted and retethered itself, lighting up another fine channel of pain in her. Her skin began to burn and twitch, her temples to throb. But Chizara stood still, accepting the punishment, blindly staring down at the clipboard in her unsteady hands. Her teeth sang and her bones shuddered, and a grunt of discomfort sat in her throat. She reached for the next dead server and the next, and there was another over there. Hell no, Roger shouted. Shut it down, shut it down, Chris, Arnie. Shizara leaned against the wall, her mind flitting through the workings in the servers, lighting tiny torches all the way. No one looked at her. They were all transfixed by the scrambling emergency inside the room. Is it working again? said one of the suits. Yes, but it's got to be done in sequence. We need the network up first and then the sand, and only then do you bring up the- Shit, how is this happening? The clipboard fell from Chizara's trembling hands. She bent to grab for it, and it felt so much better down here near the floor that she stayed crouched, reaching out, feeling the connections divide and multiply, the pain tree extend, a finer, denser net riddling her skin. The guys in the server room crashed around like trapped rats, diving to shut off each new piece of tech as it tried to revive. Thank you, she breathed to them. It was like they were working with her, helping her manage the clamor, manually controlling her pain. And then she reached the end. Not the end of the tree, not the full rebuild, but the place past which she couldn't push any further. She could see where she needed to go, the next layer of crash points arrayed there all twisted and gummed up. But she didn't have it in her. She tried once more, gritted her teeth as hard as she could and pushed. And nothing. Chizara stood up again, hugging her clipboard to her. The little crowd was a buzz, shaking heads, shrugging shoulders. But the buzz inside Chizara had died back to the single fat beehive of the UPS. The energy that had flooded into her with the big crash that had stored itself inside her, was it all gone? Damn it, she whispered and turned away from the server room. She walked toward the stairs trying to look confident like she belonged, but her spine felt like a wilted stalk of celery and a trickle of sweat crept down her back. She trudged the stairs back up to the first floor. What had happened? She'd reached out just like in all her practice runs, and she'd seen what she had to do. But the fixing power had deserted her. She could feel the space where it should be, dry and empty. All she had left was the nagging of the other revived systems. Crash us, crash us, like always. It was so tempting to recharge herself. She had to get out of the building. Crossing the reception lobby, Chizara kept her head high and her posture professional. An officer coming in held the door open for her with a smile, and she smiled back, stepped out, and took a deep breath of the fresh summer air. Okay, at least she'd fix something before her juice ran out. Demons never fix things, did they? She took long strides on the sidewalk, her heels clicking. Her new power might have abandoned her, but working it had left a nice buzz behind. Then her phone rattled in her jacket pocket, sending a charge of hard, itchy pain into her side. She smothered a gasp, snatched it out, and glared at it. Glorious leader. What is it, Nate? You hungry? Why do you care? He laughed, and she winched at the noisy buzz of it. I just thought you might need a bite after your morning's work. You're at the police station, right? 
She made herself keep walking. Nate was always trying to psych her out with his guesses. I'm busy, she said. Maybe after a long, rejuvenating walk, the fixing power would come back. But you gotta eat, right? Getting a whole police station up and running. That has to take it out of you. I'm over in the park. Scored a bench in the sundial garden. It's a beautiful day, and I got you a sandwich at the kosher deli. Chizara narrowed her eyes at the people lolling on the grass across the street, all smiling, laughing, clapping each other's shoulders. She examined the lift in her own heart and saw it for the fake it was. This was all Nate-generated euphoria. He was sitting in the park, spreading out a cloud of goodwill to pull her in. But she was hungry, ravenous, in fact. Fixing that server room had hollowed her out like a gourd. Okay, she said weakly. I'm on my way. She switched Gloria's leader off and put him in her pocket. Hadn't she already told him to leave her alone? Sure, it was impressive how he'd read her so right, worked out where she was and what she was doing, all that attention focused on her. But it was also kind of creepy. With anyone other than Nate, it'd be downright stalkerish. But Nate wasn't a creep, just a guy with an ultimate goal that he wanted everyone to fall in line with. Which you're not going to do, Chizara, she reminded herself as she crossed the street toward the park. At the same time as some childish, easily charmed part of her was thinking, he bought me a sandwich. Chapter 59 Crash The sundial garden was bright and busy with Nate cheered people. He was at the center, arms spread along the back of the bench, grinning his champagne grin. Two soda cans sat in the shade of a kosher deli sack next to him. Chizara felt her heart try to lift, her mouth try to smile, but she looked straight into Nate's eyes, poker-faced. He beamed back at her. Did it work? Did what work? She sat down on the edge of the bench, trying to tear her gaze from the sack. Nate opened it and passed her a wrapped sandwich. Your new power. Did you fix everything you broke? Chizara pulled open the paper and took a big, beefy bite, too big to talk around. She covered her mouth, watching him as she chewed and swallowed. He was hoping she'd fixed it all, as if that meant everything was okay and she could come back to the group. As if she didn't have Officer Bright on her conscience, whom no amount of uncrashing would fix. Maybe ten percent of what I destroyed, she finally said. But then it ran out and I couldn't fix any more. I guess I'm back to breaking things now. Ran out. Nate looked more intrigued than sympathetic. You had a new power and then you lost it? She lowered the sandwich half to her knees. Her first swallow was going down slowly. She hadn't chewed it well enough, too hungry. I think I need to crash something else before I'll get it back. Like it was an afterglow of wrecking the police station, but it faded. She was glad she wasn't saying this to Ethan. His voice would find her use of afterglow hilarious. But Nate would get it. He understood how much she wanted her power to be different, better. You don't have to guess, he said, his eyes locked steady on hers. We can help you figure it out. Around them, the picnicking people grew silent, almost serious. I can see what you're doing, Nate she said. I can tell the difference between my own feelings and the ones you want me to feel. He shrugged and laughed, and the pressure eased. A guy can try, can't he? Not if the guy wants me to trust him. You want me back in the zeros? It'll take more than a sandwich and a few bellwether tricks. Nate waved her accusation away, unwrapped his own sandwich. I have some good news for you. I found another zero. Are you serious? Chizara kept her voice neutral, waiting to see what she really felt about this in her deepest, most Nate-proof heart. And she took a second bite. She could forgive Nate a lot if he would just let her eat. What if all it took to get her fixing power back was a few hundred calories? Last night, he said. During the mission I called you about, something weird happened. 
Chizara stared at him, remembering that panicked call. Someone wants to beat up Ethan. Like that was news? So those goons didn't catch a scam? Otherwise you would have started with that. Yeah, he just called me. Another wave of his hand. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. It all went down on Ivy Street last night. Ethan was running from the guys he stole that duffel bag from, and there was this girl helping him. The bad guys were closing in, and this girl did something with the crowd. She pushed it into a frenzy to help Ethan get away. Nate's eyes were wide, his sandwich forgotten. You should have seen it. A pulse of horror went through Chizara. You mean she's like you? Two glorious leaders? Just no. But Nate was shaking his head. It was different. She didn't focus them on herself. She didn't lead them. She brought them together and made some kind of organism, something that had its own agenda. Chizara didn't know what to make of this. Creating a crowd organism and setting it loose didn't sound responsible exactly. And what did this thing want to do? Just pick up money at first, and then it pretty much decided to dance. Nate smiled like he wanted to jump up and show his own moves on the grass right now. Shizara glowered at him, fighting the mood that flooded into her like the sunshine amplified by the picnicking Sunday crowds. Well, it's good you found someone, she said carefully. You've got a replacement for me already. No, don't you see? There are six of us now. Uh, five. Oh, right, but there's that other guy. She snapped her fingers, trying to remember his name. Anonymous, and with six of us, we're a crowd all on our own. A self-contained curve. We won't need anyone else around to get stuff done. Slowly, she raised her eyes. Nate was aglow with excitement and certainty. Beyond him, a dozen people's faces floated out of focus, smiling too, each a sunflower following the sun. She felt the pressure of his warmth, his pleasure. It would be so easy to cave in. Great, so what do we do now that we're a complete team? Except that was the problem. Once they were a crowd on their own, the zeros would fall in line behind glorious leader. Nate's spell would be just that crucial little bit stronger. Who'd be able to resist him? Chizara worked a strand of beef free of her teeth with her tongue. Part of her wanted to do the wise thing and run away right now. But she also wondered, who was this new girl? Was she another Nate all big dreams and personal magnetism? Would she lock horns with him over who should be the most glorious, glorious leader? Or would this girl fall for his charm as all the others had? and follow him on crazy missions no matter who wound up getting hurt. Now that her hunger was less acute, exhaustion was crashing down on Chizara. Using her power had sucked everything from her body, not just the crash buzz left over from two days ago. She folded the wax paper over the bitten end of her sandwich, placed it neatly in the sack between them. You can meet her tonight, Nate said. When Ethan called, he said she wants to meet us. Zero's meeting at six o'clock, then dinner. Chizara wanted to turn away, but she managed to summon the strength to meet Nate's gaze again, resisting the full force of his charm on her psyche. Just come and meet her, he said. There are five of you, Nate, Chizara said softly. With this new person, there are five. If you want to be a six-pack, you still have to find one more. She had time to see his face fall before she stood up and walked away. For a few seconds, it was like wading through oncoming water, all the attention, all the woeful looks on everyone's faces. But then Nate relaxed his hold on the crowd, and they became themselves again, their separate groups, their own unhindered, unexaggerated personalities. They didn't care who she was anymore as she stalked across the sundial garden to the gate. Nate had let her go without a fight. He knew, as she knew, that she'd be too curious about this new power to sit at home while the rest of them got together. And more important than mere curiosity, Chizara needed to warn this new girl. 
that no power came without a cost. Chapter 60 Anonymous When Thibaut and Flicker rounded the corner, the Hotel Magnifique towered ahead. For the first time ever, the sight made Thibaut's heart sink. He'd been an idiot for risking his home to help that little weasel scam. Best friend's right. The guy had probably forgotten all about him by now. He was glad for Flicker's arm hooked through his, her sight lines pinging from strangers on the street to keep him in view. Otherwise, he couldn't face this. At the main doors of the hotel, Tom Creasy greeted them with a professional smile. Thibault might be in yesterday's crumpled shirt, but at least he had shoes on lifted from Sack's shoe barn next door. Inside, staff were coming and going behind the reservation desk. Thibault had timed this perfectly for the shift change. He slipped in, taking a blank key card from the drawer and waking up a computer. You know how all this works? Flicker asked, leaning against the desk in front of him like a guest. Three years of practice, Thibault said glumly. He typed in Katie Chirico's ID and password, hit enter, and gave a little grunt of surprise. What's up? Flicker asked. Changed her password. I'll try someone else's. Flicker looked thoughtful, then drifted away down the long desk, the tendrils of her listening settling over the assembled staff. Bebo decided to go straight to the top, trying the hotel manager's login. This account has been suspended. Please consult the personnel manager. Suspended? Charlie Pinka's account? That made no sense. He retyped the crazy check password. This account has been suspended. What the hell? Are you hearing this? Flicker was back, nodding at a gathering of staff at the other end of the desk. Everyone's supposed to change their passwords. Thibault looked. The staff were tautly wired together with bright connections. Something big was up. The news about changing passwords had just reached the afternoon shift. But maybe the graveyard shift didn't know yet. If he used one of their logins. There, he was in. He rattled in the details and dipped the card. Also, Flicker said quietly, does Penthouse 2 ring any bells? Thibaut groaned. Yup. Some guys are working up there, she said. From Vanetti's? Vanetti's. They're industrial cleaners, not a good sign. Thibaut logged off and walked out from behind the desk. He led Flicker across the lobby so fast that a few barbs of notice stuck to them, which Thibaut swiped away. The elevator took forever to come, then stopped for no apparent reason at the seventh floor cafe while he quietly seethed. Finally, they reached the penthouse level. A cleaning cart was parked outside his old suite, full of mops and steam vacuums and bottles of bleach. The door was propped open and Thibaut leaned forward and looked in. The coffee table was in splinters. The TV cracked. Shards of glass littered the floor. After three years of chopping the wood and carrying the water, of his trying so hard to keep this room looking vacant, the dismal sight was a punch in the gut. It was almost impressive how much damage Craig's thugs had done in the minutes before they'd followed him and Scam and Kelsey out into the night. And he had to admit, Kelsey had really saved them from a serious beatdown. If he ever saw her again, he'd apologize for doubting her. One of the guys in coveralls looked up from scrubbing the carpet. His gaze slipped from Thibaut to Flicker. Did something happen last night? She asked. We're in the other penthouse and we heard some noise. He took in her dark glasses and cane, decided she was harmless. Bunch of kids got in, been living here a while by the look of it. Clothes and video games and stuff. Thibaut walked in past her, chopping away any interest from the Finetti's guys. His clothes were in a pile, torn and glittering with broken glass. His books ripped in half with a tattered copy of Zen for Beginners in a dozen pieces, as if the goons had given it special attention. But far worse, his laptop was gone from its place on the desk. No shards of plastic anywhere, so either the hotel or Craig's gang had taken it intact. Don't envy you guys your job today, Flicker said. 
Her sight lines were hopping around the room, taking it all in. It filled Tebow with shame for her to see his home looking like a disaster zone. Sorry, ma'am. The work crew boss was approaching the door, ready to close it and enforce Finetti's famous discretion. We've got work to do. Tebow slipped past just in time. The door closed with a firm click, shutting him out of his home. And he had no idea where to go next. You okay? Flicker asked, a hand on his shoulder. I'm fine. His voice was hoarse again. Those were just things. Yeah, but they were your things. Flicker moved closer, leaned against him. It seemed like a really nice room. He nodded. It was. I mean, that view, she said. Those workmen couldn't keep their eyes off it. He should have taken a last look instead of mourning his broken junk. But yes, the view was gone as well. No one owns the sunset, he said, and walked toward the elevator. As they rode down, Tebow asked without much hope, Did you see a laptop anywhere? No. Flicker still stood close. You can't go back later? And live there, I mean, after they clean it all up? He shook his head. Not if Charlie Penka's account is suspended. The hotel knows someone was hacking the system. They'll redo their security, start over from scratch. Just like he was going to have to do. Flicker's attention filled the elevator like a cloud of scent. Did you say Charlie Pinka down at the desk? Someone was saying he got fired. Tebow closed his eyes. Oh man, I used his account for room service, food for that weasel scam, and for maintenance supplies. Years of stealing all of it on Charlie, along with what those thugs did last night. Flicker's hand on his was soft, careful. But it was just gossip anon. Downstairs, nobody could believe it. They all said no way was he fired. I know, I know, groaned Tebow. Because he's the greatest boss in the world, and his kids are so cute in that picture on his desk, everyone loves him. The elevator came to a halt and the door slid open, but Tebow didn't even open his eyes. He should just stay in here, a guilty ghost riding up and down forever. No one would notice. All his years of chop the wood, carry the water, had been nonsense, hadn't they? The whole idea that he could take what he wanted without affecting anyone was bullshit. Like Chizara had said a million times, there were always costs. The door closed them in again, the elevator waiting on the ground floor. You think the hotel has your laptop? Flicker asked. We could try to get it back. It doesn't matter. My dad is all backed up and encrypted. But the moment they opened it, they would have seen the reservation screen and Charlie's login. Yeah, but won't you need it at whatever hotel you go to next? He barely had strength to shake his head. Get some other manager fired? I can't risk that. Flicker leaned closer and Tebow finally opened his eyes. The smoky tendrils of her attention were all around him. She was working so hard not to lose him when all he wanted was to disappear. If only she tracked him down a week ago, when he'd lived in that magnificent suite, instead of now with all his strategies revealed as vanity and bullshit. I was fooling myself, he said, thinking I could take what I wanted and not hurt anybody. I'm about as zen as scam in his voice. Someone always pays the price. Maybe you're being a little hard on yourself? Hard? Oh, it's easy for me, I can walk away. But Charlie Pinkham must be wondering what just hit him. He shook his head in disgust. Her sister was right to call me nothing. I told you about that? This morning. He swallowed his disappointment that Flicker had forgotten. She could hold on to a lot, but not everything. It's okay, I call myself the same thing. But you aren't nothing. Flicker's hand pressed against his chest, like she was trying to make herself believe in him. 
I mean, you're right here. Thibaut shrugged. It's from a Zen saying, wisdom tells me I am nothing. It reminds me that it's better not to fight what I am. Fighting it only makes it hurt worse. Like now, the way he was starting to like Flicker, really like her. Apart from the mind-blowing fact that she was mostly remembering him, she was just so zen about everything. Without asking him, she'd understood last night that he needed a place to stay, and she'd been totally cool about finding him in her attic this morning. And the way she'd tracked his hotel down with those old wabi-sabi photos, that must have taken monk-like patience. Maybe Flicker's power made her think differently than most people. She saw the world from so many perspectives and seeing was half of enlightenment. But standing here with her was making him ache for something he couldn't have. Something that didn't even make sense given what he was. He would always disappear in the end. Forgotten. No matter how hard she tried. As if to mock him, a jaunty tune filled the elevator. He turned to Flicker, who'd pulled out her phone. Your ringtone is hail to the chief? Only for Nate, she said with a smile. The conversation only lasted a moment. Then she pressed the open door button and pulled Tebow out into the lobby. He's called a meeting. The sparkly girl is coming in. Chapter 61. Crash. So you guys really have powers? The new girl asked. She was a skinny little thing with blonde curls, short shorts, and a shiny top. Despite her party clothes, she looked tired, thoughtful, and a little suspicious. Suspicious was good, Chizara decided. The question was, could this girl withstand Nate's charisma for more than five minutes? Chizara herself was in the back row of the home theater, arms folded, legs crossed, trying to keep the curve at bay. Another person in the group did make a difference. Maybe six really was a crowd. Wait, six. Ethan, Nate, Riley, the new girl, and Chizara herself were five. Right. That guy sitting next to Riley. Forgettable, handsome guy. He and Riley were hand in hand, sharing glowing smiles. Chizara smiled a little herself. Well, hooking up with the guy was one way to remember him. Yes, all of us have powers, Nate said. And they're all different. But you probably want proof. He smiled, like he had a presentation all prepared. What I want is help, said the new girl. Kelsey was her name. I need to get my dad away from these bad guys. Really bad guys, Ethan added. Russian mobsters. Chizara raised an eyebrow. According to the bank video, Kelsey's father was the robber who'd held a gun in Ethan's face. And now Ethan wanted to rescue him? That was like very unscam-like behavior. What they mostly want is money, Kelsey said. A lot. Money isn't a problem, Nate said, and Kelsey's curious green eyes widened, like she'd never even dreamed those words before. When Nate had passed out new phones to replace the ones Chizara had crashed, and given one to Kelsey too, just to bring her up to the zero's minimum standards, she'd made the same face. Girl wasn't used to presents like that. But presents were never free. The daughter of a criminal had to know that, right? Of course, paying off kidnappers can be dangerous, Nate said. That's where our powers come in handy. Kelsey sized them all up and still didn't look impressed. Any of you have a power that can stop a bullet? Chizara smiled again. She was starting to like this girl. Not quite, Riley spoke up. But we can stop it from coming to that. Take a picture of me. Kelsey shook her head. Do what? Pull out your new phone and take a picture. Riley looked smug behind her dark glasses. Kelsey's hand went to her pocket and she frowned. Looking for this? Came a voice from behind the girl. It was him, anonymous, the phone in his hand. Okay, six people in the room made him a lot harder to notice. 
Now type something on it, Riley said. Kelsey took the phone from Anon's hand, looked at it a little suspiciously, then started texting. Full house, Riley said a few seconds later. Aces over jacks, whatever that means. Whoa, the new girl breathed. She let her hand fall. You read my mind. Nope, I saw through your eyes. Chizara wondered why Riley was running the meeting and glanced at Nate, who was scribbling furiously on his notepad, which Flicker could read, of course. Was he telling her what to say? Did he always do that? Nate looked up at her as if sensing her attention. Would you like to go next, Chizara? What do you want me to crash, Nate, your fancy theater? Everyone's new phones? Maybe this. He produced a mushroom-shaped object covered with LEDs. It was off, silent, but Chizara hated it on sight. I don't even know what that- Nate flipped a switch on the mushroom side. Its howling slapped Chizara back in her seat. It shredded the air and sawed against her skull, pushing to get through and boil the brain inside. She fought back in a spasm of self-preservation. Her mind made a big clumsy swipe at the screaming thing. All the house's systems sputtered around her. The smart thermostats and motion-sensitive lights under attack. The theater down lights flickered and the air ducts moaned like a smoker's lungs. But Chizara scraped together the last fibers of her own will and sent all those plates back into the air, got them spinning again. The lights brightened, the faltering air con returned to a steady hum. Only the hateful mushroom thing stayed dead, its internals blasted. Smoke puffed out its top and its LEDs gave one last hopeful twinkle and died. Oh my God, the new girl turned to look at Chizara, her eyes wide. Ethan was goggling at her too. Are you okay? Nate, that was not cool, said Riley. Panting, Chizara set forward. Nate, do you want me to crash your whole house? He winked at her, the jerk. I knew you'd keep control. It's a cell phone jammer. Nate sniffed at the last wisps of smoke. Theaters use them to keep phones from ringing in the middle of a play. Chizara shivered, the awful air-shredding screech still ringing in her ears. Guess I'm not going to a play anytime soon. So that's your power? Kelsey asked. You zap electronic things? Looking into those wide green eyes, Chizara felt a trickle of sweat slide down her forehead. Good, let the girl see how it hurt, how hard it was to control. Noisy ones, yeah, networked ones. And she's starting to be able to fix them, too. Nate's pride radiated out into the room, a warm, soothing wrap around Chizara's raw nerves. She tried to ignore how good it felt. That was just human experimentation, what Nate had done. Cool, said Kelsey in an awed voice. Nate set down the toasted jammer. So when we pay your dad's ransom, Flicker can see what's going on from every angle. Anon can step in if he needs to, out of nowhere. And Crash shuts it all down if things go wrong. We'll keep those mobsters honest, I promise you. Kelsey nodded, like she believed for the first time that the Zeros were up to this. So you guys are a team? Like real superheroes? How did you all meet up? Flicker and I go back a long ways, Nate said. I can see people's awareness in the air. Hers looks different. Riley shone her best little sister smile straight at him, and Chizara wondered whose eyes she was using. But Tebow brought the rest of us together. Nate looked a little pained to admit it. His power makes him a keen observer. He can tell when people don't fit in. Sure, Anon said. Because leading a hundred bicyclists across town is totally subtle. Right, Nate? It worked out exactly as I hoped. Nate focused his smile back on the new girl. Of course, as Tebow's power also makes him the wrong choice as a leader, I stepped in. Kelsey's eyes managed to hold on to Anon for a moment, then slid back to Nate. I guess you guys weren't looking on my side of town. 
I don't like nightclubs. Anon said, people tend to step on my feet in crowds. But at least we finally found you, Nate cut in. Most of us were there on Ivy Street last night and saw what you did. But I have questions. Okay, Kelsey shrugged. But it's not like I know how I got this way. I mean, it just happens. We're all just guessing, learning, Nate said, his smile leaking into Chizara's bones. So, let's say we're paying your dad's ransom and a bad guy pulls out his gun. How would you stop him? Kelsey shook her head. One guy? I can't do anything, but I can keep a whole group from getting jumpy. If there's a crowd that's bound together somehow with music or a sense of purpose, then I can give its emotions a nudge. But it can nudge me back, too. Crowds have a sort of personality. I get inside that, and it gets inside me. Nate gave her a thousand-watt smile, maybe because he was learning so much, or maybe just to remind everyone that no crowd had ever nudged him for a second. So you're like the DJ at the party, he said. Changing the mood, maybe that should be your code name. DJ? Chizara had to snort. That's pretty bad, even by our standards. A code name? Kelsey asked. We use them on missions, Nate said, to keep our identities hidden. On missions? Chizara liked Kelsey's incredulous tone. Yes, we call them missions. How about a moticon? Riley said. Sucks, Ethan said. Magnify would be better. Crowd control, Nate said. That's your job, Nate, said Anonymous back next to Riley. Plus, it's two words that goes against the rules. Riley stared at him. We have rules? Frenzy, Ethan cried. Kelsey just looked at them like they were all crazy. You guys can call me anything you want as long as you get my dad away from the Russian mob. Mob, Nate said softly. A crowd that has a personality, that wants something. We'll call you Mob. Kelsey groaned like she was losing hope fast. Chizara felt sorry for her. Kelsey, she said in her best mom voice, maybe instead of relying on a bunch of teenagers, you should call the police. But they'll put him in jail. He's a bank robber, Chizara reasoned. Someone died in that robbery. Am I the only one here who remembers that? Tears began to well up in Kelsey's eyes, and Chizara felt something fill the room, a sadness that ached down in her muscles, worse than all the fancy tech in Nate's house. For a moment, she thought they all might see sense, might give up this crazy ransom plan and let adults handle it. But then Nate stood, spreading his hands out. If that's what you want, Kelsey. We can always call the police, but first, let me show you my power. And something else filled the room, pushing out the despair, a focus, a seriousness that Chizara had never felt among them all before, and a hopeful feeling, like they could get through anything together. Of course, Nate had five, six with anonymous, zeros to work with. He was really glorious leader now and Kelsey must have wanted what he was giving her, because as her face brightened, the sense of purpose in the room redoubled. Nate pulled them all in tight until Chizara was practically leaning forward in her chair, ready to work, to concentrate, to give every scrap of her attention to the ultimate goal. But she knew it was a lie. She had to fight this. Nate stood happily at the center of it all. Before you decide, Kelsey, Let's just see if we can come up with a plan, okay? Not me, Chizara said, and it took every ounce of her willpower to stand up and walk to the door. Crash, Nate called softly. Where are you going? She ignored him, but turned just outside the door and said, Be careful, Kelsey. People get hurt when we use our powers. In the middle of a police station, people get hurt bad. Imagine how it'll go in a room full of gangsters. They all looked at her, and for a brief moment, she had them. 
But then Nate drew his hands through the air toward himself, like a puppeteer gathering all his strings, and their heads turned back to face him, eager to hear more good news. Chizara turned and walked down the hallway, her legs wobbly from the struggle. She might have lost, but at least she could rob Gloria's leader of one last measure of the curve. Chapter 62 Scam Three days, three long days of drug dealers, bank robbers, angry cops, and creepy mobsters, and yet this gym was still scary. Ethan figured this was the kind of gym where people worked out for the purposes of secret and highly illegal fight clubs. The woman at the front desk looked like she could pummel Ethan with her little toe. Even the voice was intimidated, lurking deep in his larynx like a mouse. It didn't help that the sweat stink was so bad, like it was pumped into the place. Ethan dipped his nose into the collar of his shirt, which also hid his face from anyone who might recognize him as the bank video guy. Creepy clientele, he muttered through his shirt. Your friends call you scam, Kelsey said. Yeah, so? So you're not free of creepiness yourself. Ethan didn't argue. It was the first thing Kelsey had said to him since she left the staff meeting. And if she was talking to him again, then maybe one day she'd forgive him for getting her father kidnapped. Also, Ethan was mostly trying to avoid the death ray stare of some guy in a gray hoodie. The guy looked amped up on steroids, curling a loaded barbell like it was feathers. Is your contact here? Ethan said. Fig's always here, Kelsey replied. And don't use your voice on him, okay? He's my friend. And your voice just messes things up. Roger that. Your friends seem pretty cool, by the way. Yeah, I guess they are. Sorry I didn't mention them sooner. He was really glad the Zeros had promised to come through for Kelsey. Glorious leader, of course, couldn't resist another addition to a superhuman zoo. But it had been pretty cool, seeing Kelsey's eyes widen when she saw the home theater like Ethan was part of a group with a secret lair or something. It also made Ethan sentimental for last summer, at least the summer they'd been having before he'd blown it up, before Nate had made him blow it up. The summer of running around Cambria, training to be superheroes, thinking they were the most powerful people in the world. Not that Ethan wanted all that back. He didn't need the Zeros to be his friends again after this. He just needed them to help Kelsey. He followed her through the gym. She didn't seem freaked out by the criminal vibe here. The music was playing loud and hard, and she even danced to it a little, like the meeting with the Zeros had given her hope. Wherever she went, the whole place sparked up. Even gray hoodie guy seemed more cheerful. He picked up the pace of his bicep curls like he'd just taken a shot of adrenaline. Ethan felt kind of ecstatic himself. He always felt better around her, but this was maybe more than usual. This is you, right? You're making us all. A beat? Kelsey grinned. You bet it's me. Now I know I'm not the only one in the world with a power. Glad to help with that. You left out some stuff? Kelsey's scowl only lasted a second, and she was bopping again. But it feels good now, like it's a normal thing to have. Helps to have people who understand you. Ethan remembered the first time he met the Zeros. Or rather, he didn't quite remember because Anon had been the first one to say hi, but then Anon had introduced him to Bellwether and Flicker, and they'd all found Crash a few months later, and being a team with them, that was maybe the best two years of his life. They seem like regular people, Kelsey said. I was expecting superheroes, I guess. Definitely not, but Nate wants to help you, Riley too, and Tebow. Who? Kelsey frowned. The other guy. He'll take a while to sink in. Ethan was pretty proud that he still remembered Anon's name. The memories had faded while he'd been running around with Kelsey because she was so sparkly and distracting. But seeing T at the meeting had recharged his memories of the penthouse. Chizara's not into the whole group thing, is she? Kelsey said. Ethan shook his head. She thinks we're kind of careless. Gee. Wonder where she got that idea. He shrugged. We don't need her for Nate's plan. 
They did a circuit of the weight room, Kelsey dancing ahead while Ethan followed. The sweat smell was even sharper in here. Most of the bodybuilders nodded or smiled as Kelsey passed, feeling that rush of energy that swirled around her. When they reached a room with aerobic equipment lined up like machines of war, Kelsey made a beeline for the treadmills. A short guy in a tight shirt was in full sprint, sweat flying off his face. Hey, Fig, Kelsey said. Fig heaved himself up with both hands to the rails of the treadmill, letting the mat spin beneath him. Hey, Kels, he gasped. Who's your friend? He's gonna help me get my dad out of trouble. Fig gave Ethan a once-over. He looked unimpressed, but hit the treadmill stop button with his knee and leaped lightly from the machine. Any friend of Kelsey's? Likewise. Ethan shook the guy's incredibly sweaty hand, then wondered if it was okay to wipe his palm on a trouser leg. Somewhere private? Kelsey asked. Fig grabbed a towel and led them through a doorway and out to a small, empty courtyard. Sunlight glinted on the circumference of glass windows. It felt like the inside of a fishbowl. Fig mopped his face with a towel. So is there a plan? Kelsey said. I need to get in touch with the Bagrovs. They'll eat you alive. I want to pay back my dad's debt. We've got money. Thirty grand, Ethan said proudly. Fig cast a dubious look at Ethan. What's your interest? Ethan had seen that look before. It was paternal, like Fig was saying, make sure you have my little girl back by ten. Ethan stood a little straighter. They kind of liked that Fig thought he might be boyfriend material. Maybe even dangerous boyfriend material. Kelsey had told him not to use the voice, so there was no point trying to lie. It's my fault Jerry's in trouble. I want to fix it. Fig raised an eyebrow. So you're that big video kid. Thought so. Yep, Ethan said. Fig chewed his lip as if this didn't make any sense. Sounds like both you kids got good reason to steer clear of the bag robs. Do you know anything about these guys? I know I can't give up on my dad, Kelsey said softly. We take care of each other. We always have. Fig sighed like he was having a hard time working out how to explain something really complicated. Ethan hated that look. His mother used it on him all the time. He'd left his mother another message that morning, saying that he was okay and would be home soon. Ethan knew he had to face the music once Kelsey's dad was safe. If you've got money, Fig was saying, the best thing you can do is take it and get out of Cambria, at least until summer's over. Maybe by then the Bagrovs will find a new town to pick on. Ethan figured that wasn't a bad idea. He wished he'd done that when he'd stolen the Craig's car. He could have kept driving until he hit L.A. or Mexico. But then he wouldn't have met Kelsey. These Bagrov guys, Fig said, they'll take your money and still do what they want with Jerry. I mean, if they haven't already. He let the sentence trail away. Kelsey took a step forward. What? Come on, Kelsey, you know. Fig pulled his towel off one shoulder and flicked it onto the other. Your dad was in deep. Don't talk like that, Fig, she pleaded. We've got money. That's all they want, right? You have to understand. Fig dropped his volume from a booming baritone to something a little softer. Jerry's not coming back from this one, and I'm not going to let you wind up in the same place. Kelsey glanced over at Ethan in mute appeal. Without Fig's help, the money was useless. Ethan didn't have the first idea about how to get in touch with gangsters, and he was glad to see that Kelsey didn't either. She gave him one small nod, and Ethan let it happen. He focused on how much he wanted to put things right with Kelsey. He hadn't wanted anything this much in a long time. It practically hurt to want something this much. Get it right, voice. Get Fig on our side. Jerry told you a week ago, Fig, that if anything happened to him, he wanted you to take care of his little girl. Fig shook his head. You knew Jerry? I wasn't in that bank for my suntan, Ethan heard himself say. I was there because Jerry wanted me to be. Fig was staring at him now. 
Yeah, we set the whole thing up. It was supposed to go down different, with the Bagrov guy getting shot instead of Hank. More money for Jerry so he could leave town, and a video to prove that Nick was a fink. That's right, Sonia Sonic was in on it, too. Ethan's mind reeled as he listened. Man, the voice was outdoing itself this time. I told Jerry it might not work, and he said, You fix it if it doesn't. Buy me out. Fig will help you. Just tell him everything. The voice took a break for a second, barely long enough for Ethan to swallow. So I'm telling you everything, Fig. You going to come through or not? Fig gave him an astonished look. Jerry thought all that up? Yep. Fig blinked once, slow as a lizard, then nodded. You wait right here. Ethan watched him stride through the gym and straight to the guy in the gray hoodie of all people. After a brief conversation, the guy pulled out his phone. Okay, Kelsey said. That was impressive, but I can't help but remember how things worked out last time you used the voice. Ethan had been thinking the same thing. What had Fig said the Bagrovs would do to him and Kelsey? Eat them alive? Fig returned to the courtyard. They want double what Jerry owed, 25 grand. We've got it, Kelsey said. Head out to Hurricane Hauling and Demolition. Their office is out on Memorial Drive. Some guy called Misha will be there. Ethan sighed. Great, that guy. When, Kelsey asked. In three days, Fig replied. Fourth of July at 7 p.m., unmarked cash. Thanks, Fig. Kelsey said. She gave him a light punch on his overdeveloped upper arm. Her mood was infectious, spilling across the gym and making Ethan smile. Don't thank me, Kelsey. Somehow Fig wasn't included in Kelsey's ramped up optimism. Just promise me anything goes wrong, you get the hell out of there. Let Jerry fix it himself. It's okay, Fig, she said. I've got new friends, friends who can help. Fig turned his narrow glare upon Ethan. We'll look after her, Ethan confirmed. Fig looked like he didn't believe it. Ethan couldn't blame the guy. Chapter 63, Flicker. Sometimes when they were alone like this, it felt like the attic was breathing. Maybe it was how close they were, legs entwined on the old couch, her hand resting on his knee, the rustle of his clothing in her ears. Or maybe it was the summer heat, which carried every tremor of motion through the still, almost liquid attic air. When Flicker had come to the attic, she'd curled up with him straight away, as if her body knew that this was how they'd wound up last time, whenever that was. It was tricky keeping track of everything. She repeated her jokes a lot, and he kidded her about it, which seemed unfair. But other memories were easy, always at her fingertips. She knew that Anon had arrived Saturday night, and that the family didn't realize he was staying up here, not even Lily. Flicker also knew that he had a name besides Anon, but it was annoyingly tricky to remember. She also recognized his scent, his touch, and the sound of his breathing, as if her senses had their own private stash of memory, immune to his power. Or maybe, after all those stories, the attic was magic. Do you ever go see your family? She asked that afternoon. That's a new question, right? Yeah, it is. And I go there once a year to my youngest brother's birthday party. Flicker asked carefully, Do your parents recognize you? Mm, sort of. When my mom looks straight at me, she gets this smile. Like I'm her kid off at college and she forgot I was coming, but she's glad to see me until she looks away. A pause and then his voice was softer. It's harder since my grandma moved in. The house is too crowded, but they've still got my picture up everywhere. Flicker pulled him closer. They must miss you then. I guess. He shifted beside her, maybe a shrug. But they must wonder where I am when they look at those pictures, and I guess their friends ask. They probably have some story they tell, 
something that sticks in their head, even if I don't. My mom takes a lot of pictures. I photobomb them, so there's always new pictures of me around. Maybe that's why she takes so many, Flicker said. But they don't talk to you? My parents don't. Well, hardly. And my middle brother doesn't remember me at all, but Emil, the littlest, knows who I am. Anon laughed. You should. I give him the same damn present every year. Seriously? What? A rock. Flicker laughed. Gee, I never get rocks for my birthday. Me neither. Last year I got him a red almondine garnet. Wait, you're serious? Like a gem? It's a crystal, made of iron and aluminum. He had all the other species of garnet, so now he's got a full set. Anon sounded proud of his work, and Flicker smiled. I didn't even know rocks had species, she said. Emil says they're alive, just very slow. The ache in his voice sent a flash of anger through Flicker. Your mom and dad, they shouldn't have left you in that hospital. They should have remembered. The moment she said the words, she regretted them. Anon's breathing hitched, a tremor moving through his body next to hers. Sorry, she said. Shouldn't bring that up. I'm an idiot. No. He took her hand, that perfect fit. It's just... I told you about the hospital the first night I was here, three days ago, and you still remember. Flicker shrugged. Who could forget a little kid getting left alone in a hospital? Well, you all forgot it the first time you heard it, when Scam's voice said it last summer. Oh. She shuddered. It was hard recalling that day, after what Scam had said to her and Nate. You want to bang your little sister, don't you? Flicker had already known Nate was in love with her, but hearing it out loud, that way in front of all of them, had changed their friendship forever. Nate's power was tangled up with his ego in messy ways, and Flicker knew she was a walking reminder for him that charm had its limits. Anon felt the shudder and squeezed her tighter. It's okay. I'm glad you forgot what Scam said, but... I'm also glad you remember when I told you. I do, perfectly. She even remembered Anon's voice as he told her the story, hoarse and dry, like he was still in that hospital bed, sick and thirsty and alone. When I told Lily about it, she added a whole chapter to the story of nothing. Great, he said, like maybe it wasn't. Sorry to spill your secrets, Anon, but Lily's stories are how I remember you, just like your mom and her photos. Lily can't forget you because you're just a fairy tale to her. She's my extra brain, sort of. <laughs> so you keep telling me, he said, then laughed. Secret twin powers activate. Okay, I can see how it's weird. She felt him shrug, and he said, I'm just worried you'll get disappointed by the reality. Instead of a prince, I'm a guy whose parents forgot him. Instead of a castle, I have a stolen hotel room. Had one, anyway. Now I'm basically homeless. He deflated with a sigh. I haven't slain any dragons lately, either. She laughed. It's not like you slayed, slew, any dragons in Lily's stories, either. That's not really her kind of thing. No? He sounded disappointed. So I slew giants? Vampires, maybe? What is her thing, exactly? Flicker felt a squirm starting inside of her, but didn't let it come to the surface. With a non lying this close to her, he would feel it if she cringed. Lily thinks you're my fictional boyfriend. You're what? Haven't you ever read a book? Her voice dropped a little. Or you're watching a movie or whatever, and there's a hot girl in it, so you pretend she's your girlfriend, you know? Sure, he said, but from the sound of it, he didn't know. She tried again. 
They weren't really stories per se, with bad guys and quests and plots and stuff. I mean, they'd start off that way, but they always wound up drifting into, um, boyfriend stuff. His body trembled. He was either having a stroke or he was at the edge of laughing. Yeah, I know it sounds silly, Flicker said. Especially compared to you and Ethan being really mature and killing tree sprites and red specter or whatever. Whoa, that memory had come out of nowhere just in time. It's red scepter, not specter, Anon said. And I killed no tree sprites. I was a tree sprite. Totally different. Yes, I can see the distinction. Being a fictional tree sprite is way less silly than having a fictional boyfriend. One key difference is there are no real tree sprites. Fictional is the only kind of sprite there is, but there are real boys. He slid his hand from her shoulder down to her waist, tracing every inch between. It sent a shiver through her, and she turned to face him. Yeah, okay. That is different. Flicker was pretty sure they'd never had this particular conversation before. Tell me more. There's not a lot to tell, he said. Except that real is better. This sounds doubtful. I've had some awesome fictional boyfriends. He drew her closer, spoke softer. Yeah, but real is real. Their lips met and the shiver came again. It traveled deep inside her, reaching all the places where she was pressed against Anon. Her legs, her lips and tongue, her skin. Even her breath trembled in her mouth. When they pulled apart, it took a moment to speak again. Whoa, she finally said. Was that the first time? Our first kiss? I mean, the first one like that, he said, sounding breathless and a little amazed. She smiled. Close enough. Chapter 64, Bellwether. The anonymous file was missing, gone. Nate stared at the space where it should have been, the compartment in the home theater riser where all the wires and cable were stuffed out of sight. He couldn't remember putting it back here after the last meeting, or even taking it out in the first place. There'd been a lot going on, with Mob joining the group and a mission to plan, and anything that had to do with Anonymous could slip your mind. Nate looked underneath the seats. Nada. What if he'd left it somewhere around the house? For his parents to find, or the housekeeper? He pulled Chizara's folder from the compartment and headed for the kitchen, where his sisters were decorating a cake for their Wednesday youth group. Gabby had drawn a sacred heart and icing, which looked more like a strawberry wearing a crown of thorns. I need you three to look for something. Gabby didn't look up. We're making a cake, Carmano. I can see that, but it's twenty bucks for whoever finds what I'm missing. That got their attention, and he held up his file on Crash. Like this, but much thicker. They looked down at the half-decorated cake, then back at him. He gave himself to greed, thoughts of candy, of dolls, of everything twenty dollars could buy, and that little nudge broke the stalemate. They were off in a flurry of shouts. In the afterglow of using his power, Nate wondered if Kelsey could have managed a trick like that. Did she command the crowd, or did it command her? Was she like a rider on a horse, guiding a more powerful creature with the cut of spurs? It occurred to him that it was time to start another file. On the way to his room, he was distracted again. The doorbell. Nate checked through the living room windows and swore. DDA Cooper was outside. Detectives King and Fuentes weren't with her. So she was here as Ethan's mother, not as a district attorney. Letting her in was a bad idea. But she would only come back again later. And maybe next time his parents would be home. Nate opened the door. They settled in the living room, just the two of them. The girls were still searching the house, so gathering any sort of crowd was impossible. One-on-one -on -one would have to do. 
How can I help you, DDA Cooper? You know why I'm here, she said. My detectives might not have enough to bring you in for questioning, but you know more than you're saying. Nate hesitated. At the door, she looked tired and distraught. But now she sat straight in her chair, as if administering a punishment. I don't know where your son is, ma'am. She was silent a moment, measuring that statement. But you know something. Nate looked up and found certainty in her eyes. She wasn't going away without some kind of information. But admitting he'd lied to investigators wasn't a possibility. That was a felony, and she was a prosecutor. This called for a new direction altogether. After you left, I started looking for him, he said. She pulled out a notepad. Where exactly? Give me places. Well, not actually looking for him. Nate was paralyzed a moment, but then it came to him. I found that bank video. I figured he must be loving that, you know. She just stared at him. The way he talked back to those bank robbers. Nate continued, letting the words come to him. Everyone in the world seeing how clever he was, how he always knows exactly what to say. Her cool expression faltered a little. The video must have been baffling, her son knowing the name of a bank robber's daughter, but also weirdly familiar. Surely she'd heard scams spout inexplicable knowledge before. You still haven't told me where you looked for him, she said. Online. There were thousands of comments on that video. Nate never read comments, which were pointless, leaderless babble but he was certain there was no shortage of them under Sonia's video. All those people saying, with cojones on that little, oh, sorry. DDA Cooper gave a shake of her head. What does this have to do with finding Ethan? I figured he'd want to read all that. He always loved people seeing him mouth off. So I left a comment myself. Nothing big, just, hey, it's your old buddy Nate. Where the hell are you? And he responded? Nate nodded. About an hour later. This was on Sonia Sonic's blog, she asked, pulling out a notepad. No, that would be too easy to check. One of the sites that linked to it. DDA Cooper was uncertain whether to believe him, but she wanted to. He left a message on my phone saying he'd be home soon. Did he mention that or say where he was? Nate sighed. No, he said the whole bank thing was a joke of some kind, and how he was scared because of those criminals escaping. He figured the bank robbers were looking for him. He didn't think it was smart to come home yet. Nate realized he was practically telling the truth. What site was this? Maybe we can trace him. I really don't remember and his comments disappeared the next day. He must have gotten scared and deleted them, he shrugged. So I deleted mine, too. I didn't want to get him in trouble. DDA Cooper was staring now, as if the proof of Nate's story had disappeared a bit too conveniently, which was fine, as long as she had a glimmer of hope that it might be true. As long as she spent the next few days scouring blogs instead of showing up at Nate's house again. If you're lying about this, she began. I think he wants to come home, he interrupted, letting the truth fill his words. The truth that Ethan would be home eventually, and that he, Nate, felt sorry for her. When? Soon, Nate said. Then he made a decision. More truth. This weekend, in fact. He said there was something he had to do first to put all this video nonsense to rest. Put it to rest? She shook her head. What kind of joke was it anyway? I mean, the way he was talking in that bank, like he knew those men. He used their names. My detectives think he must have been in on it. Nate shook his head. I've watched that video a hundred times, trying to figure it out. He must have heard the robbers talking to each other, and then he decided to be a smart aleck. Something in those words clicked 
An exhausted smile came over her face. That sounds like Ethan. He's always pulling things out of thin air. Nate stared at her, wondering what it was like to raise Scam. Did his parents think he was a genius, a psychopath, possessed? It couldn't have been much fun. Ethan always refused to talk about his power's first appearance. He would say weird stuff to us, too, Nate said. Like he knew things about us that he couldn't have. DDA Cooper's gaze was fixed on some distant point. She looked more exhausted every minute. When he was little, we thought he was a genius. He spoke in complete sentences at two. Nate nodded attentively. Two years old? Flicker had been almost eight when she'd started seeing through her sister's eyes. And Thibault had managed to live with his family until three years ago. Nate wondered if DDA Cooper would mind him taking notes. Probably. But then it changed, he asked, giving her the full wattage of his attention, wishing there were a crowd here to focus it. Right when he turned four, he started to have episodes. One moment he was his usual self, smart, articulate. But then he'd try to repeat the same words, and he would babble them like a toddler again. Did he seem different? I mean, when he was stumbling for words, like he was a different person. She looked up at him, the spell broken by the oddness of the question. Or perhaps because the answer was yes. Sorry, someone's calling, Nate said, before she could ask what exactly he meant. He pulled out his phone, set it to record audio, and laid it face down beside him. No one important. She leaned forward. I need to find my son. He's been missing for days. If there's anything you can do. I'll try to find that blog again and leave more comments. This time I'll let you know the moment I hear from him, I promise. She stared at him, mistrust warring with hope. But she pulled out a business card and handed it to him. Call me right away. Nate accepted the card then gave her his most solemn expression. Is it okay if I mention you, to remind him that he has a home to go to? She sighed. Things haven't always been perfect at home. His father left us when he was little. Nate wondered if Scam's voice was responsible for that. Spouting the wrong truth in the middle of some tantrum, a childhood version of last summer. He knew he should send Ethan's mother on her way now. It would be too easy to slip up, to give himself away to make her want too much from him. But this was a golden opportunity to find out more about Ethan's upbringing and how his power had manifested. Maybe if I mentioned his sister, Nate said. Seems like he misses her a lot. Is she deployed right now? DDA Cooper nodded, still unsure about opening up. But Nate was a connection to her son, a lifeline for her hope and she had nowhere else to turn. He worships Jesse, she said softly. Since they were little, she's the only one that can ever make him tell the truth. Nate glanced at his phone, hoping the battery would hold. Then he leaned forward and listened, a list of questions already forming in his mind. Chapter 65, Crash. Are you sure about this? Ekem asked. Chizara and her little brother stared up at the main entrance to Cambria County General Hospital. Chizara's head was already aching from all the tech. She hadn't been inside a hospital since she was born. All those years of being careful when she ran, of making sure not to so much as twist an ankle. She'd been lucky, everyone had been lucky, that she'd never broken a bone or come down with any serious illness. So much could go wrong inside this broad, white building. A massacre waiting to happen. Ekem might not know how much this hurt, but he knew enough to look frightened. Why do you have to do this anyway? I have to prove that I can train myself, that I don't need Nate and his crew to get stronger. But what if you can't control it, Zara? You could crash the whole place. I'll warn you before I get anywhere near that. Ecom reached out and took her hand. 
Let's get it over with then. Hand in hand, they went slowly up to the glass automatic doors. As they passed through, the weight of the electronics bore down until Chizara could barely see the vast white space, the staff striding about, that man in the wheelchair. She bit her lip. This was what she'd come for, wasn't it? To test herself against a mass of tech like this? You okay? Ecom asked. You're like crushing my hand. I know, she said, and I'm not going to let go. Couldn't do this without you. So you're ready to go up those stairs. Chizara swallowed a rush of panic, then nodded. Halfway up the first flight, the pressure closed down behind her and cut off her escape. She heard herself whimper and sweat broke out all over her skin. Keep going, Ecom said. He's only one floor up. Chizara put out a shaky hand to the rail. Uh-huh, I remember. He helped her creep up to the landing, make the turn. A patient and an orderly on the way down stopped and stared. It's her therapy, Chizara heard Ecom say. She's scared of people. You're doing great, the orderly said, peering over her spectacles. Chizara managed a smile that practically creaked. It was like all the plates from all the restaurants in the whole world were stacked up, really badly, on top of her. And if she wobbled even the littlest bit. When they were alone again, Ecom said, You look terrible, Zara. Let's get out of here. No, I'm holding it all. There's just so much. She probed the labyrinth around her, the sensors, the diagnostic machinery, the forests of surgical aids in the operating rooms downstairs, the miniature pumps shunting fluids into and out of people's bodies. So many machines, all talking to each other. You sound like a stoner, Ecom hissed. She straightened up and he grabbed her hand again. He was a good brother, she thought sloppily, sentimentally before her mind rushed back to coping with the onslaught of intricate pain, elaborate light, filigreed power. She was so close to buckling and letting the whole massive weight come crashing down around her. But it wasn't going to happen. Yes, she was in the middle of a major hospital. Yes, she was about to break every bone in her brother's hand. Yes, she could hardly see straight, but she was still walking, could still read the signs. Pediatrics pulmonary, endoscopy. There it is, she muttered. Intensive care unit. So many flowers, Ecom whispered. Like a funeral, Chizara said. A policeman stood outside the double doors, beside the mountain of flowers piled across two tables. Beyond him, a hundred machines beat and blinked in the ICU. The pain felt like it would melt Chizara's bones. Her voice came out soft, but steady. Are these all for Officer Bright? The officer took in her trembling hands her sweaty skin and nodded. Did they run out of room inside? Said Ecom in an awed voice. He had put flowers in the ICU, the man said. Germs breed in the water. Chizara nodded, then led Ecom to the glass doors. Peering through, all she could see was a nurse passing, blinking equipment, a man with a tube running into the back of his hand. Chizara reached her mind out to all the glowing machines clustered around each ICU bed, the monitors and drips, the pumps and ventilators and dialysis machines. All the equipment was running perfectly, but none of it could heal cells, could mend organs. The most she could do was not interfere, just sweat and tremble, and not let a single chip blink out, a single power-carrying filament fail. But she was tiring. She could feel it. She didn't have much longer. In a little room off to one side, a woman sat dazed, tearless. A policewoman was holding her hand and talking to her. Through everything else, Chizara felt those needles of guilt. She took a deep breath, trying not to get distracted. But then she saw them. On a couch opposite their mother sat three children in a row. A realization slipped into Chizara. 
the finest, sharpest blade skipping across the tendons of her will. Officer Bright's kids weren't out exploring the hospital corridors, entertaining themselves, getting up to mischief. They were sitting there staring at nothing, hoping their father would come back to them. Through the blur of welling tears, the lights in the ICU flickered. Her bleak thoughts shook all those delicate systems, and two small, sharp alarms went off on the other side of the doors. Here in the corridor, the air conditioning coughed and struggled. Zara, hissed Ekam at her ear. She Zara blinked hard. Her brain began to scramble. A tsunami built on the horizon. A nurse ran past. Someone shouted. Officer Bright's wife woke from her daze, and the kids looked around frightened. No, Chizara whispered. Not this. Stepping away from the door, she reached deep, deeper than she ever had before, groping for resources she wasn't sure she had. She all but flattened herself, forcing her mind under the great teetering weight of the tech. She spread herself out in a million directions and lifted, everything straining nearly to snapping from her core out to her fingertips. She pushed back the swelling wave of disaster, pushed herself up into the pain until she nearly howled with it. But she didn't howl. Just hold up, Chizara, hold it all up for as long as it damn well takes. One of the alarms shut off. Then, at last, the other. The air conditioning recovered its rhythm and purred on. Chizara took Ekam's elbow, spoke low. Get me out of here. Should we run? Slow and steady so I don't lose my grip. As they walked back into fresh air, the load lifted off Chizara, transforming from ravening demons to a massed choir behind her. She let go of Ekam's hand and put her face up to the breeze. I am never, ever doing anything like that again. Ekam backed away ahead of her. I thought you were going to die or break that whole building. She glanced over her shoulder at the hospital. It still pulsed with a thousand machines. But it didn't hurt anymore, at least not from out here. You think you were scared? She asked, but Ekam had already turned and bounded down the footpath toward the street. She turned and followed him down the street toward the strip mall. She'd promised him ice cream after this. The hospital visit had been painful and dangerous, but now she knew. The big crash at the CCPD had made her stronger. Maybe her fixing power had faded in the end but her willpower had grown. A week ago, she couldn't have set foot inside that hospital. Sure, Nate's training had worked, had strengthened her bit by bit, but Chizara could train herself, create her own missions with her own ultimate goal, which was to do no harm. She didn't need the other zeros around, complicating things, distracting her using her for their own selfish ends, making her destroy property and put people's lives in danger. And she didn't need to be part of some plan to pay ransom for a bank robber. If someone was kidnapped, you called the police, not a bunch of teenagers with powers they didn't understand. Too bad Kelsey didn't see that, but that was her choice. Come on, Zara, Ecom danced back to her. Aren't you starving? She was, Chizara realized as she pushed open the door into the ice cream joint. She was hungry and exhausted from fighting against her power. She couldn't stop Nate from playing with other people's lives, but she could walk away. She could nurture her power her own way. And if he came around to charm her again, well, that was fine, too. She would test her will against glorious leaders any day. Chapter 66, Anonymous. So the fictional boyfriend is real, Lily said. Thibault smiled, resisting the urge to snip her gaze and disappear into the shadows of the attic. He had promised Flicker to make this meeting work. Her theory was that the two of them would never really be connected until he got to know Lily too. 
because of magic twin stuff. Besides, at seven o'clock tonight, the Zeros were paying Jerry's ransom to the Russian mobsters. If it went like most of Glorious Leader's plans, there would be a lot of stress and chaos, the sort of distractions that made people forget Thibault existed. So this afternoon was probably a good time to cement his connection to Flicker. Thibault stuck out his hand, but instead of shaking it, she brushed past him and sat down on the attic couch beside her sister. Okay, Lily was feeling territorial. Well, what did he expect? The stuffy little attic was the twins' sacred place. It was full of their old toys and clothes, and the walls were covered with the tactile maps from which Flicker had learned the shapes of the continents when she was little. His being here was like Scam invading the Magnifique. I thought you'd be taller, Lily said. And I was expecting a nicer shirt, like in Nate's photos. I told you, Flicker said. He lost everything. Oh, right, Lily said. The beam of her attention trembled like a barbell over a weightlifter's head. She was trying really hard not to lose him. Guess there's no time to pack when you get busted hiding in the hotel room. Keeping eye contact, Thibault sat down on the musty leather chair with its squashed flat cushion. It's not like I can get a job and pay rent. Couldn't you be a spy or something? Lily asked. He smiled. My spy boss would forget me, and do you really want the government using my power? Dude, you're already in my house. Would working for the government make it any creepier? Lily gave the wry mouth twist that passed for a smile with her. But you get spied on yourself, don't you? All those photos, all those theories of Nate's. He's kind of obsessed with you. Thibault pulled a maybe face. The way he felt about that file was pretty much the way Lily felt about him. Don't worry, you're in good company. Lily put an arm around her sister. He used to be obsessed with Riley, too. Don't be weird, Lily. Flicker pushed her sister's arm away. Nate studies all of us zeros. That's just his glorious leader thing. Yeah, but he loved you. Lily turned to smile at Flicker, but her awareness of Thibault didn't fade. It was growing steadier, if anything. And it still contained a touch of acid. Thibault could tell that he fascinated Lily, but she didn't trust him or much like him. Suddenly, Thibault wished they'd done this in a bigger, airier room with more distractions. He wasn't used to someone focusing on him for this long. It was wearing him out. Maybe if he lightened the mood. I should thank you, Lily, for helping Riley remember me. Yeah, you owe me. I painted such a pretty picture. She smiled. At least that's one thing you live up to. Thibault met her gaze, trying not to blush. Lily wasn't bad looking herself. It helped that she had Flicker's eyes, Flicker's wide, clear forehead and strong cheekbones, though her face was sharper, and where Flicker's senses were smoky and soft, Lily's awareness was like daggers. But their connection to each other was unwavering. Maybe twin bonds were something special like those long-married couples sitting side by side in the Magnifique lobby, never speaking, never looking at each other, but aware of each other right down to their bones. Give me time, and maybe I can live up to your fairy tales, he said. Lily gave a quiet guffaw. You sound like you're asking for her hand in marriage, but it's okay, Anon. She patted Flicker's knee. You have my blessing, you two. Oh, get over yourself, Lil Pill, Flicker said. You know where you can shove your blessing. She rolled her eyes for Thibault. This was the version of the twin face he felt comfortable with, the rounder, more open one, a solid band of attention angled at him via Lily's eyes. Flicker was seeing him directly for a change, not in glimpses through a stranger's vision. But it was better when he and Flicker were alone when he was a voice, touches, smells, and tastes. 
He felt himself starting to blush at the memory of Flicker's fingertips, light and sensitive on his face, traveling down his body, her voice whispering in the stuffy darkness. OMG, look at you two, Lily laughed. Is this true love I see before me? Tebow grinned. Maybe Flicker had been right, and meeting Lily really would make their connection stronger. Forgot to warn you. Flicker was grinning, too. Lily said we weren't allowed to be, and I quote, all over each other, in front of her. You guys have to break me in gently, said Lily. I'm a fragile flower, you know. And she did the mouth twist thing again, but it didn't seem as funny. How many levels of sarcasm was Tebow dealing with here? Was this a conversational game, thick with in-jokes? or a quietly brutal fight where the combatants knew all the buttons to push. He dared some sarcasm himself. A fragile flower, so I've noticed. I'm sure you notice a lot of things. Lily's voice lost its jokiness. You found all those crazy friends of Riley's first, didn't you? And you still spy on them. And she goes for the guts, Flicker said wearily. Must be handy, Lily powered on. Finding out on the sly what'll impress a girl. Were you ever in this house before, like when Riley didn't know you were here? No, he said with a clear conscience. But yeah, I've spied on the others to stop them doing too much damage. So you only use your power for good? Plus the occasional nice shirt or fancy hotel room? Sorry, Anon, said Flicker. She promised to be polite, but Lily's always been jealous of the Zeros. Jealous? Lily asked. I'm just worried about you, Riley. Your power is a blessing. But as far as I can tell, the rest of these guys are pretty much cursed. Thibault actually flinched at the word, at the vicious stab of attention that went with it. For an awful second, it was like Lily knew him, really knew him, the way Scam's voice did. Flicker turned to face her sister. That's a shitty thing to say, Lily. It's true. Lily's eyes were off him now, her focus flowing toward Flicker. And in that moment of relief, of no longer being the focus of all this drama, Tebow instinctively reached out and snipped the rest of her connection, just to give himself a rest, just for a moment. He stood and walked softly to the other end of the attic. He realized he was sweating all over. Lily was still talking. He can't live here, Riley. He doesn't want to, Flicker protested. There's just this one thing we've got to do with the Zeros this evening. And what if there's another thing after that, and then another, and he just erases your memories of it? What if he's moved in before, and you can't remember? Lily, Flicker's voice was soft and horrified. That's not even how it works. Thibault turned and cleared his throat, but he'd severed the connection too well. You don't even know him, Lily said, and his family so screwed up they abandoned him in a hospital. Shit like that turns people into psychopaths, serial killers. Lily, stop. I can hear you, Thibault tried to say, but his voice caught in his throat. Lily turned at the strangled sound and her eyes widened. Oh, shit, you're still here. Silence thickened the air. Thibault reminded himself to breathe. When Flicker had remembered the hospital story, it had meant everything. But from Lily's mouth, it was an ice pick in his stomach. Her words had skated so close to what Scam had said last summer. I can't believe you, Lily, Flicker said. How was I supposed to know he was there? Lily turned to Thibault again. Honest, it's like you disappeared. Her awareness left him again, folding in on itself in embarrassment and humiliation as she stood up from the couch. This is too weird, Riley she muttered as she crossed the attic. How am I supposed to know when he's watching us? Lily, Flicker called. 
but her sister lifted the handle on the floor and hurried out of sight. The hatch slammed closed with a bang. Flicker's eyes glistened. I'm so sorry. It was my fault, Tebow said. I cut the connection. But you promised. I just needed a break from, from all that focus. It was like, like Scam's voice knowing Tebow well enough to hurt him. I'm not used to that kind of drama. People aren't supposed to notice me. He tried to compose himself. Without Lily's eyes to use, Flicker couldn't see him anymore. But he felt utterly revealed before her. She stood up, the strands of her listening drawn to his ragged breath. She crossed to him and put her hands on his shoulders. She'll forget what she said, right? You can try again? I guess. He looked down into her worried, unseeing eyes. So can you forget what she said, Anon? Tebow wasn't sure, but that didn't matter. She's a part of you, Flicker. I'm not going to give up. And it's not like she really thinks you're a serial killer, Flicker said. This is just weird, that's all, finding out a stranger's in your house. I know, and it wasn't fair. Disappearing like that, my bad. It wasn't anyone's fault. Flicker leaned warm against his chest, her fingers in his hair. But next time, do us all a favor and stay. Chapter 67 Bellwether Nate kept his eyes on his parents' old Cadillac a hundred yards in front of him. Mob and Scam were in it, headed to meet the Bagrovs. The exchange was fifteen minutes from now at an industrial park at the edge of Cambria. Anybody following them? All clear, Bellwether. Flicker sat next to him in the front, scanning the cars ahead for anyone showing too much interest in the Cadillac. If the Bagrovs had someone watching Mob and Scam, then that someone might be trailing the two of them right now. So Nate was staying a hundred yards back, careful not to be spotted bringing in backup. Which was just him and Flicker, because Crash had remained obstinate about not coming along. Oh, and also, Nate glanced up, and there, sitting in the middle of his rearview mirror, was Anonymous. Oh, hey, he said. Hello again, Anon said. Nate sighed. Could you guys, like, talk or something? The two had been holding hands at the meeting at Nate's on Sunday, but now there was a heavy silence between them. I need to focus on driving, not on remembering you exist. Okay, here's some small talk, Anon said. After we get Mob's father out of danger, I'm finding a new place. Right, Nate said. So that was the reason for the silence. Hiding in Flick's attic wasn't working out. He didn't feel any hostility in the car, but Nate knew better than anyone that loving someone left you vulnerable. A lot of things could go wrong with an anonymous boyfriend. You don't need to know where I live, Bellwether. If for some reason email and phones aren't working, you can always ask Flicker. What he means is, don't try to find him. Flicker smiled at Nate as if she were a reluctant bearer of this message. Nate raised his hands from the wheel in surrender. He was just glad that Anon was connected to someone in the group. He'd always been worried by how isolated the guy was. Ten minutes, he said, eyes on the car's GPS. It's all under control. Okay, this is weird, Flicker said. The driver behind us just checked out your license plate. Nate took a slow breath, easing off on the pedal a little. The Cadillac with scam and mob in it drifted a little farther ahead. Maybe he's looking for a letter, Anon said. Like that game people play on road trips? Flicker shook her head. The passenger's watching us, too. Nate swore. If it's the Russians, we're screwed. It's only supposed to be scam and mob at the meetup. They're not looking at the Cadillac. 
Flicker's finger drummed the armrest between them. Just us. Nate stared at his rearview mirror. The car was too far back to tell anything. What do they look like, Flick? I don't have eyeballs on them, she said. I got it, came a voice from the back seat. Nate told himself to focus. Anonymous was here, of course, and he could turn around and stare straight at them without being noticed. A moment later, he said, the passenger is a big guy wearing a hat. The woman driving is almost as dark as Chizara, not exactly Russians. Worse, Nate said. Cops. Anonymous leaned forward between the front seats, making his presence felt. So you know them? Detectives King and Fuentes, Nate sighed. He'd connected too well with Ethan's mother, so she'd put out an APB on his car in case he went to meet Scam. Some cop along the way had spotted him and alerted the detectives. They still haven't noticed Scam, Flicker said. That's because they're following me, Nate said, slowing a little more to let the Cadillac get still farther ahead. Short version, I was stupid and let my research get in the way of the goal. We can't lead them to the industrial park, Anon said. If the Bagros smell cops, everything goes to shit. And if those detectives see Scam, they'll pull him over, Nate said. And he's in a car with the bank robber's daughter and 30 grand. Even the voice won't be able to explain that. Can you lose them? Flicker asked. Eventually. Nate gripped the steering wheel. He could gather a posse of truckers around him the way he used to do with the bicycles, then slip away down an exit ramp. And if he couldn't find any truckers, there was the traffic coming into town for the big 4th of July display tonight. But it'll take a lot longer than 10 minutes. Anon pulled out his phone. So we call it off, right? No, Nate said. They needed to help Mob rescue her father, or she'd never trust them again. You two go in just like we planned. You keep watch, Flick, and Anon, you slip in and do whatever needs to be done. You can do this without me, right? There was a moment of hesitation from them both, but then Flicker reached her hand back and took Anon's. Nate could feel the pulse between them. Whatever had gone wrong at home, Flick Anonymous was still happening. But how do we get there without bringing the cops along? Flicker asked. It's me they're following. They don't even know who you guys are. I'll let you off as close as possible. I'll cut off their attention, Anon said. And once Flicker whips out the cane, they won't think twice about her. Screw you, she said and reached back to smack his knee. Cops fear me. Nate's eyes dropped to his GPS map. The sooner he veered away from Memorial Drive, the less chance the detectives would have of spotting Scam. He could let Flicker and Anon off on the far side of the industrial park, maybe ten minutes run to the hurricane hauling and demolition building. The plan was sound, even without Nate there to guide them. That was real leadership, after all, making your people strong enough to stand without you but it had never quite worked that way with the Zeros. Text scam and mob that you'll be a few minutes late, and that I probably won't get there at all. Chapter 68, Mob Kelsey let Ethan drive. She was too nervous to do anything but stare out the window, and the Cadillac they'd borrowed from Nate felt too fancy for her to be in charge of. They were on Memorial, headed east toward hurricane hauling and demolition. It was quiet out here, not as quiet as the tenements had been, but empty enough that her crowd power felt hollow in her ribs. Her phone buzzed. Kelsey pulled it from a pocket. That's funny. Ethan gave her an anxious look. What's up? The caller ID says anonymous, she said. It usually says unknown. That's... Tebow, you put him in your phone, you just don't remember. Nobody ever remembers him the first couple of- Ethan's face broke into a grin. Hey, I remembered his name, finally! 
right at Nate's, Kelsey said quietly. There had been a guy there, tall and good-looking. He'd been kind of quiet, but how had she forgotten him? So what does T say? Ethan asked. Kelsey opened the text. Damn, he and Flicker are going to be ten minutes late, and Nate might not even make it, something about cops on their tail. Ethan slowed the car. We have to stall. No way, Kelsey said. Fig said if we keep these guys waiting even one minute, it's all off. She gave Ethan a hard look until he accelerated again. Great, she'd put her trust in these friends of Ethan's, and the plan was already falling apart. They had these amazing powers, but they hadn't seemed like the most dependable bunch. Flicker had been enthusiastic, but she'd been distracted by something, or someone. Right, that good-looking guy again. And then there was Nate with his class president's smile, the sort of boy who always had to be in charge and who never let a group think for itself. And Chizara had refused to take part at all, saying they should call the cops instead of pretending to be superheroes. Which was almost starting to make sense. My dad's screwed, isn't he? Ethan shook his head. Those guys will come through. They rescued me on Friday, and I don't even deserve it. They'll totally be there for you. I hope so, she said. Ethan was scared. She could tell. When he was nervous like this, his crew cut made him look less like a Marine and more like a little kid. She couldn't afford for his voice to screw this up. Her dad's life depended on it. Listen, Ethan, thanks for having my back. I know you're going to stay focused. Ethan looked embarrassed. Least I could do, you know, after everything. Kelsey didn't think walking into a warehouse full of mobsters was the least he could do, but she was glad he was doing it. The hurricane hauling sign loomed at them on the right. I guess this is it, Ethan said. You sure you don't want me to drive around the block, wait for our backup? Kelsey shook her head. Too late, they've spotted us. Three men were standing outside the open warehouse door. As Ethan slowed and turned into the driveway, they waved the car inside. Three of them, Ethan muttered. I was hoping there'd be only one guy to talk to. No, it's better if there's a bunch, Kelsey said. A group was easier to nudge in the right direction. Maybe she could keep everybody calm and focused. My power is strong, she reminded herself. My power can do good. My power can right wrongs. What I really want is backup, Ethan said. The anonymous dude and the all-seeing girl would be pretty awesome right now. Even Glorious Leader might come in handy. Driving into the warehouse was like being swallowed. A deep shadow engulfed them, cutting out any glimmer of the setting sun. There were huge construction machines everywhere, some on wheels, some on treads like tanks. Excavators with large metal jaws or pincers and some kind of machine mounted with a giant steel needle to pierce the ground. The machines were almost as intimidating as the men in bulging suits. Kelsey could make out two more in the shadows. That made five, plus her and Ethan. Not a bad number. She could feel the group's energy forming in the space, a fledgling crowd. She could keep them calm at least, though that wouldn't prevent anyone from calmly shooting her and Ethan in the face. Ethan brought the car to a gradual halt. There's Misha. Check out the guy with him, Kelsey whispered. The stranger was tall and broad-shouldered, he wore an expensive suit, and his gleaming shaved skull was tattooed with several rows of tally marks, like he was keeping score. What's with those tats? Ethan asked. She swallowed. I so don't want to know. Can we keep the engine running? Won't do us any good. Ethan nodded toward the rearview mirror. Kelsey looked over her shoulder. A couple of old Mercedes had pulled in behind, blocking their exit. She exchanged a queasy glance with Ethan. Ready? He asked. She nodded. Let's get this thing over with. Nice and easy. She hoped that's what the Bagrobs wanted too. 
Chapter 69 Mob Kelsey got out of the car. The gangster's nervous energy filled the room, strong enough to set her nerve ending singing, and all that energy was focused on her and Ethan. She took a long, slow breath, stifling the anxiety rising in her gut. Then she slipped into the skittish buzz of the warehouse and softened it, mellowed it out. She felt their resistance, their desire to stay fixed in that raw, angry place. But they gave in eventually. She settled them, like little kids who didn't realize how tired they were. Her power was strong. Her power could do this. Misha, my old friend, Ethan said, his other voice smooth and soothing. He stuck out a hand, like a slick young salesman here to close a deal. Misha smiled leanly. Bang boy, I'm so glad you came along. Wouldn't miss it. You going to help us out today, Misha? I'm going to try, my friend. Is my dad okay? Kelsey felt her interruption jangle the web of tension in the room. She reminded herself to play this cool. Misha slid his gaze over to look at her. He's hanging in there, little girl. He sounded almost gentle. I want to see him. I understand completely. Misha nodded half a dozen times, then he gestured to the man beside him. But introductions first. This is my boss. Mr. Bagrov, said Ethan's other voice. Been a long time. Do I know you? Alexei Bagrov rumbled. Remember that thing back in Chicago? I was part of Zuyev's crew. Kelsey swallowed, realizing the real problem with Ethan's voice. Beyond the fact that it had no morals and no wisdom, it had no fear. Little punk like you worked for Roman Zuyev. Alexei looked like he might laugh. You don't mind if I call him right now. I can confirm. Alexei pulled out a phone. Kelsey looked over at Ethan. For a moment, the terror in his eyes didn't match his smooth expression, but then he opened his mouth and that weird, creepy voice started talking again. You go right ahead, but I don't think he'll hear the phone ringing. He's been six feet under for the past two weeks. Alexei frowned, then began to laugh in a low, coughing stutter. Thought nobody outside Zuyev's team knew that yet. You got that right. Except you, of course, the voice said, and Ethan followed that up with a smile that looked kind of loose and surprised. Kelsey felt the energy in the room ease out even more as Alexi laughed. The men started to visibly relax, their shoulders slumping. They grinned like this was the best joke they'd ever heard. She spoke into those shreds of goodwill. Mr. Bagrov, when can I see my dad? Alexi turned to her, his laughter still in his eyes. There really was something wholly creepy about Alexei Bagrov, and she didn't need a superpower to spot it. Some people had a vibe, one that trickled out into whatever group they were part of. Alexei's energy was practically bouncing off the warehouse walls, as if he was eager for some kind of sick thrill. On the other side of Alexei, Ethan looked unhappy. But his voice said, You understand the lady wants to check the quality of what she's paying for. Of course, Alexei replied. But first, I'll check the money. Make sure it's not traceable. It's definitely not that, Ethan assured him. He reached into the driver's side to pop the trunk of the car, and Kelsey showed them the duffel bag. When Alexei gestured for her to open it, she unzipped the bag to reveal the 30 grand in cash. And now you take the bag out of the trunk, please. Alexei took a step back, as if he thought it might explode. Let me do that, Ms. Laszlo, Ethan's voice said. She stepped away automatically. It was hard not to obey those firm, confident commands. Ethan came around, pulled the duffel bag out, and dropped it at Misha's feet. When a few bundles of money rolled out, Alexei nodded in satisfaction. So far, so good, Kelsey let out a breath. She prayed that Ethan's voice was going to stay on target, that Ethan wouldn't slip up and forget that they were here to save her dad as well as themselves. And show us nothing else inside, Misha continued.
Ethan squatted and rummaged through the open bag, stirring the wads of rolled up cash. Nothing but dollars in here, the voice said. We've got no reason to put a tracker in. We just want Jerry Laszlo back. Ethan held up a wad of the stuff, but Alexi gestured it away like it was dirty. He indicated for one of his colleagues to step in. The man took the cash from Ethan, slipped off the rubber band, and started flicking through it. It's non-sequential used, Ethan said with that preternatural calm. From a small-time operation on Ivy Street. Drug money, Misha asked. Is that a problem? The voice said like it knew it wasn't. Not for us, Alexi confirmed. Kelsey was glad Ethan was there, and his voice. She couldn't imagine trying to get through this on her own. She worked to stay on top of her fear so it didn't bounce around the room. The men around them seemed content to watch and wait while the one guy counted. It's $30,000 and change, she said. 30. Alexi looked pleased. The price was 25. Ethan's voice said, Consider that interest, an investment in a beautiful new business association. Kelsey tried to smile. Every time it spoke, the voice ratcheted up the stakes just a little, like a mark at a poker table. It couldn't resist pushing its luck. So here's my question, Alexi said. Four days ago, you handed Jerry to my colleague Misha here, and now you're buying him back. Why? It was all part of my plan. I wanted to meet you personally, Ethan's voice said. Nothing makes for an introduction like a smooth transaction. Alexei Bagrov beamed, and Kelsey stifled the temptation to tell him and the voice to get a room already. Instead, she said, Mr. Bagrov, can you bring my dad out now? Oh, he's not here, Alexei said casually. He spoke over his shoulder. How's the money? Good, said the other man, still counting. But we paid you, Kelsey said, trying to staunch the panic before it leaked out into the crowd. You have to give me my dad back. It was the wrong thing to say. Apparently, Alexei didn't like to be rushed. The stare he gave her made her pulse beat faster in her ears. The guy nearest her reached for a gun at his hip and brought it around so it was in front of him, pointing at the floor. He kept his eyes on Kelsey, his knuckles white on the gun grip. Ethan held out his hands. So, just tell us where he is, gentlemen. We'll go get him. Save you the effort. Not necessary, Alexi said. We're happy to reunite you with your father. But if you want to see him, you'll have to come with us. Kelsey was about to agree when Ethan's voice spoke up. Now, wait a minute, gentlemen. You're changing the rules. What rules? Alexi smiled. Tie their hands. Misha looked surprised, but hesitated only momentarily. Then he came toward them. Wait, Ethan said in his real voice, the fear evident. Kelsey watched Ethan open his mouth like he was about to say something else, but nothing came out. Ethan, she said. He was still silent. One of Alexi's men grabbed her wrists, pulling her arms behind her. Scam, she cried. He looked at her sadly and shook his head. A bag came down over her head, blocking her view. Chapter 70 Anonymous Holy shit, Flicker said. I just lost Mob's vision. Is she... Tebow slowed. Did they... He didn't have the breath to finish. They'd been running for five minutes as fast as Flicker could go. The industrial park was huge, the warehouses growing bigger, and the streets wider as they ran, like some kind of nightmare. And he had to call out every possible danger he could see coming up. Gravel, potholes, curbs. Cursing the fact that he was the one person whose vision she couldn't use. Flicker's expression shivered, changing as she switched to viewpoints. No, but they put a bag over her head. Scams, too. The guy whose eyes I'm in, he just shoved them into a trunk. A Mercedes. Black. Tebow stared at the warehouse across the parking lot. Hurricane hauling and demolition was painted in giant letters on the side. So near, but too late. 
Let's get closer, he said. Maybe I can get in there before they drive away. I don't know, Flicker said. Those guys look pretty scary, like you could punch one in the face and he'd just laugh it off. How many? Her face did that thing again, shifting moment by moment as she cycled through every viewpoint in the warehouse. He could see why Nate had named her Flicker. Five or six, she said. Plus mob and scam. They won't notice me, Tebow said. Let's go. They ran again. Flicker was off in her own headspace, her eyes inside the warehouse, so he had to lead her along flat ground, avoiding curbs and concrete parking barriers. As they neared the building, Tebow felt a glimmer of the people inside. All that focus leaked through the walls, like when Glorious Leader was working a room. Someone big was in charge there. There was a side door, but a chain link fence stood between them and it. He laid Flicker's hand against the metal. Can you climb this? Riley hooked her fingers through the links, frowning at the sky. Tebow tried to sense more from the arcing signals in the building, but he only knew that the people in there were focusing hard. They're getting into cars, Riley said. Tebow started to climb the fence, but then something buzzed up along the road beside the warehouse. He jumped down and spun around, ready to fight but it was a delivery scooter, pizza to go, was written on the insulated box behind the rider. It zipped past and into the driveway next door. The cars are moving, Riley said, clambering up the fence. Tebow's mind went numb with panic. Taking on a half dozen gangsters was crazy enough, but there was no way for him to stop cars in motion. In front of the next warehouse, the pizza guy switched off the scooter and stuffed the key into his jacket pocket. He took a stack of pizzas out of the insulated box. Sunlight spilling in, Flicker cried from the top of the fence. The doors are opening up, they're leaving. Thibault reached up and took her arm. It's too late to get inside. So what are we supposed to do? Thibault had recovered and was back in mission mode, where he just had to grab the solution at hand. I have to leave you here, Flicker. I'm going to follow them. Will you be okay? She jumped back to the ground, took his shoulder to steady herself. I'll be fine. Move it. They're turning a car around, but they'll be gone any second. And you can make it back on your... She grabbed his other shoulder, pulled him close, and kissed him. I'll be fine. Now go. She blew another kiss at him two-handed, as if she were throwing him away. He stumbled backward, then spun around and sprinted across the next parking lot. Up ahead, the pizza guy was being waved in by a girl in coveralls. A tight little connection shone between them, either a mutual crush or a bad case of pizza hunger on her part. He ran harder, wishing he was wearing broken-in sneakers instead of shiny new shoes. By the time he burst through the doors, there were easily ten people in the reception room. More workers in brown uniforms were crowding in. Pepperoni and lots of it. Where's my Hawaiian? Thibault slipped through them, hacking away any glances they threw him, heading for the girl in coveralls. She was counting out money to the pizza delivery guy. His jacket pocket gaped open so wide anyone could have taken the key. A moment later, Thibault was out the door and dashing for the scooter, key in hand. A black Mercedes sedan was already easing out of the driveway next door. Two big, sunglasses-wearing guys were in the front seat, and a bald-headed man was in the back. Flicker stood in the shadow of the warehouse, one hand in her hair, the other reaching out searchingly along the road. She was trying to read what she could from the receding car. Tebow straddled the scooter, stuck in the key, and started the engine. Chapter 71 Anonymous the scooter was a twist and go. At least he wouldn't have to learn gears on top of everything else. Tebow steered the little machine across the parking lot, getting the feel for the handling, the accelerator. The buzzy revving bounced off the warehouse fronts. Then the echoes fell away as he got out into the industrial park's entrance road. The black Mercedes was up at Memorial, waiting to turn right. That was a relief. He didn't feel like tackling a left turn right away. As he pulled in behind, a thin line of awareness touched him from the driver of the Mercedes, 
bouncing off the rearview mirror. He'd heard the buzzy engine behind him. Thibault chopped the faint thread away, then checked out the controls between the handlebars. It was simpler than he'd expected, like riding a toy. And it had almost a full tank of gas, so he didn't have to worry about that. The Mercedes pulled out and Thibault turned after him. And then they were on Memorial Drive, the scooter's weeny engine screaming up to top volume as he tried to keep up with the more powerful Mercedes. There was a lot of traffic, all of it moving fast. Driver's attentions lanced forward and darted across to other lanes to read the situation, the flickering lines crazy delicate among all the thundering machinery. It was hard work just controlling his fear as a pair of semis roared by. He felt like a rabbit in a herd of stampeding buffalo. Thibaut had stopped riding bicycles when he was ten, all those drivers almost running into him. I didn't even see you. Where the hell did you come from? He was okay in a car. People registered the machine, not the person inside. But on a bicycle, you mostly notice the person, not the spindly frame and wheels below them. He'd never tried a scooter or a motorcycle. Until now, it hadn't been worth the risk. But here he was, flying along the highway, probably halfway invisible to every other driver, and with no helmet to save his brain case if someone swiped him off the road. And all to save the druggy father of Scam's new friend. Would the big insulated pizza box painted with Pizza To Go's garish logo be enough to attract other drivers' attention? Probably not. Thibaut swore and swerved into the next lane as an Escalade cut him off. Could the guy not see him, or was he just a dickhead? At least the gangsters in the Mercedes wouldn't spot him. All he had to do was keep the damn thing in sight. They were headed back into town, that was good, right? They weren't going to throw Mob and Scam off a cliff, or take them out into the desert and shoot them. But wherever they were going, what could Thibaut do on his own? He got ahead of the Escalade and changed lanes to get in right behind the Mercedes. He wished he could let Bellwether know what was happening, but the thought of pulling out a phone right now was laughable. At last, the Mercedes crossed into an exit lane and led him out of highway hell. Shivering from breeze-chilled nervous sweat, his body aching from holding rigid, Thibault followed the smooth black car through the lacework of streets and lanes up around the stadium. Finally, it slowed and pulled into an alley behind some office buildings. Thibault hesitated at the alley entrance. The Mercedes was drifting to a halt at the other end in the shadows of the two tall buildings on either side. Thibault switched off the scooter, kicked down the stand, swung his stiff body off. A shimmer of attention came at him from the alley, but he hacked it away, leaned back against the brick wall, and peered around the corner. The Mercedes trunk popped open, but Thibaut could see nothing but blackness inside. The three guys were out of the car. Wow, they were all muscle, their cheap suits straining to hold them in. The bald one went to the trunk, flipped it wide open, reached in and lifted out a familiar duffel bag. Thibaut shut his eyes and beat the back of his head gently against the brick. You idiot, he whispered. You useless, impatient, stupid. He pulled out his phone. There were seven messages from Riley that he hadn't heard through the scooter's buzzing. He ignored them and dialed her. Anon, you okay? You tried to tell me, didn't you? There were two black Mercedes. Yep, and you followed the money, right? They just unloaded it. Did you see where they took Scam and Mob? The other car was headed back toward town when I lost their vision, they were right behind you for a second, almost hit you. Then the pizza guy came out and started freaking out. Poor guy, should I come pick you up? I'm already in a cab. I updated Bellwether. We're meeting back in town to try to figure out what to do next. I'll catch up with you there, then. I guess, but you might want to uh, liberate a certain duffel bag on your way here. Maybe we can get them to try this again from the top and not screw us this time. Good idea. But Anon? Riley's voice softened. If you have to choose between getting the 30 grand and coming back in one piece, I hear you. I'll be careful. Make sure you are, she said. 
Chapter 72 Scam Ethan had been rolling around in the trunk of a car for God only knew how long. Then he'd been hauled up countless flights of stairs by thugs who thought it was funny every time he tripped or staggered. His knee throbbed from where he'd fallen on it, the exact same spot, twice. Then he'd been shoved against a rough concrete pole. And all this with a bag over his head that smelled of diesel and grease. He hoped it was diesel and grease anyhow, and not the panic-breathed saliva of the last guy the bag robs had kidnapped. Right now, they were tying his hands behind him with enough rope to harness two ships. Ethan released his voice. It was easy. He wanted to be free. He'd never wanted anything so badly. Misha, the voice said through the bag. You don't want to do this. The bag was pulled from his head. It was dark, wherever they were. I'm sorry, my friend. Misha sounded genuinely sad. But Mr. Bagrov, Alexei's never going to take care of you, Misha. Look what he did with our deal. The voice went on talking, but Ethan was barely listening. He was looking around the large, empty room they'd been brought to. Like a hotel conference room, but dusty and abandoned looking, missing furniture and light fixtures. Just four thugs with flashlights. A bank of windows had a view onto the setting sun, and Ethan was sure he could hear something outside. A megaphone, maybe? Couldn't make out the words. The speech ended and distant music started. Across from Ethan was another man also tied up. His head lifted and caught a beam of flashlight. Whoa, it was Jerry Laszlo. Probably. His face was bloodied and bruised. Blood had dried into the gray whiskers on his cheeks and dripped all over his dark shirt. Blood caked his nose so hard he was breathing through his mouth. You're right, my friend. We had a deal. Misha was saying mournfully. But Jerry here made us all very angry, and whatever you were pulling at the bank, Mr. Bagrov didn't find it amusing. Your deal was with me, not Laszlo, the voice said. Are you a man of honor? I am, my friend, but I am also a loyal man, and orders are orders. Ethan stopped listening to the conversation. Kelsey had come stumbling into the room, a greasy bag over her head, too. Two of the gangsters sat her down and tied her to a pole a few yards away. When the bag came off, she looked scared. Ethan felt his heart lurch as her fear pulsed through the room. Ethan, she said, blinking. Where are we? He shook his head. No, came a cracked, thin voice from across the room. Kelsey turned. Dad? Oh my God, what have they done to you? Jerry looked at them glassily, like he couldn't quite see that far through his blackened eyes. Kelsey! Jerry tried to say more, but he was wheezing and coughing so hard he couldn't get it out. That was probably for the best, Ethan figured. After everything they'd been through, Kelsey was finally reunited with her dad, but not in any kind of way she would have hoped. Kelsey was talking softly to her father, pulling at the ropes that bound her to the concrete pole. Ethan turned back to Misha. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been this scared. Not even a road trip with the Craig had scared him like being tied to a pole in an empty building by a bunch of treacherous gangsters. Based on what they'd already done to Jerry, whatever happened next was going to be bad. The voice felt his fear, his rank desire to escape from this place, and turned it into words. Misha, you listen to me. Alexi is a psycho. You really going to let him abandon a couple of kids? Here, of all places? Misha checked his watch with his flashlight. We must go now. Sorry, kid. I liked you. Ethan swallowed. Liked? Liked? That was past tense. He took a deep breath and let his voice loose. His good, old, faithful, reliable best friend, the voice. You can't leave us here to die. Oh, crap. The voice knew what they were planning. It always knew the score. Ethan, Kelsey said. What's happening? The voice didn't answer her. It was still working on Misha. Did your father raise you like this? Is this what he meant when he told you about honor? Doing something like this to a couple of teenagers? 
Misha looked sickened, which didn't make Ethan feel any better. There was a sound from Jerry then, a kind of wet, gurgling cough. Don't leave my little girl here. Please. What did she ever do to you? Ethan turned to Misha in one last desperate attempt to understand what was going on. He tried to use his real voice just to ask Misha how they were going to die, but his real voice wouldn't work at all. He was too freaking scared. Dad, Kelsey said softly, I'm sorry I failed you. And then Ethan realized what he really wanted, for Kelsey to live, even if he didn't make it himself, which was totally unexpected and really kind of selfless. Man, what a stupid time to realize he felt this way about her. He summoned every shred of the voice, the all-knowing, uncaring voice, the voice like a perverse genie always trying to please him. He wanted money, the voice got him money. He wanted girls to talk to him. It said the right thing to hold their interest. And now all he wanted was for Kelsey to be okay. Think of your little cousin. Think of Natalia. Kelsey's only a few months older than her. You can't do this. Misha took a step back. It was working. Think of someone leaving Nata tied up in a place like this with only a few hours left. Think of her crushed inside a mountain of concrete and steel, smeared out of existence, turned to pink jelly. As Ethan realized what it was saying, the voice sputtered out. It couldn't talk for one simple reason. Ethan was so afraid that he could no longer breathe. Kelsey blinked. What did you just say? The Parker Hamilton. Ethan squeaked. The building we're in is that building, the one they're blowing up? The Parker Hamilton? Misha nodded sadly. Ethan tried to summon the voice to tell Misha whatever it would take to release them. He opened his mouth a couple of times, but nothing came out. The voice knew nothing would change Misha's mind. Misha, Ethan said at last in his own squeaking, pants-pissing, weaselly tones. Please. I'm very sorry, my friend. Misha reached over and squeezed Ethan's shoulder, which was when Ethan got really, really mad. He hadn't been this angry since last summer, cornered by the Zeros in Bellwether's show-off rich guy home theater. And after everything he'd been through, the Craig and the bank robbery and the cops and the reunion with the Zeros and the avoiding his mom, and finally this, this, dumped in a building that was set to explode by a guy who wouldn't stop calling him my friend. For a moment, he didn't care whether he lived or died. All he felt was rage. And that's when his voice, the voice of no consequence, really let loose. Chapter 73, Scam. You're right about your sons, Misha. They're gonna be bigger men than you. The voice sounded like a snarl now. It was done wheedling. Now it was rounding for the kill. What? Misha paled. Alexi will promote them one day, and those two brats you helped bring into the world will topple you. They already hate you. You've known it since the moment Petja was born. He will supplant you one day. Ethan didn't know what supplant meant, but if the expression on Misha's face was any guide, it was a pretty gruesome thing. How do you know all this? The man said. The voice didn't answer, just kept on going. Petya and Lynn are going to shoot you in the street and leave your body in a dumpster, just like you saw in that dream. Misha looked about ready to wet himself. What are you, a demon? Of course I am, the voice cried out. How else could I see into your soul? Glad you finally realized, Misha. The voice sputtered, and Ethan realized that for a moment he almost felt sorry for the guy. But he reminded himself that his life was at stake, how Kelsey's life was at stake, and his anger soared to new heights. You think a few hundred tons of rubble will stop me from haunting you into the grave, my friend? If you don't let all three of us leave right now, I'm going to save your sons the effort of killing you and drag you straight to hell. Misha dropped his flashlight. It rolled at his feet, sending huge shadows lumbering across the walls. 
The other gangsters were also rooted to the spot, dumbfounded and incapacitated by the voice's demonic spewing. Tears were streaming down Misha's face. Okay, that wasn't normal. No way could the voice do that to a bunch of grown men. Plus, the voice was usually a one-on-one -on -one deal. Then Ethan felt it, the fear moving through the room, echoing down the empty and abandoned corridors across the dusty carpets. The entire empty hotel groaned with terror. He glanced at Kelsey, who looked wide-eyed and horrified. Of course, she was helping him. Like with the crowd on Ivy Street, only instead of throwing money, she was letting her own terror redouble the voice's hellish ranting. Kelsey nodded back, urging him on. Right. Ethan turned toward the huddle of men by the door. Who else wants to mess with this demon? And who wants to live? The men looked terrified. Ethan felt the voice bubbling away in his larynx, itching to get out. But a sharp, piercing, shrilling stung through the room first. One of the thugs pulled a phone from his jacket pocket. It's Alexi, wants us back there. A little snap went through Misha. Alexi would kill me if I let you go. And not just me, my whole family, little Natalia, too. You think I can't come for Natalia? The voice roared. Misha thought for a moment, then said, My cousin has never wronged you, and I think you are a demon of honor. And he walked out the door. Misha was gone, the thugs were gone, and all the flashlights were gone. The only light that remained was the hard streaks of sunset from the windows. Crap. Ethan said, one badly timed phone call had ruined everything. Kelsey's voice came from the gloom. Did he just call your voice a demon of honor? I know, right? The three of them were silent except for Jerry's labored breathing. Ethan listened to the sounds outside. The music stopped and he heard a crowd laughing and cheering. They were waiting for the fireworks to start. For the big finale, that would be the Parker Hamilton blowing up. The occasional rolling floodlight lit the side of the building. Can you hear that crowd, Kelsey? I can feel it. They're pretty excited. Ethan straightened, the ropes around his wrists tightening. So make them do something, like storm the building. Kelsey shook her head. They're too far away to feel me, and I doubt they'll be coming any closer. This place is wired with explosives. She looked up above her head. On the pillar above her was a big orange package labeled C4. Wow, they really were going to be pink jelly. Pink mist, more like. They were quiet for a while until Jerry spoke up. Kid. My name's Ethan, he said quietly. Ethan, who screwed up your robbery and blew 30 grand trying to ransom you. My friends were supposed to help us, but they didn't show. Maybe they got scared. Maybe they thought I deserved what I got. I guess I have zero friends left. Ethan, Jerry said. Yeah, buddy? Thank you for trying to save me, but you shouldn't have brought my little girl along. That wasn't my idea. Ethan banged his head back against the concrete pole. It hurt. You're not helping Dad. Kelsey said. This sucks, Ethan said, struggling against the ropes around his wrists. I just wanted a ride home. Ethan, you're not helping either. But that's all I wanted. Then the Craig's money fell into my lap, so I wound up in that stupid bank. Ethan was rambling. He knew it himself. But I just wanted to get home before my mom grounded me. I can't believe I never talked to my mom. At least you scared the crap out of Misha, Kelsey said. Ethan stared at her, wondering how she could be so calm. Maybe channeling all that terror through the room had left her numb. He wished it had done the same for him. He was feeling every moment of this, plus his head still hurt from banging it on the column. Maybe your friends will save us, Kelsey said. Ethan shook his aching head. How would they even find us? Besides, they bailed on me, Kelsey. They hate me. I don't think they do, Kelsey said. I was in that room with you all, and what they feel for you isn't hatred. Ethan groaned. 
I have this feeling you're going to tell me what they do feel, and it's going to be even worse, like contempt or pity or some word I don't even know. Maybe individually, they're still mad at you, she said, her voice softer as the last light of sunset faded in the room. But groups are bigger than their members. Sometimes they're a little wiser. So yeah, together, I think they feel... Ethan waited, trying not to listen to Jerry breathe. But Kelsey had stalled. For Pete's sake, what? He asked. It turned out he really wanted to know what the Zeros thought of him. What do they feel about me? Hopeful, she said. They have hope for you. Ethan closed his eyes, and a pain that had been burning inside him since last summer lifted just a little. He realized something that he'd hidden from himself since then. He wanted to be a zero, damn it. Wanted to hang out with all those stupid freaks, enacting glorious leaders' nutso plans, pretending to be superheroes instead of knuckleheads who should be locked away. But it didn't matter now, because sometime after nine o'clock tonight, he and Kelsey and Jerry were all going to be turned into pink mist and then buried forever where no one would ever find their shattered bones. Hope, he said. Gee, now you tell me. In the darkness, he barely saw Kelsey shrug. I thought you should know, she said. Chapter 74, Flicker. Still nothing. Flicker leaned back into the BMW's passenger seat, giving her vision a rest. These buildings are all empty. Thank God it's the 4th of July, Nate said. We could never do this on a work day. Flicker pressed her fingers into her temples. True, it was a lot faster reaching into an empty warehouse than going floor by floor, room by room. But it also took real brain effort to stretch her awareness across those parking lots, searching for eyeballs that weren't there. We should go downtown, Nate. Anon said that's where they took the money. Can you handle all those eyes? Those fireworks are less than an hour from now, and the crowds have been building up since noon. More people is better. I'll have more range. Yeah, but Ivy Street on a Saturday night overloaded you. What will half a million people do? Flicker shrugged. They were drunk and going crazy thanks to Mob and her bag of cash. I'll be fine. She heard his fingers drumming on the steering wheel. Look at it this way, she said. I'm not lying in the trunk of a mobster's car with who knows what about to happen to me. Worst I can get is a headache. We don't know that. I don't want you to break yourself. The concern in his voice made her smile. If it were anybody else, Ethan, Anon, even Chizara, he'd be telling her to push her power to the limit, damn the torpedoes, and bring on the human test subjects. You're sweet, glorious leader, but we need to find Scam and Mob. Okay, I'll head into town. Just take one more look, Flick. I don't want to miss anything out here. Flicker let her vision loose again, searching for eyes. The drivers were easy to ignore, whipping past much faster than Nate's crawl, their eyes on the road. She didn't find anyone in the darkness of a trunk or with a hood over their head. Out this far, there were almost no pedestrians, and the factories, warehouses, and auto repair places were all closed for the fourth. No one but security guards watching TV and homeless people. Nada, she said. Let's move, Bellwether. The car's acceleration pressed Flicker back into her seat, and a tremor of excitement started to build in her stomach. Finally, she was going to see what happened with a real crowd around her. You'll tell me if it gets too much, Nate asked. I'll be okay. The day I found Anon's hotel, I was smack in the middle of downtown, flitting all over the place. Right. About that. Nate's voice shifted. He'd turned to face her. You never told me how you found him. Nope, and I'm not giving you ideas about how to find his next place either. Just drive. I'm driving. Fast, Nate said, and she felt a swerve as he changed lanes. But I'm impressed that you found him when I never did. 
I assume your power had something to do with it. She laughed. Not telling. Boyfriends beat bellwethers. Boyfriend. Nate's voice was steady, hard to read. So, this is serious. Yeah, it is. I mean, a glimmer of vision flashed past on the roof of a nearby building, but it was just someone with a six-pack who'd found a distant view of the fireworks. It's hard to tell how serious exactly, because I'm never quite sure how things are progressing. An awkward silence. That thing Ethan had always said about Nate being like her big brother was sometimes way too true. And the much worse thing, the one the voice had said last summer, was always lurking around the corner, if only because the voice had said it out loud. For a distraction, Flicker put herself in Nate's eyes. Whoa, this was much faster than she'd ever seen him drive before. It was nice to know the mob and scam were more important than Glorious Leader's spotless record. Must be weird, forgetting, Nate said. He'll always know more about you than you know about him. It's not his fault. He's not trying to keep things from me. Sure, but if he wanted to, he could tell you one thing one day, something completely different the next. Nate's voice grew softer. Depends on whether he's a good guy. Flicker reached out and took Nate's right arm. He's a good guy. I wouldn't feel this way otherwise. So you trust your heart. Nate's voice was raspy, but his gaze was steady on the road, and the spires of downtown were rising up before them. This wasn't jealousy. Flicker was almost certain. This was concern. Not just my heart, she said. I trust him. The car was slowing. In Nate's vision, a river of brake lights streamed away, a titanic traffic jam of people headed in to see the show. Hold on to something, he said. It's about to get bumpy. Wait, what? She started to say, but the BMW was already leaving the highway. The car slipped past the shoulder and went skidding down the highway embankment. Flicker found herself clinging to the dashboard, her teeth rattling in her head. Nate's vision was too shaky to hold, and she let herself go blind for a moment. A smack went through the whole car. What the hell was that? She cried. One of those barriers, he said, just as the beamer's tires hit pavement again. Those things that discourage you from doing what I just did. She went back into his eyes. They were down on the old service road, zooming along much faster than the cars above them on the highway. Whoa, Nate. She was seriously impressed. He was driving like a maniac, even though the cops were looking for his car. Get ready, Nate said. Your head's going to be busy soon. But Flicker had already felt it. The edges of the crowd, the host of vision, that ocean of eyes. It swept closer, and her mind began to sizzle. She squeezed his arm tighter. Let me know if it's too much he said. I'm good. It was better than good. It was swimming in omniscience and an all-seeing buzz of overloaded vision. Her mind was full of bright shimmers, people staring at the city lights, the sunset, the glowing screens of their phones, kids waving sparklers and glow sticks in front of their eyes. But even in these great numbers, the crowd didn't have the wild, convulsive intensity that had infected Ivy Street. Maybe this crowd was more sober, or maybe, without mob to turn them into a mad, pulsating gyre, it wasn't going to be so dizzying. Get as close as you want, she whispered, letting her vision flit and dart. The mobsters wouldn't be holding prisoners in the street, so she shot up into the skyline. The windows were full of eyes. Offices with views of the fireworks were throwing parties tonight, and of course the hotels were all full. Flicker flashed through a thousand eyes a minute, searching for anyone in a small dark room, shoved into a closet, or staring down the barrel of a gun. But they were all gazing at the horizon, where the fireworks would flash and tumble, and of course at the Parker Hamilton Hotel. People were staring at the doomed building from every angle, 
and Flicker spun her vision in a circle around it, like walking around a dollhouse. Okay, that was weird. The vast crowd should have been empty in the middle, a donut shape with all those thousands of eyes staring in toward the hotel, but no one looking back out. And yet something niggled at Flicker's awareness from that hollow center. Workmen putting the final touches to the demolition? Wasn't it a little late for that? Flicker stretched herself into the Parker Hamilton and found three lonely pairs of eyeballs inside. It was dark in there, and for a moment she couldn't see a thing, as if she'd walked into a cinema from bright sunshine. She made out naked wires hanging from the ceiling, dust in the air and bare walls, everything stripped away from the doomed hotel. Then she caught a glimmer of a familiar silhouette. Scam, she breathed. The car slowed a little. You see them? Which way? Straight ahead. Flicker said, her mouth suddenly dry. Don't slow down. We haven't got much time. Chapter 75 Crash You're gonna miss a great party, sang Ekim from the front door. Chizara sang back, I'm gonna miss a great big headache. She'd already unplugged the home entertainment system. She was lounging on the sofa with a big bowl of popcorn and a book. Leave your sister alone, said her dad, passing through. You know how it is with her. She doesn't like crowds. But it's going to be so great, Ecom's eyes shone. All those fireworks, the big kablam at the end, and then it'll all go dark for a second, and then they'll switch on the mega lights and press the button, and down she comes, the whole hotel. He waved his arms and made crashing noises. Sounds fantastic, Chizara said levelly, but not worth having my brain chewed on by 60 bazillion phones and cameras and pedometer watches and all those freaking... Come on, Ekim. Oh, Bina, Dad called from the driveway. We're getting in the car now. You ready, Mama? I'm coming, I'm coming. Mom, dressed up American for this family outing, hurried into the living room, fastening an earring. She swooped on Chizara and kissed her. Don't open the door to any crazy Fourth of July party people, all right? Have a great time. Enjoy all the splody things. Oh, I can hardly wait. Good night. The car started up with a painful tweak of electronics, then pulled out the carport and drove away. Chizara breathed a sigh of relief and reached down into the house. Damn, Ikum had left that game on upstairs. Should she just put up with that little itch, or should she go up and turn it off and make the house as perfect as possible? She went back to her book. It was a good book. She kept getting lost in it and forgetting the popcorn was there. Half an hour later, she'd only grazed through half the bowl. In the boys' room, the game lay calling out to connect with another console. It was fully charged, so she pulled the plug on it and powered it down. There. If only it could always be this easy. Nothing but a few of the neighbor's e-things beeping and bopping off in the distance. She ambled back toward the stairs, past her own room. Her phone lay switched off on her bedside table just inside the door, and the sight of the little black rectangle made her pause. How had the exchange gone this afternoon? Did Kelsey have her father back? Chizara hoped so. She hoped nobody'd gotten hurt. She gave a shiver, remembering the hospital groaning with tech, the piles of flowers, Officer Bright's children staring at nothing. She picked up the phone and walked on to the top of the stairs. The first detonation of the fireworks across town gently shook the air. She walked through to her parents' room, went to the very edge of the window, and squinted sideways. Sure enough, in the distance, between the double towers of the Cambria Central Bank, a peacock tail of blue and gold lights was spreading on the sky. As she watched them fade, the delayed thud of the explosion shook the floor, and she felt a sudden dread for Kelsey and Scam going in to face those gangsters. Switching the phone on was like stabbing herself in the forehead with a fork. Even as she rubbed the pain away, the device pulsed more pain out into her hand, beeping an alert. A voice message from Glorious Leader. 
Chizara, this is Nate. It didn't sound like Nate and no code names. She could hear his voice clearly in the quiet room with the phone a foot from her ear. He was in the enclosed space of a car in traffic. I need you to get downtown to the Parker Hamilton as soon as you possibly can. You know how they're going to demolish it tonight? You've got to stop that happening. His voice was harsh and dry. Scam and mob and her father are inside, and if I can get through these damn crowds, I'll be in there too. Please, Chizara, I don't know how else to stop this. She was already running, back to her room for her keys and backpack, downstairs for her shoes, outside and slamming the door behind her. There was no point running, but she ran. She would never get there in time, but she couldn't sit at home and do nothing either. She thought better on her feet. What you need, girl? She sped along the block, slowed to take the corner, charged toward the shopping mall. Beyond its bulk, red fountains of sparks lazily rose and fell in the downtown sky. What you need is a car. Well, there weren't many of those around. Most people had taken them halfway into town, just like her mom and dad had done, to catch the special Fourth of July shuttle buses to the show. And if she did find one, what to do without keys? She didn't know how to hotwire a car. She didn't even know how to break into one. She slowed as a thought hit her. A shot of that fixing power would help. What, break something, crash something, just so I can... She was already scanning the smaller shops, looking for something big to crash. If she found a car new enough, computerized enough, surely the fixing juice could do something. Here was the mall, closed and empty of people, but abuzz with lights, and inside, with systems at rest. Panting, she peered in the padlocked front doors. Yes, empty, not even cleaners. They'd be in town, too, with their families. The fireworks, pops, and thuds were coming thicker and faster. The display only went for half an hour. Chizara didn't have time to think up another plan. She held on to her head with both hands and reached in, past the many systems ticking over in their sleep in the individual shops, to the central generators and transformers, timers, master switches for lighting grids, dormant air conditioners, security alarms, and cameras. The farther she stretched into their spinning complexity and power and sheer connectedness, the heavier she felt their weight on her shoulders. And then, with a deep breath, Chizara let it all go. She stopped holding them up, abandoned her duty, went against everything Mom had ever said about this power of hers. Do no harm? Forget that. Harm everything. Bust everything in there down to the last LED. The release was fabulous. She felt like a toddler knocking down the biggest, most complicated block tower ever built, like a revolutionary in a palace, slicing through the cord, holding up a giant, multi-branched, crystal-hung chandelier, watching it fall and shatter on the marble floor. But she didn't have time to enjoy the crash of every crystal. She reeled away from the mall, amazed that her own hands weren't lit up like glow sticks that she hadn't exploded like a firework herself. She staggered along the sidewalk until she could break into a run again. Her reach was gigantic now, extending deep into the electronic forest of the neighborhood around her. But she could hang on to everything, hold everything up, keep it moving. She was the world's best juggler, juggling stars and roaring chainsaws and balls of fire. It felt wonderful to run, tossing all this stuff into the air around her. She could run and run until dawn if she needed to. But even at this speed, she'd never reach the Parker Hamilton in time. Cars were parked on either side of the street, crowded together. This was the tail end of the parking for the shuttle bus. She slowed down and pulled her senses in closer, poking and prodding at the vehicles nearby. Speak to me. She whispered at this pickup, that hatchback, this Volkswagen van. None of them spoke. They were all too old, too mechanical, too low-tech. Those big manual ignition switches were useless. But then a Camaro up ahead made a clunking noise, and its brake lights flashed. Chizara checked around for someone with a key fob. 
the street was empty. It was a new model with a nice gold flake paint job. New enough? She pushed her mind in under the hood, and there, at the front on the right, clustered all the little coils of logic and circuitry she needed. Each microchip threw its map at her. She chose the ones connected to the battery and the ignition key, and with great delicacy squeezed a little power into them. The engine cleared its throat and rumbled quietly. Chizara crept closer and bent over to check the driver's seat. No one. This was her work, this unlocking, this starting. She went around and opened the driver's side door. This was wrong, so wrong. This was a felony. This was Grand Theft Auto and not the game. This was also driving without a license. Chizara had only had five lessons in Dad's truck. But she climbed in. The seat fit her snugly, perfectly. Seat belt, snick. Lights, there. Handbrake, uh-huh. The dashboard was lit up the surface layer of an elaborate 3D plan, a miniature city of systems. The cabin was peppered with little stings of tech, phone docks and mirror adjusters and seat controls. In the engine bay, the electronics raced and pulsed, prompting and monitoring everything mechanical. None of it was strong enough to hurt Chizara while she was still this amped up from her mall crashing, Though that theft prevention system hollering for a satellite, yeah, that could go. She let it burn one leaf in a glowing forest. She put the car in drive, released the handbrake. Indicate, Dad's voice said from the passenger seat. Check your mirrors. The Camaro slid out into the road, smooth as silk. And the road was empty. Everyone was in town, watching those bright sprays of fireworks, impatient for them to end and for that building to come down, crash, crumple, rumble, crash. The clock on the dash read 2114. She had 16 minutes. She couldn't afford to be cautious. She had to drive like the mad criminal she was. Eyes wide, hands gripping the padded leather wheel, Chizara put her foot down. The Camaro obeyed, steady and fast, and she started planning. When she got there, she'd have to be subtle, to focus, isolate the fuses and wires set to bring down the hotel, and neutralize only them. Not lurch around like a drunken King Kong and knock out half the town. She could do it with finesse, make it look like the explosives experts made some small mistake. Her phone buzzed as she flew along Metro Boulevard. She got it out and tucked it against her shoulder the way she'd seen drivers do. Fool, Dad would growl whenever he saw that. Dangerous fool. Nate, Chizara said, I'm on my way. Good to hear. She'd never heard his voice so steady and hard. Was this what his fear sounded like? I'm past the fence they put up to keep the crowd out. I'm going in to find Ethan and Kelsey. No code names. The no code names thing was snapping her heart in two. In case I don't find them in time, I'm counting on you to stop this thing. I'll be there. I'll be there, she shouted terrified, elated, inflated with her stolen power, wide-eyed with horror at all the rules she was breaking, at everything hanging on her actions for people's lives. That had to be worth going to jail for, didn't it? Don't worry, Nate, I'm coming. She took the corner onto Mason Street with a squeal of tires and floored the accelerator. Ahead, above, close enough to almost fill the windshield, Fire flared up, light rained down. Chapter 76, Mob. Kelsey could feel the crowd outside the building. They were spread in all directions, vast and rumbling like a distant storm. They were excited, enjoying this big night of spectacle and adventure from vantage points safely blocks away from the Parker Hamilton. Their excitement rose with each spindly plume of fire and carefully designed explosion overhead. Kelsey tried to absorb the energy out there, to take strength from it, 
but the crowds were too far away. Mostly what she felt was the emptiness of the hotel halls and floors. Abandoned places were even worse when there was a joyful crowd in the distance, like an oasis you could never reach. She sank into the dull ache of knowing that the last week had been for nothing. She hadn't saved her dad. She couldn't save herself, and she doomed Ethan in the bargain. A roar went up outside. The fireworks reached a crescendo, then sputtered out. Is it time? she asked. She looked at the others. The room glowed dimly from the lights outside, lit with the occasional flare from a falling ember. Dad glanced at her through puffy eyes. Not yet, Kells. She strained against her bonds, trying to pull free. It was useless. Then why did the fireworks stop? Maybe they're reloading? Ethan said dully from the gloom to Kelsey's right. Kelsey let herself believe that. Maybe it wasn't time for the big explosion that would vaporize them all. She didn't look up at the fat block of C4 strapped to the column over her head, but she could feel it there, a misshapen totem of death. Dad said, I'm so sorry, Kells. I know. She could feel tears begin to run down her cheeks, cutting tracks in the grime. It was so dusty in the abandoned hotel. After two long hours of being tied up, she could feel the dust in her lungs. She shook her head to clear her eyes. She hated being tied up. If she had to die, she wanted to be moving. It's all my fault, Dad snuffled. His nose had been beaten halfway into his face and he could barely breathe. I tried to fix it, Dad, Kelsey said. She tried so hard, but it was like the ropes around her wrists. No matter how much she pulled, they wouldn't break. I hate everyone out there, Ethan muttered. Why do people like to watch stuff blow up anyway? It's so stupid. Kelsey shook her head. Couldn't he feel how much joy there was in that crowd? That was life. But here inside this building was only death. Ethan, she said. I'm really sorry for getting you into this mess. We got each other into this mess. Ethan said. You helped a little, I guess. Yeah, well, <laughs> my voice did. Kelsey looked up at him. Ethan, your voice is you. It's part of you, and it does what you want. Maybe not the exact way you want it, but you're the one who starts it rolling. Take responsibility for it. Ethan let out a breath. Now he looked annoyed. Gee, I wish I had the time to really think through what you've just said instead of like 15 minutes before I get blown up. Kelsey was about to reply when her father said, I got all of us into this. It's my fault. You're just kids. Stop, Dad. Kelsey wanted to hug him and punch him at the same time. You're just making me feel worse. She'd known since that time he'd gone away to prison that Dad was a danger to himself. She should have taken better care of him. The whoop of a firework exploding made them flinch. It broke into a series of crackles, sending wild shadows through the giant room. See, Ethan said, they're just reloading. Lots more show to go. Her dad started sobbing softly. Kelsey thought back to that moment in the Moonstruck Diner seeing him in the passing car. Less than a week ago, but it felt like it belonged to another life, another Kelsey, one who was a thousand years younger than she felt now. I know when I've done wrong, Kells, her dad said. Dad, she didn't finish. She couldn't. She wasn't sure anymore what she wanted him to do or say. Kelsey, Ethan said softly. The guy's trying to say the last thing he'll ever get to say to you. Maybe you should listen. That's right, Dad rasped. That's it exactly, son. Kelsey squinted at Ethan, looked for the expression on his face in the semi-dark. He wore that smooth, practiced gaze. She couldn't believe it. Here they were, about to die, 
and Ethan was still playing around with his stupid power. Dad, Ethan doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know us. Just trying to help, he wheedled. Now that was his real voice. Kelsey hated being trapped here in this abandoned, empty place. She wanted to be out there with the crowd, carried up with those swells of excitement every time the sky exploded. If she only had a few minutes, why couldn't she spend it dancing to that glorious crowd music? But no, she was here, tied to a column of concrete and waiting to die. I tried to do right by you, Kells, Dad said. He did, you know, Ethan said. This was like being trapped in a trash compactor, the two of them coming at her from both directions and her tied up, unable to cover her ears. Dad said, I did my best. I know, Dad. Though really, if she was honest about it, Dad's best had always been pretty crap. A couple of burning firework embers fluttered down past the windows, lighting the room in garish purple and orange. Kelsey's pulse quickened. With every burst, the end was coming closer. Ethan leaned forward, his face lit by the vivid colors. I think what you're both trying to say is that you love each other, okay? Stop trying to scam me, scam, Kelsey said. She wished the two of them would just stop. She knew this was a stupid way to die, arguing with her dad and the lying kid who'd bumbled his way into her family's mess. But when the next set of whistles and booms overhead subsided, there was Ethan's voice again. Some things need to be said, right, Jerry? You know what I'm talking about. Kelsey twisted in her ropes. Why are you doing this, Ethan? Because there's something your dad always wanted to tell you, but he thought there'd be time. Time? Kelsey turned back to her father. For what? To talk about your mom, Ethan's voice said. Kelsey didn't answer. Her mother had died a long time ago when she was little. She watched her dad lit into garishness by fireworks, his bruised and bloodied face like a mask. She'd given up asking about her mom before she'd even turned ten. Dad always changed the subject. She figured he was too hurt by the loss to really talk about it. But she'd always wondered. Who is this guy? Her dad said. How does he know? Same way as in the bank, Kelsey said. He can read minds? Sort of. She turned to face the smooth mask. Why are you doing this, Ethan? What do you want? For you to find some peace, Ethan said, his voice as soft and comforting as an ad for life insurance. You were three years old when you guys left New Orleans. Jerry, you told Kelsey's mom never to follow you, right? We didn't leave her. Kelsey closed her eyes, trying to block out sound. She died. She felt the crowd outside whooping and hollering. She tried to reach for that feeling out there, anything to erase the desperate need that choked her. Dad? When he didn't answer, she turned to Ethan. What really happened? Your mom didn't die. He saved you from her. What? Kelsey tried to look at her father, but her vision was full of pinpricks of light. She was breathing too hard, hyperventilating. This wasn't peace. What the hell was the voice doing? She loved you, it said. But she was violent. He thought he could protect you until your mother broke your wrist one night. He packed up and left her right then to keep you safe. Middle of the night, he got in the car and drove west, and he didn't stop until he hit ocean. He loved you both but he chose you. Oh my God, Kelsey whispered. I'm sorry, Dad said softly. I never knew if it was the right thing to tell you. So it's true? Dad nodded. I was going to tell you when you got older, but I kept putting it off. He sounded fierce and sad. Kelsey turned back to Ethan. 
There was a spray of embers against the windows. The fireworks were low and close now. Kelsey could see that Ethan's smooth expression was gone. He was watching her with a look of deep sadness. That sucks, Kelsey, he said softly. Where is she now? Kelsey asked. It turned out the voice had been right. She did want to know the truth, even if it was only for a few minutes. Ethan's mouth opened and the voice said, She still thinks of you. A feeling went through her then, much smaller than the glorious crowd energies outside, but vital nonetheless, like finding something old and precious that she didn't know she'd lost. Is she still in New Orleans? Kelsey watched Ethan, waiting for the voice to answer, but his face changed from a smooth mask to a panicked boy about to die. Do you hear that? He squeaked. Kelsey listened. The excitement of the people outside was making her blood beat, crowding out the quiet in her ears. Someone's in the building, Ethan cried. Help, help! Who are you shouting at? Kelsey asked. Just yell, will you? Help! Kelsey shouted with all her might. A moment later, the two of them were shouting in unison, sending their urgent cries out to fill the empty rooms and echoing hallways. When they paused for breath, Kelsey heard it. Heavy footfalls on the staircase. Someone was coming. Chapter 77 Bellwether Finally, someone answered. Nate staggered to a halt on the dusty concrete of the stairs, panting hard. Help! came the distant call. Ethan. Scam he reminded himself. This was a mission. He had to stay detached in case there were hard choices to make. Another voice joined scams high and clear. Mob. Nate hit the stairs again, climbing toward the noise, ignoring the muscles burning in his legs. The flashlight on his phone threw wild shadows, and the walls gaped open where sledgehammers had pounded through. The fireworks were getting lower, closer. Sprays of fire spilled from the top of the Parker Hamilton now. The windows of the stairwell trembled with the explosions. The finale was almost here. But he had to think of the ultimate goal, not failure. Failure meant dying in this filthy forsaken building, losing everything. Nate didn't answer the cries above. It was a waste of breath, and his lungs were full of dust. He followed the sound to the twelfth floor, almost the top of the doomed hotel. And there they were in a large empty room, Scam, Mob, and her father. Nate! Scam yelled. I mean, glorious, uh, bellwether. Nate still couldn't answer. He was panting too hard. Whoa, Scam went on. I didn't think it would be you saving us. Nate ignored him. The three were tied up with thick ropes. He didn't have a knife. Glass. He ran to the windows, but they were intact. On the floor was a piece of masonry. Nate picked it up and hurled it against the pulsing lights from outside. The brittle sound of shattering was followed by the roar of the crowd pouring through the gap. The explosions were thundering overhead, building to a climax. Don't cut your hands. There's a rag five feet to your left. That was Ethan's voice, being helpful for once. Nate snatched up the rag and took hold of a jagged peninsula of glass still in the window. It snapped off and fell inward to the floor, splitting in two. He lifted the larger piece and ran to where Mob was tied to a supporting column. On the way up, he had decided to save her first. She was new and unknown full of potential. Her power had filled him with questions, and she was more like the rest of them, born of the crowd, moved by the curve, not like scam. But the ropes around her wrists were thick nylon, and the piece of glass kept slipping and cutting him. It didn't help that Mob had pulled her ropes tight by struggling. Her hands were bright red. Cut the piece two inches above her left hand, 
Scam said calmly. Right, it was near the middle of the knot, and already frayed where Mob had rubbed it against a corner of the column. Nate started sawing there, and soon it was unraveling. Her hands parted and Mob fell forward with a groan, rubbing her shoulders. Nate ran to Scam, who was second on his list. Where? he asked. No need to cut, the voice said. Take that loose end on your left and not that one. Yes, that's it. Work it back in toward the knot. As Mob swept over and grabbed the piece of glass, Nate saw the specks of blood on the rag. His right forefinger was bleeding fast. The blood helped making the rope slicker. It slipped through, but the knot still held. What next? Nate said. The voice didn't answer. What next? Oh, no, Scam said, his real voice breaking. It's not talking, there's no point. Mob was still sawing away at her father's bonds, but Jerry spoke up. It's gone quiet outside. Nate hesitated, staring at the knot before him. His mind refused to resolve its puzzle or to understand what they were all saying. Maybe they're just reloading again? Scam's real voice. Mob stood up, her ear cocked toward the crowd. The glass dropped from her hand and shattered. No, she said. I think we're done here. Nate shook his head, staring at the knot. Think of the goal, not of failure. Chizara, he said half to himself. But she was on the other side of town, too far away to help. Still, there was no point sitting here and waiting for the end. Nate rose from his crouch and held out his hand to Mob. We can run. We can still make it. I can't just leave, she said. Wait, Scam said. You're leaving without me? Nate turned to him. If your voice gave up, that means there isn't time. You know that, Ethan. Now use it one last time and get her to come with me. For a moment, Ethan stared at him, astonished. But then he nodded, closed his eyes, and opened his mouth. But nothing came out. Mob wasn't going anywhere. She had knelt by her father. Thanks for saving me, Dad, back then. Sorry I couldn't return the favor. Kelsey, Nate said, trying to focus himself at her. We have to run, now. If we're going to die, let's die on the stairs. But his power wouldn't focus. The crowd was too far away to help him. Jerry Laszlo looked up at his daughter. You were always proof of miracles. Outside, a mass of voices started counting down from 20, and Mob spread her arms toward the ceiling, the numbers rippling through her body like a pulse. Chapter 78, Crash. Now all the sky was alight, the explosions coming thick and fast, shaking Chizara's car, shaking the whole city around her. This had to be the buildup to what Ekem had called the Big Kablam. He'd said there'd be a minute silence after the fireworks before the floodlights came on and the countdown started. She had a little over a minute. In the stolen car, she shot through the empty streets lit lurid by the gold, the fuchsia, the emerald, the silver white of the fountains and flowers and star bursts overhead. She felt ahead furiously, sifting through the piles of tech downtown, searching with her mental tweezers for the demolition charges. How did it even work? When you blew up a tower like the Parker Hamilton, was it one big bomb in the middle, or a bazillion little ones dotted through the building? She had to do this right. She almost saw the roadblock too late. Not just hollow plastic barriers she could have punched the Camaro through, but a string of flesh and blood traffic cops. She slammed on the brakes. The car swung with a scream of rubber and skidded to a sideways stop rocking as she shed her seatbelt. Startled cops backed up against the barriers. 
Chizara jumped out, vaulted the roadblock. Hey, what the hell? You can't just leave that here. But Chizara was already running along the near empty street beyond. She had to get in range, and soon, or Nate was dead, and Ethan, and the new girl, and the new girl's dad. That couldn't happen. It wasn't an option. The ground shook with explosions. Ahead, blocks and blocks away, the fireworks gushed up into the darkness, all colors, all shapes. This was definitely the big kablam. They were throwing everything against the sky. Chizara raced on, feeling ahead through the electronic noise. There wasn't room for fear. She needed every drop of adrenaline for running, for hunting. If she could only get a clear signal, see through all this e-garbage in the way. Networks beat at her from the buildings all around. Buried fiber optic lines burned underfoot. And up ahead around the Parker Hamilton, so many more devices seethed. What have the news reports said? That one out of every three Cambrians was here? And every one of them held a phone, snapping photos and videos, tweeting, messaging, Instagramming, sending out a million darts into the flame-swept sky. The last of the fireworks fell and faded slowly to black, leaving only feeble streetlight to guide her. Did she have the whole minute Ecom had promised, or only seconds? She sped up, pushing past what she thought was her limit. The sudden quiet was horrible. Her fear flared, and she had to swallow it, gasp it away as she ran. White light punched up into the rolling firework smoke. Crowd roar hammered along the street. A sob of terror escaped Chizara, but still she ran, and the light stayed steady. That hadn't been the final explosion, just the floodlights coming on. But soon. Now the crowd's tech was clawing her face in front. Every camera lifted, a hundred thousand glowing rectangles, a galaxy of pain. She ran against the weight of it, her body peeled back to springs and wire and a core of nauseous burning. Give in, go crazy, shrieked the gnawing tech. But she had to see beyond it, feel around it, push through. It was worse, much worse than the CCPD's big punch in the gut systems. This was death by ant bites, a trillion mandibles sinking into her flesh at once. If she hadn't crashed that mall, she couldn't have stood this, wouldn't have had the strength. She burst out onto a slope packed with spectators, plunged right in, pushed forward. Hey, watch it! She didn't care. She forced her way on. The ant bites kept coming, but the crowd gave her huge range. Her skull felt hollow with it, like she just sniffed crushed peppermint leaves. Ahead, she sensed a vast, sweet blank space where the doomed hotel stood, empty, useless, scoured of phones and Wi-Fi. Now the tech-peppered crowd was too thick to move through, no matter how hard Shizara pushed. Twenty, they shouted around her. Nineteen! She looked up in horror. The Parker Hamilton loomed ice white in the mega floodlights. But one face had been left dark except for bright numbers projected there, counting down the seconds. Chizara closed her eyes and fought to focus. Deep in the empty hotel, she groped after a ghost of a network, a sparse drapery of wires to the steel and concrete skeleton. Countless little bombs, and she had to crash them all. Ten, shouted the crowd, a monstrous, ignorant voice. Nine! Eight! Too fast. The seconds were going too fast. She couldn't do the tweezer thing. She couldn't be subtle. She'd just have to dump the whole damn city. She could see so far, could break so much. But she had to keep control. Five! Four! Chizara lifted her arms and spread them wide like a demon queen throwing down a curse. She reached beyond the boiling mass of ant tech around her, protecting the phone so people wouldn't panic. Three, 
She sank down into the power grid, shook free everything feeding into the lattice of wires charged with bringing the old hotel down. Two! Through that fresh hole she'd made in the pane, she saw the demolition set up. The timer, the board, the remote trigger, the sensors scattered like stars through the stripped building. Each star was taped with its charge to a load-bearing pillar, ready to blow it to rubble, to bring the massive concrete floors pancaking down on the four people inside. One! Chizara cut it all off at the root, and with her mental fingertips pinched out the backup generator before it could cough into life. The crowd cried, Zero! And then, nothing. Beyond the squeal of the phones, no voices and no bombs. Chizara raised her head, opened her eyes to darkness. Oops, she hadn't meant to kill the floodlights. And that wasn't all she'd killed. A great swath of the city lay snuffed out all around. No street lights, no window lights, the skyscrapers standing dark. Only the hundred thousand phones glowed, recording each other's hopeful glows and the darkness beyond them, recording the glorious silence, recording Chizara's triumph. The magnificence of what she'd done, the magnificence of what she was, hit her smack in the funny bone. Laughter billowed up from the pit of her stomach, where the ant tech had chewed the hardest. It scrabbled in her lungs, gathering breath, and then it burst up out of her throat into the silence and the darkness and the doubtfulness all around. <laughs> like a movie villain. People fell back from her. Some looked nervous in the faint phone glow. Most kept their cameras raised, still expecting the big event. Chizara spun on her heel, double punching the air. Not going to happen, suckers. She pushed uphill through the assembled shadows, staggering, cheering, laughing. The crowd was a field of grass, and she could see how every blade lay around her, where every drop of dew sparkled. Phones and cameras were no more than gnats now, no more than dust motes swirling in a sunbeam. And she was the sunbeam. She was the sun, the source. She was full to bursting with post-crash power. She could see everything, feel everything, hold everything up forever if she wanted, let go anything she chose. Mega or nano-sized, she was master of it. She was a freaking zero, man. Chapter 79, Scam All of Cambria was dark. Inside this hotel stairwell was even darker. And Jerry Laszlo was heavy. Landing coming up, Ethan grunted. Got it. Nate's voice came from his right. It took both of them to hold up Kelsey's dad, who had been beaten too badly and tied up too long to walk. In front of them, Kelsey lit the landing with the light from Nate's phone. It made her pale hair luminous and turned the rest of her into a dancing silhouette. She kept glancing back at her dad. Are you okay? She asked. Jerry let out a groan. Every moment seemed to hurt him. Ethan didn't know if Crash's crash was permanent or only a temporary reprieve. He didn't plan on sticking around to find out. He and Nate had formed a kind of yoke, their arms wrapped under Jerry's shoulders to lift him upright. Ethan had his left hand on Nate's right collarbone, and Nate had a firm grip on Ethan's neck. It was the most team-like Ethan had ever felt with Glorious Leader. But he wasn't sure it was enough. They still had a half dozen landings to go before safety. I hate it, Ethan puffed. This hotel. He'd never been so scared in his life. This was worse than waiting helplessly to die, because he had a chance now. Any second he wasted might be the one that vaporized him. 
They hit the next landing and careened toward another flight of stairs. Ethan went wide while Nate spun practically on the spot. By now, it was almost routine. Make the landing, spin, head for the next. There was garbage everywhere, and more than once, Ethan slipped on some scrap of old wire or who knew what. But he stayed upright, maybe out of pure desperation. Then he heard a rumbling, booming noise begin outside. Oh, crap, Ethan shouted. What's that? It's the crowd, Kelsey shouted over her shoulder. They're chanting. What? Why are they chanting? Kelsey didn't answer, but a second later, Ethan heard it over the scuffle of their footsteps. Blow it up! Blow it up! Assholes, Ethan said. But of course the people who had come for the 4th of July fireworks were crying out for the destruction of the Parker Hamilton and everything inside it. And no doubt the demolition experts out there were furiously poking at wires, checking connections, rebooting control systems, and generally trying to figure out what had gone wrong. We gotta keep moving, Ethan puffed, rounding another corner of the staircase. This place could still blow. Crash knows what she's doing, Nate confirmed. Ethan had to laugh. Since when? Since when do any of us know what we're doing? Scam, seriously, she just saved our asses. Ethan didn't argue, just saved his breath for moving. Jerry was whispering a litany of gratitude and grief. Nate kept trying to reassure the old guy, reminding him to keep going and not to fall into dead weight. But the group was too small for Nate's power to do much. Ethan doubted there was any power on earth that could convince Jerry to work any harder. He was in a bad way. If they didn't get the old guy to a hospital soon, he might not make it through the night. The chanting of the crowd grew stronger as more and more people joined in. Kelsey said, I can feel them. They're all so freaking happy, like delirious. They want to blow us up so bad. Can't you make them, like, not want to explode this building? Ethan asked. It's getting on my nerves. I can only guide their energy, not change what they are. Nate. Too far away, Nate gasped. Kelsey added. And there's so many of them. She swung the phone's light toward the next landing, and Ethan stormed forward. He was suddenly grateful that Nate always bought the best of everything, because that phone worked better than a lot of flashlights Ethan had owned. It lit the stairwell into sharp contrasts. Hey, Nate, Ethan huffed. Yeah? In case we all die in a fiery inferno of death. He paused for breath. I... Just want to say thanks for coming for us, even though you were going to leave me in there. Only to save Mob, Nate replied in a gasp. Otherwise, right, sure, Ethan said. And, hey, we made it. I guess I owe you one. Sorry about last summer, Nate said. I was wrong. For a moment, Ethan didn't understand. They'd just reached a landing with a giant two painted on the wall. They were almost out. Ethan's lungs were burning and he was gasping for breath, and Kelsey was a shadow in front of them, carved from the bouncing, lurching phone light. But it had really happened. Nate had just said he was wrong last summer. In that moment, just before the spray of words that had busted up the zeros, when Nate had told him, You aren't like us, Ethan. Your power's twisted somehow. It hates crowds and it doesn't grow with the curve. It's mean and small and selfish. You'll never be a superhero. You'll always be a scam. Nate had said it with a kind of perfect certainty, almost like he'd borrowed the voice for one blinding moment. And the fact that it was true, that scam was different and cursed and alone, had made him want nothing more than to destroy them all. It was the last flight of stairs, and Ethan was pretty sure they'd all fall and break their necks. But at least, if they died now, he'd live long enough to hear a glorious leader admit that he was wrong. Ethan's knees buckled before he realized they were on the ground floor. 
His feet were still trying to find the next step down. The phone light swung wide as Kelsey located an exit. Over here! She lit the floor in front of them. Jerry dangled between Ethan and Nate, barely touching the ground. Then they were outside. Ethan had never been so glad for Cambria sea air. His lungs ached all the way to his stomach. He'd been breathing dust for two hours. Nate was still pushing them forward, covering the distance between them and the waiting crowd, a couple of hundred yards and a ten-foot chain-link fence. Ethan gasped. By the time they got Jerry to the fence, Kelsey already had her shoes off and was climbing, toes and fingers clinging to the wire. Help! She was shouting. Help us! Ethan was too beat to ask who she thought would hear. The crowd was still chanting on the other side, wrapped up in the dangerous delight of the explosion they yearned for. A few people cast Kelsey confused glances, but that was it. Nate let go of Jerry and the old man sagged down on Ethan's shoulder. The weight dropped Ethan to his aching knees. Kelsey had reached the top of the fence. She was teetering like a high-wire artist. Ethan wanted to shout up to her to be careful, but his lungs were burning. Look, Kelsey was pointing. There's a first aid station. Ethan set Jerry down and struggled to his feet to peer across the heads of the crowd. He could see it too, the top of a white tent with a district ambulance logo billowing from its point. Nate called up at Kelsey. Throw me my phone. I'll tell the others to meet us at the northwest corner of the fence. The phone tumbled down to his waiting hands. Nate, Kelsey cried. Can you focus the crowd on me? Nate looked up from the screen. Um, I guess. What are you going to do? Something I saw one time. Don't worry, it's easy. Okay, yell as loud as you can. Ethan stared up at Kelsey. She hooked a heel over the other side of the fence. The moon lit the dreamy, elated expression on her face. She sang out a high, clear cry that arced above the hubbub of the crowd. More faces turned toward her, lifting up expectantly. Nate was doing something with his hands, like drawing an invisible net in toward himself. His eyes were open but blank and focused in the middle distance, seeing something invisible and strange. Their little corner of the massive crowd grew still, but Scam could feel the excitement build as more and more of them looked up to see Kelsey balanced on the fence. The crowd rippled into a new shape, a tide of attention turning her way. Then all at once, she jumped. Chapter 80, Mob. She was falling. She'd been falling for a week. From the moment she'd spotted her dad in a car outside the Moonstruck Diner, now she pitched forward and fell from the fence into the crowd. And they caught her. They always caught her. They heaved her over their heads, hands lifted and held and pushed her, hands turned her so she pointed at the first aid station like a spear. She crested that wave in full crowd-surfing mode, arms splayed, facing the sky. Most of Cambria had come to watch the fireworks. This crowd was bigger than any dance party she'd ever been to, and more united, less like the dumb animal mob she was used to. Keen and driven. She knew that the sharpness had something to do with Nate. He was working the crowd, lending his focus to her strength. She'd been feeling their excitement the whole way down the stairs, the whoosh and rush of energy, even frightened, even knowing how hurt her dad was, even having discovered the awful secret he'd kept from her about her mother. Even with all that, she'd still wanted to lose herself to the impatient chant. Blow it up! But now they had a different focus, and it was her. Their energy coiled and spun, enveloping her like the curl of a wave around a surfer. She skimmed over the crowd, their hands rising to support her like the steady breath of a thermal. With all the lights of Cambria crashed, she could see stars above. Millions of them stretched out like brilliant bands of twinkling color. 
and thousands of phones glowing beneath her, a reflection of that galaxy above. The crowd drove her forward, toward the medical station. She thought they might drop her or spin and toss her, leave her airsick throwing up like that guy in the boom room the night she'd lost control. For a moment, she was scared of them. But then she realized that there was no them. In that moment, there was only us. She glanced back at the chain-link fence to see how far she'd come. Nate was halfway up, taking pictures of her. Kelsey sank back into her crowd. People reached for her, holding her up, sending her forward. She felt a rich, deep gratitude. As she fed that into the feedback loop that supported her, it doubled and tripled. People called and cried and shouted. But they weren't shouting for explosions anymore. They wanted to be a part of what Kelsey was part of. They wanted to be more than the crowd. They wanted to float and skim the way she was floating. They wanted to fly. She'd never felt so much a part of anything, so supported and carried. She'd always been afraid to let herself go like this, afraid that if she surrendered so completely to the crowd, she might never find herself again. But now it was obvious. This was where she was meant to be. Her power was strong, and it could fix things. It could right wrongs. It was so much bigger than she'd dreamed. The district ambulance tent was rushing toward her. She was off course, not by much, but at this rate, she'd end up miles away. She felt a surge of panic. Her father needed help so badly, and her fear leaked into the crowd. The hands beneath her began to falter, and Kelsey felt herself sag and slow. She bit back on her worry about her dad, channeled fear into purpose, and the crowd responded, hurtling her toward the first aid tent. They all wanted to correct her course, to be part of her journey. And in their hands, she forgot any fear she'd ever felt. An endless moment later, Kelsey was slowing, drifting down softly to the street before the first aid tent. They placed her there gently, like she was precious. People still held her, wanting to stay connected. She was hugged. Her hands were enveloped by other hands. Her hair was brushed away from her face. She had to push them all away carefully, her crowd, her people. It was hard to step out in the open and be alone again, but she had to save her dad. She wrenched back on the crowd connection until, with a snap, her breathing was her own again. Her body was only this five feet of skin and flesh, and not a vast gyre around her. For a split second, she felt like the entire world had left her behind. She made her way to the EMT guys on shaky legs. They were staring at her, eyes wide. They'd seen her coming, flying across the crowd. I need help. It was hard to speak. A waterfall was lodged in her throat. The EMT guys looked her up and down. Not me, my dad, she pointed. She could still feel the laughter and joy of the crowd around her, but it was their happiness now, not hers. She was in the middle of the bright, hard isolation that came with being herself again. Northwest corner of the fence, I'll show you. She turned and, with a single gesture that focused all her pain and fear, she cleaved the crowd to make a clear path. Her crowd. They moved aside for her. They always would. As she led the EMT guys through to where her father lay crumpled in Ethan's arms, Kelsey felt the tears slide down her face like they might never stop. Chapter 81 Crash The ambulance pushed up the crowded slope toward Chizara, clearing a path for itself with little siren whoops. She stood back, trying to think straight through the afterbuzz of all she'd done, through the euphoria rattling through her veins. Had she harmed someone? Crashed a pacemaker, an insulin pump? Was there a zero in that ambulance? Nate had texted her to come to this corner of the fence to meet up with them. Had one of them gotten hurt on their way out of the tower? The ambulance passed and she darted down the path it had left through the crowd. Crash! Over here! That was Riley's voice. There she was, her bright skirt rippling in the sea breeze, 
catching the last red of the ambulance taillights. She and Ethan and a tall, dark guy, yeah, that guy, the other zero, were three shadows leaning against the chain links. Chizara dodged through the crowd and squeezed Riley tight. Then she hugged Ethan. So freaking pleased to see you. Oof. Ethan patted her back warily. He was dusty and scratched and smelled like damp cement. Chizara let him go. Where are the others? Riley pointed back up the slope, and there was Nate, looking dazedly after the ambulance. Chizara strode up and placed herself in front of him. He startled for a moment in the darkness until she stepped in and put her arms around him. He hugged her right back, his cheek gritty and sweaty against hers, and alive. You did it. His voice was ragged in her ear. I knew you would. Did you? She was about to melt into tears or laugh like a supervillain again. She grinned madly to hold in all the emotion. Because I wasn't all that sure. Here came the others, Riley holding that guy's hand. Yes, Chizara should hug him too. Anonymous, that was his name. But first she asked, where's Kelsey? In the ambulance, Nate said. Oh, Chizara's elation tumbled into fear. How serious. She's fine, Riley said. It's her dad. Those gangsters beat him up really bad. But he's better off than if that building had collapsed on us, Ethan said. Chizara shuddered. It came so freaking close. We know, Nate said. We heard the countdown. Next time, feel free to ruin the suspense. Even in the darkness, she could see that his hair was gray with cement dust, and his eyes looked old enough to match. But thank you, he said. Chizara looked out at the dark city around them and swallowed some of her giddiness. I may have overdone it. But you kept the phones up, Riley said, staring out into the crowd. You should see it. They're all tweeting how bad Cambria is at demolitions. Chizara smiled in the darkness, looking out across the thousands of glittering screens. Her bones twinged from their signals, but the afterpower of her crash shielded her from any pain. Let them tweet, let them text, let them call each other as much as they wanted. She was still queen of the night crammed full of almost dangerous exhilaration. The crowd was restless, too, as the wind kicked up stronger. I came all the way from San Diego for this, someone shouted. Blow it up already! Nate put a hand on Chizara's shoulder. Maybe you should go ahead, get the lights back on? Let them blow the building. Chizara frowned. I don't know, Nate. Aren't there better ways to spend my fixing power? It'll be safer with the streetlights on. Riley gazed into the middle distance. There are bottlenecks all around this square. Could get testy when people start to leave. Nate held up his hands. It's up to you, Crash. Was he trying his charisma on her? Leveraging the crowd's frustration? She didn't think so although it was hard to register anything through the buzz of after crash. Here's the thing, Nate went on. If that building disappears tonight, the Bagrovs will think Mob and Scam and Jerry are dead, which is a good thing. Also, Riley said, it would be totally badass to watch you blow it up. It sure would, Ethan said. Come on, Crash. You can pretend I'm still in there if you want. She sighed theatrically. Well, I guess for safety's sake we could use some light. With a snap of her fingers and a little mental nudge, the floodlights flash the world back into being, the Parker Hamilton whitely cold at its center. The crowd gasped and readied themselves again. That didn't look too hard, Nate said. Chizara shrugged. The floodlights had taken nothing. 
Maybe if she was careful, she could bring the hotel down with plenty of power to spare. She squeezed her eyes shut and snaked her mind out past the tech buzz of the crowd, searching again for that sensor network, those wires, the trigger switch, the backup generator. Compared to the city around her, they were tiny. This wouldn't take more than a, oh, crap, Ethan said. Hold on a second, Chizara said. I've almost. She felt Nate's hand on her shoulder and opened her eyes. A big, bald tank of a man stood glaring at the four of them, his hands closed into fists. Two solid, stubble-headed guys, in black tees and sleeved with tattoos, stood on either side of them. Oh, right, Chizara said. The Russians. No, Ethan squeaked. The Craig. Chizara knew she was supposed to be scared, but the supervillain part of her refused to take them seriously. Such standard-issue thugs. Did they have no imagination? The big guy, the Craig. And what kind of hopeless thug name was the Craig? Grabbed a fistful of Ethan's dusty T-shirt. Thought so. His spittle flew. Saw Kelsey up on the fence and I knew you'd be around here somewhere. Ethan made goldfish mouths, but no useful words came to his aid. Where's my money? The Craig said. Right here. Someone stepped between them and calmly brushed Ethan out of the Craig's hands. A young guy who looked vaguely anonymous. He'd been here all along, right next to Flicker, only the crowd kept swallowing him. He swung a duffel bag into the Craig's chest, pushing him backward with it. The Craig stared at it, looking suspicious. He unzipped the bag, peered in, zipped it up again. And who the hell are you? He growled. Anonymous raised a hand, as if to shoo off a fly, then stepped away. Not in any particular direction, just away. And suddenly there were only four of them facing the Craig. The Craig twitched his head, like he was shaking an insect out of his ear. So we're square, right? That was Ethan's true voice, shaky and nervous. You've got your money. Yeah, I've got my money. The Craig thrust the duffel at one of his men and took a fresh handful of Ethan's tea. But I got you too. Come on now, Ethan said. This was all a mistake. I just wanted to ride home. The Craig's lip curled and he laughed low and nasty. Well, too bad the ambulance already left, because that's how you're getting home tonight. After you get a lesson in what happens when you make a joke out of the Craig. Shizara opened her mouth, and out came a voice that was a hundred percent her mom's. Put him down this instant! Surprise loosened the guy's grip for a moment. But when he turned and saw Chizara, he only laughed. What if I don't? She drew herself up, the supervillain inside her affronted by his laughter. Then something bad will happen. Something bad? She reached into the Parker Hamilton, slipped the networked sensors on like a glove, readied mental fingertips on the fused mess inside the borked generator on the fritzed chips under the control board. A lick of power, and they were fixed and ready. Drop him right now, or I'll bring you down. The Craig leered at her. All by yourself, princess? She was supposed to cringe, and she didn't. The Craig took a step closer. You bet, she smiled, just like this. She flung out an arm at the floodlit, derelict hotel a few blocks away. A scattering of explosions traveled through the building, sharp and sudden and puffs of dust flung themselves from the windows along with spumes of glittery broken glass. The Craig turned back toward her, astonished, and Chizara held his gaze, claiming the detonation as her own and daring him to deny it.
the Parker Hamilton Hotel began to implode. Chapter 82 Flicker It was the fucking coolest thing Flicker had ever seen. As the first crackling explosions rang out, a hundred thousand eyeballs turned toward the sound. The string of little booms sent tremors through the air, like wing beats against her face. Larger whoops pulsed inside the building, and with endless eyes she saw the concrete structure ripple with their force, a billowing curtain in the wind. For a moment the brick facade turned liquid, a waterfall, a melting photograph. It sagged among its own smoke puffs, and then the floors began their collapse, from the top down, each one pancaking into the one below. All that concrete lowered itself to the earth and shattered there, sending out a roiling bank of dust. So much dust. Plaster and brick and mortar, stone and marble and concrete, all of it crushed into grit and powder. Towering swells of it surged in all directions, as if drawn by the roar of the crowd. The sharp scent of explosives reached Flicker, followed by the chalky smell of the building's guts. She scanned the eyeballs around her, watched the Craig and his crew disappear, still astonished as the white floodlit cloud rolled over them. The zeros vanished as well. Farther out, people in the crowd punched the air, waved like maniacs, tried to capture the unfurling demolition on their tiny screens. Riley watched from endless, riveted viewpoints. She reached out, felt Anand's hand in hers, that always surprising perfect fit. Following the sound of maniacal laughter, she took Chizara's as well. It's me, Flicker said. Chizara laughed harder. You see what I did? I see, like you wouldn't believe. I've got Ethan, Anon said. And he's got Nate. Let's go. They started to move, the chain of them winding through the coughing, cheering crowd. Flicker let herself be drawn along, moving her view farther out, past the dust where tens of thousands more eyeballs stared. The collapsed hotel was gone, consumed by the cloud, but a few fireworks had been held back for the finale. They arced up and spread their generous glittering arms, weeping willows of gold against the black sky, and the cheering swelled again. Man, people love explosions, Ethan cried out bitterly. From next to Flicker came Anon's laughter. At Ethan's expense, or maybe he was just being carried along by Chi Zara, who was still borderline hysterical about having freaked out the Craig and his minions so completely. Flicker felt it bubbling up in her, too. It was a kind of madness, seeing the world from all those eyeballs, all of them focused on that magnificent ruination. But then the five of them were staggering from the thinning cloud, and she found eyeballs nearby not blinded by dust. Their hands parted, except for her and Anon. Here in the crowd, he had to stay close to her to keep from disappearing. Flicker was okay with that. The other three turned to stare back at Chizara's work, but Anon led her a little farther, finding a private corner of the crowd. I'm sorry, he said softly, for leaving you alone back at the warehouse. Flicker shook her head. I can take care of myself. I was more worried about you. A scooter seems like the wrong place to be invisible. It wasn't great. Right here is better. He held her close until she could feel his heart beating in his chest. Her own pulse still raced from the awesome sight of the old hotel, turning into a heap of wreckage and rubble. It was amazing what humans could do. Just ordinary humans, with only science, no superpowers. It was amazing just standing here with him. That was beautiful, she said, how it just fell out of the skyline. Yeah, and the best part was none of our friends were in it. 
Those words made Flicker hold him a little tighter, struck again by how close it had all been. She switched her vision off, but the blackness in her head pulsed with leftover sparks and shimmers. What if you'd gone in instead of Nate, she said. I wasn't back in time. That scooter was a glorified lawnmower. No, I mean, if you had gotten back and gone in, and then Chizara hadn't stopped it in time, then I would have been... A pause. Oh, I see what you mean. Flicker held him tighter. Would anyone have remembered Anon? Or would he have simply vanished in the dust, fading from her thoughts when he never returned? No body, no memories, nothing. He gave a dry laugh. If I make any heroic sacrifices, it won't be for the posthumous glory, I guess. Maybe just skip the posthumous part altogether? He shrugged in her arms. I'm not in this to win medals. Flicker shook her head, trying to force the thoughts of his death, his erasure, out of her head. You and your stupid zen, she said. I think you're amazing, Anon. I think you should get medals, because you're this crazy, beautiful person, but you keep telling me that wisdom says you're nothing. It does. There was a smile in his voice. But there's another part of that saying. There's more? Gee, great. The rest didn't mean anything to me, but now it does. Anon leaned closer to her ear. Wisdom tells me I'm nothing. But love tells me I'm everything. Oh, Flicker said, just as their lips met full and hard, her heart beating slantways and too fast. The smells of dust and crowd and anon blended in her head, along with the cries of joy at the last few fireworks overhead, the feel of him against her, both of them breathing hard. When they parted, it took a moment for her to find herself, another moment to realize what she needed to ask. Was that the first time we've... Flicker knew this was silly. I mean, it's just that it felt that way. But obviously not, right? I mean, we must have before now. But was that our first? It was, Anon said. It always is. Chapter 83, Mob. Dawn was breaking across the waiting room windows when the doctor said she should go in and see her dad. Not could, should. Like there wasn't much time. Kelsey had been sitting in the broad beige waiting room of Cambria County General for hours, feeling the storm of energy swirl around her. The hospital was not a good place to feel the crowd. Too many people dragging her emotions around. A few happy at their test results, but most of them fighting anxiety, and too many cold, hard washes of despair. Kelsey tried to tune it out, but every time she disengaged from the pulse of the crowd, she was overwhelmed by her own fear about her dad. That fear was like a channel carrying her back to the anxious herd. She had been glad when the other zeros had turned up. They formed their own group within the larger throng of fear and pain and boredom. All of them were buzzing with energy, a dozen times more united than at the meeting two days ago. We've done everything we can, the doctor was saying. Your father suffered a lot of internal damage and his system was already compromised by the drugs. Kelsey nodded. For hours now, she'd been nodding every time a doctor spoke. The man looked exhausted, like he'd really tried. Kelsey wished she could feel her weariness. All she felt was scared. You should go see him now, the doctor repeated. But she was frozen to the chair. Nate was standing by the doctor asking for more details. He said things like, Is there anything more we can do? Cost is irrelevant. But he seemed to be saying them from a great distance. Over against a wall, she could see Chizara and Flicker, and beside Flicker, a shadow that slid in and out of focus. 
Anon. Ethan was sitting beside her. He nudged her knee with his. You want me to come with? He asked softly. She looked up at him, trying to feel her way through the panic and grief. She had a question for him. The real him. Is it true? What you said about my mom? Back in the Parker Hamilton? Is that all real or a scam? Ethan took a breath. I never know what's true or not. The voice just says the right words to make what I want happen. What did you want? Can you remember exactly? Well, your dad was so guilty about getting you mixed up in his troubles. I just wanted him to get a little peace before, you know. Kelsey stared at the floor. She did know. In the Parker Hamilton, her dad had thought he was about to die. He hadn't made up the story about her mom. He couldn't have. There'd be no peace in lying at the end. So do you want me to come into the room with you? Ethan asked. You know, get the full story from your dad. He looked seriously frightened by the idea, and Kelsey felt a surge of gratitude that he would even offer. She wondered if his voice could keep her father honest, if all Ethan wanted was the truth. But she'd never be certain. Ethan and the truth had a complicated relationship. It should be just us, me and my dad. Like it had always been, her and her dad, since before she could remember. She got to her feet and Ethan rose with her. I still think your power sucks, she said. My power still does suck, Ethan confirmed. Nate squeezed her shoulder as she passed. We'll be right here, waiting for you. Kelsey nodded, a lump in her throat. She'd never been so glad to know that someone would be waiting for her, that they would all be there when she got through whatever came next. She left the zeros in that beige room and followed the doctor down a narrow hall into a small space full of blinking machines. Take all the time you need, the doctor said, then left them alone. The hospital bed was dwarfed by the equipment on either side. Her dad looked terrible. His skin was pale and gray in the harsh overhead lighting, making his bruises darker. She crossed to the bed and stood, afraid to touch him, until he reached out a hand. She grasped it, feeling how light and hollow he'd become. I wish you didn't have to see me like this, Kells. His voice barely made it above a whisper. The doctor... She couldn't get the rest out. I know, sweetie. Dad cleared his throat. Your old man really screwed this one up. He'd been saying that all her life. She pressed her hand across her eyes, wishing he would say something new now. She wanted to disconnect from the tides of anxiety around her. Not all of it was hers. Every frightened, desperate, sad person in that hospital had a direct line to Kelsey right then. She stood with tears pouring down her face, not just for her dad, but for everyone. She knew everyone's pain. Too many mistakes, her dad was saying in a thin, raspy voice. I got myself to a place where nobody could help me. Dad. I only wish I hadn't taken you there with me. That was my decision, she said. Tears welled in his eyes. Who's going to take care of my little girl? She leaned across, hugging him as gently as she could, careful of the tubes that fed into his arms. Don't worry about me. I have plenty of friends now. Friends are everything. She heard the pride in his voice. Friends and family. That last word made her pull back. Her dad was crying now, too, his face wet and raw. He looked exhausted and even smaller than when she'd first come into the room, like he was shrinking. Dad, she said carefully, was it true what Ethan said about Mom? Dad nodded slowly. I don't know how that kid knew all that. So she's alive? Dad nodded again. She's not a bad person, Kelsey, but for some people, it's too much. What is? 
being a parent, he said simply. Kelsey sat on the edge of his bed carefully. Didn't she love me? She loved you more than anything, Dad said. The effort of speaking was really costing him. He pulled himself up from the pillows. But your mother, she did better alone than in a family. She nodded, but she couldn't see it. Even in this place, where anxiety pulsed from the walls around her, Kelsey knew that she was better in a family, in a group, in a crowd. And now, she had one all her own. She felt sorry for her mom then, but it was like feeling sorry for a stranger. Most people didn't have what Kelsey had, a power, a connection. She did the best she could, Dad said softly. You both did. She gave him a small smile to let him know he'd explained everything. He didn't need to fight anymore. Dad eased back into his pillows. His eyes lost their fevered brightness, and for a moment Kelsey thought he'd already gone. Dad? Not yet, okay, please? Not yet. But he only nodded gently, like he was listening to something else. He closed his eyes, his breath coming in soft, rattling gasps. His hand in hers became still and slack. Kelsey stayed with him to the end. She felt it, the moment her dad stopped being part of the flux of human life, the moment he left the crowd of humanity behind and drifted away. For a time, the world rushed in. She let it happen, all the grief in the hospital flooding through her, sinking her under its weight, filling her with hurt and hopelessness and loss. Then she pulled back and back, until she was very small inside her own skin. For a while, she was more alone than she had ever been. She sat with her father a long time until his skin began to cool. By then, none of the anxiety of the hospital touched her. In the end, worry and doubt and fear were beside the point. The worst had already happened. When she made it back into the waiting room, the sun was spilling in. Ethan and Nate were still where she'd left them a lifetime ago. Nate was upright in a hard beige chair, looking like he was about to conduct a board meeting. Ethan was sprawled with his legs hooked over a chair arm and his head against a vending machine. She went over to Ethan and tapped his shoulder lightly. He was instantly awake. Kelsey? Nate joined them. The others are downstairs. Is there anyone we can call for you? She thought it through. She could call Fig or Ling or Remy or even Mikey. They were all her friends. They'd all try to help her now, like they'd been helping her since the robbery. But right now, the people she'd shared most with in the past week were here. She shook her head. No, thanks, though. Well, anything you need. Nate gave her a reassuring smile. You know we're here for you, all of us. Ethan was on his feet by then. He blinked at her, eyes puffy with sleeplessness. There's one thing. Kelsey turned to Ethan. That thing inside you? The voice? The thing that's so smart that it knows everything everyone wants it to say? Ethan nodded. Yeah? Well, it's totally messed up. I know. Thank you. She wrapped her arms around him. If he hadn't found her just in time, she'd be alone now. Thank you for what you did in the hotel, for wanting me to find some peace with Dad. Ethan held her awkwardly, his arms coming around her, one hand in her hair. Hey, I'm just, his voice said, smooth and perfectly comforting. But then it fell silent, finishing in a kind of strangled noise. Ethan coughed hard a couple of times. Then, in his real voice, he continued. I wish I knew half as much as my stupid voice. I wish I knew what I could say right now to make you okay. Kelsey squeezed him harder. Well, that's probably close enough. Chapter 84 Bellwether We did the best we could, Nate said. 
They gave them time to absorb the words. They were all exhausted, their defenses low, their minds primed to bond with each other in defeat. He could feel the eager pattern of it in the air. All six of them were part of the group, thanks to the web spinning around Anonymous and Flicker. There was even a connection, sharp and specific, between Anon and Scam. They were all closer now, and their attention on Nate was tinged with something new and bright. Something that hadn't been there before he'd led Mob and Scam and Jerry from the Parker Hamilton. Almost getting killed, it turned out, could be useful. They were in the meditation chapel of the hospital, a small room with a few wooden benches and a stained glass window ignited by the morning sun. Mob looked as though she wasn't sure if she was welcome there, but had nowhere else to go. Now was the time to seal her to the others. After this last week, he said, I feel like we understand our powers better. We did a lot of damage with them, he didn't say, and we had to rescue Scam three times. The Bagrovs think that Scam and Mob are dead, so we're safe from them. Nate turned with a smile toward Chizara. And thanks to Crash's panache and suburb timing, I don't think the Craig will be bothering us anytime soon. Those words lifted the mood in the room a little. Nothing disrespectful to Kelsey's loss, just a worn glimmer of levity, like an old family joke encanted at a funeral. At the same time, she saved four lives, he added, and a blush came over Chizara's face, including mine. That part of last night couldn't have gone better. Now that she had more than balanced the scales of Officer Bright, Chizara had no choice but to feel worthy of her power. We know each other better, he said, and if we can stay connected, we can make each other stronger. Most of us can remember Anonymous now. Flickers wrapped her vision around larger and larger crowds, and Chizara's power is evolving into something completely new. Nate hesitated. It was a risk mentioning Scam, but leaving him out of the list would be too obvious. And Ethan found a new zero, he said, directing their attention away from Ethan and toward Kelsey, sitting near the door. He had planned to focus all the warmth of their sympathy on her, to take it all the way, bending their exhaustion into tears. But in that instant of Kelsey staring back at him, Nate remembered how tough she was. So he simply said, I'm sorry we didn't find your father in time. We tried. Her gaze dropped to the floor. Thanks. But it's not your fault. Dad was always lost, I think. Nate tried to answer, but Kelsey's sadness had gripped the room again. It came in waves, immense, all the death in the world pressing down on them. For a moment, it was hard to breathe, even to think. It was too big for him to fight, because Mob's power wasn't just about her. It was about everyone. There was nothing to do but let it pass. After a while, Nate managed to ask, Is there anything we can do, Kelsey? If we could all just stay here for a while, she said. The six of us? I don't want to be alone. Nate nodded. He didn't either. A long time later, Flicker had to head off to see her shrink. The others were fading in any case. They'd been up all night, and the meditation room had grown warm as the sun rose. Even Kelsey looked like she was about to fall asleep. So when Flick quietly mentioned her weekly appointment, Nate gently pulled them both from the shimmering web of friendship and walked her outside. On the wide stone stairs of the hospital's entrance, he said, I guess you've got a lot to talk about with Dr. Bridges this week. Flicker gave a tired laugh. I never give him any good stuff. Besides, all he wants to talk about is Braille. Sounds scintillating, Nate said. I guess, but it's cool if you don't call me with any exciting news during today's session. Let's take a week before the next mission, maybe. Nate nodded, looking back at the hospital. I think we're good for now. Better than we were, Flicker said. You were right.
We do make each other stronger. And we've only just started. She looked up and caught the smile on his face. Let me guess, you've got some fiendish plan, some new ultimate goal. Nate wasn't sure how much to say yet, but this was Flick, after all, his little sister. So he said, we need a space, somewhere we can set the terms and choose the crowd, like in controlled experiments, somewhere we won't hurt anyone. She's always right about how dangerous we are, and we can't lose her again. He turned to Flicker and felt his power shift and slip into need, the way it sometimes did when the two of them were alone. I can't lose any of you. She took his hand and pulled him closer to whisper in his ear. I don't think you will, not after last night. You make a pretty glorious action hero, mi hermano. And they both had to laugh at that. There were no cabs waiting at the curb, but Nate had mastered this trick a long time ago. He raised his hand into the air like a beacon and focused the geometries of the streets of Cambria around himself. And a few minutes later, Flicker was headed off to her shrink. By then, the curb was brimming with half a dozen taxis. When he turned around to head back up the stairs, Nate heard his name. Mr. Saldana. He looked up. It was Detectives King and Fuentes coming down the steps, looking pleased to see him. Nate sighed. Good morning, detectives. Morning, said King. She looked him up and down, taking in yesterday's wrinkled clothes. Long night? I'm afraid so. A friend of mine just died. I'm sorry for your loss, King said, and it sounded genuine. Detective Fuentes didn't bother being somber. By any chance, did this friend of yours happen to be Jerry Laszlo? There was no point lying. Yes. I see, Fuentes said. Maybe you could help us get this straight. Here we are, coming to identify the body of a wanted bank robber, and it turns out he's your friend. And you're also friends with a kid who happened to be in the bank he robbed. <laughs> Small world, huh? Big world, actually, Nate said which made it easy to give you guys the slip yesterday. Fuentes didn't respond to this, but his lips pulled tight as he searched for a retort. It had actually taken Nate half an hour to shake their pursuit the night before. Creating a decent traffic snafu took time. It was Detective King who spoke next. Did you ever hear from Ethan Cooper? His mother's still looking. Nate hesitated. No criminals were after Ethan anymore and the police still couldn't connect him directly to any crime. Saying things you shouldn't know on a viral video was suspicious, but not prosecutable, especially when your mom was the prosecutor. Maybe it was time for Ethan to go home. Though there were probably better ways for this morning's vigil to end than scam being dragged out by the cops, Nate said to Detective King. If I did know where he was, what exactly do you need him for? Is he wanted by the police? He's a material witness, Fuentes said. But thanks to his uh, ties to the prosecutor's office, there's no warrant for his arrest. We just need to talk to him. King nodded her agreement and said carefully, I think his mother gets him first. In other words, at the moment, we just want to give him a ride home. Those words made Nate smile. I think that's what he wanted all along. Wait here, detectives. I'll see what we can do. Zeros was written by Scott Westerfeld, Margot Lanigan, and Deborah Biancotti, and read by Amber Benson. Editing and post-production by Common Mode, Paul Fowley, technical director. The associate producer was Ben Rimmelauer. The mix engineer was Ashley Lehman. 
Zeros was produced and directed by Louisa Solomon. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. Zeros is available in print from Simon Pulse. Also from Simon & Schuster Audio, Afterworlds, written by Scott Westerfeld and read by Sheetal Sheth and Heather Lind.